I can do it. I'm strong. I'm getting watered. I'm a strong man. My hair strong. Can't say pretty. I quiet. Hot times in the city. I'm feeling kind of bad. Wow. Whoa. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the mop up for. April 11th, 2022, I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 49 degrees and sunny. This is a effed up country. This is an effed up country. Russian President Vladimir Putin, speaking of effed up countries, Russian President Vladimir Putin met with Austrian Chancellor Karl Niehammer in Moscow today. Niehammer told Putin that the war must end today, adding, and I quote, in war, both sides can only lose. Let me turn those notifications off. Hang on. Austria is a member of the European Union. However, it is not a member of NATO. Niehammer said he told Putin war crimes were being committed on the ground in Ukraine and told the press that it is his responsibility as chancellor of Austria to exhaust every option for ending the violence in Ukraine. Again, Austria is a member of the European Union, but not part of the protection racket known as NATO, in which members must pay at least 2% of their gross domestic product each year to purchase weapons from the United States. So while the Austrian chancellor was urging peace, America instead focused on Russia's war crimes in Bucha and Kiev, and they are war crimes. The American ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield, spoke before the international body, not to beg for peace, which is her job to make peace. She is ambassador to the United Nations. No, she urged the UN uh, to uh, fire up the war drums and stop pounding, start pounding the war drum. And uh, she used the UN to fight for war. She told the truth, yes, and the truth must be told, but it seems to me the ambassador to the United Nations should be suing for peace, not ginning up war. Yes, war crimes are being committed, and it is the job of the American ambassador to the United Nations to call for a ceasefire to stop further war crimes from being committed, not dial up the bloodlust like she did in this clip. On Friday, a train station being used for civilian evacuations, mostly women and children, was struck by a Russian missile. Washington Post reporters saw at least 20 dead, including children. Limbs and luggage were scattered everywhere. A maimed dog shivered next to one of the dead. According to the reporters, a large piece of missile on the scene had chilling words written on the side. In Russian, it said, for the children. That is what Russia's war looks like. What is happening to women and children in Ukraine is horrific beyond comprehension. Yes, beyond comprehension. If that's beyond your comprehension, Ambassador Greenhouse, then you shouldn't be our ambassador to the United Nations. You should go back to your old job working for Madeleine Albright's lobbying firm. That's where Miss Greenhouse came from. Maybe if this is beyond your comprehension, you should commune with the ghost of the recently departed Madeleine Albright, your old boss, who will remind you that 500,000 dead Iraqi women and children were, quote, a small price to pay for imposing economic sanctions against a brutal dictator like Saddam Hussein. Really, it's beyond comprehension. Your old boss, Madeleine Albright, when she worked in the Clinton administration, was able to comprehend 500,000 dead Iraqi women and children. They died from our economic sanctions. Uh, because they were necessary, those economic sanctions. They, these 500,000 dead Iraqi women and children were living under a brutal dictatorship. Actually, they ended up dying under a brutal dictatorship because Madeleine Albright didn't want them to get any food or medicine. So beyond comprehension, really, America simply can't believe that during war, 
women and children will be killed. So I guess when Biden and you and the Biden administration kept saying Putin was going to invade Ukraine, you figured he was going to hand out candy and flowers because you couldn't comprehend what happens during war. I'm sure if you could comprehend women and children dying, and of course, don't forget the dog shivering by the corpse, that was a nice touch, you would have done everything you possibly could to have stopped the invasion. But you couldn't comprehend what war is like. So you just said, he's going to invade Ukraine. Yep, no doubt about it. Watch, he's going to invade Ukraine. Nothing we can do or, or, or uh, nothing we can say or do to stop it because it's beyond comprehension. We don't understand what goes on during war. So we're not going to try to stop the invasion. As I mentioned on the show last week, according to Brown University's Cost of War Project, since America began its global war on terror, we have killed close to 400,000 innocent women and children. Yeah, yeah, you're shocked by Russia's brutish behavior. You're shocked. Are you awed? Are you shocked and awed? Because we shocked and awed the Iraqis back in 2003 and committed mass murder on a scale that was not only within your comprehension, Ambassador Greenhouse, you kind of planned it, didn't you? So spare me your shock. In fact, I am in awe of your ability to pretend you're shocked. Seriously, do you honestly believe the magnitude of what's going on in Bucha and Kiev is beyond America's comprehension? And again, nice touch about the dog shivering by the side of the dead, which might be true, maybe, maybe not. The Russians are committing war crimes, I believe it, but don't pretend these war crimes are beyond America's comprehension. Ask the people of Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, not to mention Dresden, Tokyo, Nagasaki, and Hiroshima, whether or not these Russian war crimes are beyond America's comprehension. I am not a pacifist, okay? And if you think I'm a pacifist, I'll kick your ass because I hate people. But don't bullshit a bullshitter, Ambassador. Don't tell the American people, an entire nation of bullshitters, that what's going on in Ukraine is beyond comprehension. It is a disservice to all our generals, politicians, war profiteers who have gladly planned and initiated the deaths of hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians overseas. For you to say these crimes in Ukraine are beyond comprehension, that is an insult to to all the brave Americans who hide behind our flag and men and, and men and women in uniform to commit mass slaughter in the name of mammon. And I think you owe us an apology to say that it is beyond your comprehension. Have you forgotten the seven children we killed with a drone strike on our way out of Afghanistan last summer? Yeah, we didn't write for the children on those missiles, but that's only because Unlike Russia, America is a post-literate society. Honestly, I doubt the Russian military wrote for the children on those missiles. I suspect that was spray painted after the fact for the effect, kind of like the incubator lie from the first Gulf War. Most of you don't remember George Herbert Walker Bush, who wanted us to invade Iraq, uh, he forced a 15 year old girl to lie, commit perjury before Congress and claim Saddam Hussein, when he invaded Kuwait, stole incubators with the babies still inside of them. By then, by the time we found out it was a lie, the war was already over. But, you know, let's go to war for the children. Can't provide free health care for the children, but we can go to war for the children. And that war will kill children, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. We need to go to war for the children. Now, look, maybe there are some psychopaths in the Russian army who wrote for the children on those missiles. But considering Colin Powell went before the same body the United Nations that uh, Ambassador Greenhouse was speaking before, given that Colin Powell lied about weapons of mass destruction, uh, destruction to get the UN to improve an illegal invasion of Iraq. Why should I believe someone wrote for the children on a missile that killed innocent Ukrainians? Why should I believe you when you tell that to the UN when Colin Powell lied and said Iraq had weapons of mass destruction? And by the way, Powell lied before the UN and he lost the vote. 
He gave up his soul. He sacrificed his reputation, lies before the UN. They still, they knew he was a liar and they voted against the invasion of Iraq. Pow, Colin Pow, right? He lost the war vote and his soul and we lost Iraq. And it was an illegal invasion on September 16th, 2004. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, said that the invasion of Iraq was illegal. And I quote, I have indicated, this is UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, I have indicated it was not in conformity with the UN Charter. From our point of view, from the UN Charter's point of view, it was illegal. It was an illegal invasion. The entire invasion of Iraq, like the invasion of Ukraine, was illegal. And just like Putin, we committed war crimes and we covered them up. This country has never admitted to its war crimes. It's always fallen on the shoulders of the independent media to expose our war crimes. And it's the responsibility of our independent media to cover up those uh, to reveal the, the war crimes that have been covered up. Do you remember back in 2012 when Marines, it was discovered that Marines in Afghanistan pissed on dead Taliban soldiers and everybody clutched their pearls? It's incomprehensible that that uh, uh, American Marines would, would uh, piss on dead Taliban soldiers. And uh, that's incomprehensible. You know, nobody talks about a president shitting on the Constitution and then covering up the real war crimes by trying to lock up Julian Assange for exposing them. But it's incomprehensible. Oh, dear. U.S. Marines pissed on dead Taliban soldiers. Uh, of course, it's incomprehensible because they're trying to lock up Julian Assange for exposing all our criminal uh, our, our war crimes that we commit overseas. Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, said she wished someone would assassinate Julian Assange. And right now, America is going to extradite Julian Assange to America for violating the Espionage Act. What was Julian Assange's crime against America? Well, WikiLeaks released video taken from an American Apache helicopter on July 12, 2007. Some trigger happy American soldiers were circling over Baghdad where they thought they encountered insurgents carrying AK 47s. It turns out they weren't insurgents and they weren't AK 47s. One of the people they murdered uh, was a reporter for Reuters. Six to seven people on the ground, it's all on video, were shot down. They were carrying cameras and phones and the guys in our apache helicopters killed them killed them not only that they laughed it's all on tape they were laughing on the video you can hear them laughing but the crime wasn't laughing while killing innocents the crime was releasing the video of our soldiers killing innocents and laughing julian assange is the one they want to lock up, not our soldiers laughing while they're killing innocent civilians, including a reporter for Reuters. The crime, the crime, Julian Assange committed the crime. Those soldiers never put on trial. But Julian Assange, he released the video. So now he must be extradited and stand trial in America. You can hear on that video, we hear the soldiers, our soldiers in our Apache helicopter say, quote, ha ha ha, I hit him. Another soldier on board says, oh yeah, look at those dead bastards. Wait, it gets better. The video reveals that the wounded tried to carry other wounded into a car to take them to the hospital, but our soldiers fired armor-piercing weapons through the windshield, wounding two children sitting in that automobile. And on the recording, you can then hear our soldiers laughing, saying, look at that, right through the windshield. Our soldiers for the children. When American soldiers finally arrived on the scene and discovered the wounded children, one American soldier is heard saying, quote, well, it's their fault for bringing children into battle. Another soldier is heard agreeing with him. The only problem is they weren't insurgents and those kids weren't bringing their children, those, the, the, their parents weren't bringing their kids into battle. But the American army covered it up. It was a war crime where they laughed and uh, the American army covered it up. They said they were, they were insurgents. 
They were insurgents, but it was Julian Assange and WikiLeaks who got their hands on the actual video. And now Julian Assange is the only one who's going to do time for that war crime. And his crime, Julian Assange's crime is exposing a war crime. So yeah, what's going on in Ukraine is beyond comprehension for the American people. You know, I was going to show you the video that Julian Assange released. It's up on YouTube. You can go find it. You can find it anywhere you want. I don't want to show it. It's too gruesome to describe, let alone actually show. And I'll be accused of promoting violence by showing that video. They will blame me for showing the video. Showing the video will get you shut down. By the way, Juanita Broderick, who has credible evidence that Bill Clinton raped her violently, has been taken off Twitter. Permanently banned. Juanita Broderick, permanently banned from Twitter. Hey, we believe the women, don't we? We believe the women, unless they keep using Twitter as a platform to accuse Bill Clinton of rape. Credible evidence that Bill Clinton raped Juanita Broadwick. Uh, credible evidence that he sexually assaulted Kathleen Willey. He's admitted to pulling a Louis C.K. on Paula Jones. He had to give up his law license for lying about that. But Juanita Broadwick, you know, she just can't seem to let go of that rape. So she's permanently banned from Twitter. Come on. It's not like she posted pictures of Hunter Biden smoking crack with a prostitute. You post a picture of Hunter Biden half asleep with a crack pipe in his mouth, you're going to get banned. You're going to get banned. And I would still vote for Biden and I would still vote for Hillary over the Republican Party. But let's not pretend that the rich and powerful don't circle the wagons and protect each other. So I'm not going to show the video of our soldiers laughing while they kill innocent Iraqis for the same reason. I don't use the F word on this show. I try not to use the F word. I don't want to give anyone an excuse to censor me. So the video of our soldiers laughing at and then blaming the innocent dead Iraqis for getting shot. That's now public record. I'm not going to I'm not going to show it. OK, go look it up. Now, I'm not justifying Vladimir Putin's war crimes. They are war crimes. And that's the problem. They're war crimes, and America has lost its moral authority to prosecute war crimes. I am saying that these are war crimes in Bucha and Kiev. I'm saying what's going on in Ukraine goes on during all wars, which is why you say and you do everything you can to stop war from taking place. And once it starts, you do everything you can to stop it, because in all war, women and children end up dead. The problem is too many Americans enjoy war. They like seeing it on their TV screen. Where is America's call for peace? I don't hear any officials calling for peace. They're nowhere to be found. Instead, White House press spokesperson Jen Psaki is very proud of how the war in Ukraine is going. She was on Fox News yesterday, very proud of America's support for the people of Ukraine. It is also significant that the Ukrainians have essentially won the Battle of Kyiv. Yes, we have won the Battle of Kiev. Kiev, we've won. Look how happy she sounded and looked. Mission accomplished. We won the Battle of Kiev. That's what Jen Psaki, White House press spokesman, said on Fox yesterday. So I guess all the refugees can move back into Kiev. It's perfectly safe now. Jen Psaki says we've won the Battle of Kiev. And uh, great. So come on back, refugees. It's safe. We won. And who gets the credit for uh, for this victory, Jen Psaki? They've protected their city, and that is because of their bravery, their courage. But it is also because of the, su the supplies, the military equipment, everything we've expedited, one point seven billion dollars worth from the United States and the commitment and dedication of the American people. 
Ah, the American people, the commitment and dedication of the American people. Take a victory lap, America. You did it. We did it. Let's throw ourselves a parade because the Ukrainians just won the battle of Kiev and millions of Ukrainians will be flooding back into that nation's capital and getting on with their lives because we, the American people, sent missiles to Ukraine, which is what we do best, sitting on our fat ass lobbing missiles overseas. Sometimes we drop them on people. This time we gave those missiles to Ukrainians to drop on people. One point, what, six, one point seven billion dollars in weapons that we gave the Ukrainians, the American people. We did it by giving them one point billion, one point, what, one point seven billion dollars in weapons. We did it, folks. We won the Battle of Kiev. Jen Psaki's previous job was with West Exec, the lobbying firm, whose motto is, and I'm not making this up, their motto is, we bring the situation room into the boardroom. And by situation room, they don't mean Wolf Blitzer. In other words, when the Pentagon and the president are deciding whom to bomb, West Exec makes sure they use your bombs. That's no joke. Blinken, our Secretary of State Blinken, is a lobbyist for Boeing, or was a lobbyist, well, still is, I guess, a lobbyist for Boeing, founding member of West Exec. Read The Intercept about West Exec. They represent many of the high-tech and defense contractors who profit off of war. Fifteen former West Exec employees are now circling the wagons inside the Biden administration, defending the defense industry, including, as I mentioned, one of the founding partners of West Exec, Anthony Blinken, who is our Secretary of State. Our top diplomat is a former lobbyist for weapons manufacturers. Wasn't the purpose of a secretary of state uh, to negotiate peace? Isn't that the job of the secretary of state? You know, make sure we get along with other countries. It doesn't feel like the Biden administration is looking for peace. I want peace. I don't want my country providing weapons to the Ukrainian people until we've exhausted diplomacy. I want to sit at the table and figure out what exactly it takes to get this fighting to stop now. Yes, Putin is a war criminal. Which brings me back to Austrian Chancellor Niehammer, who met with Putin today. Interesting thing, as I mentioned about Austria. Austria, not a member of the shakedown racket called NATO. It's a protection racket, NATO. Uh, Austria, not a member of NATO. It is, however, a member of the U European Union. And more importantly, Austria is a signatory to the International Criminal Court, which is why the Chancellor of Austria was able to meet with Putin and then go before the world and declare that war crimes are being committed and that, quote, all those who re are responsible will be held to account. And that's, you know, freighted language coming from Austria, since they are, in fact, a signatory to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. America is not because we cover up our war crimes and we commit the war crimes that we're covering up. As I mentioned earlier, the invasion of Iraq was not sanctioned by the UN. Kofi Annan called it illegal. It was a war crime. Those Apache helicopters firing at civilians in Baghdad and those soldiers laughing about it and everybody who covered up that video, those are all war crimes. The close to 400,000 civilians killed in America's 20 year war on global terror, all war crimes. So we can't join the International Criminal Court, but that doesn't stop these craven, ambitious frauds over at the Biden administration from insulting your intelligence by threatening to bring Vladimir Putin up on charges of committing war crimes. They are once again lying. America cannot bring Vladimir Putin before the International Criminal Court because if we go to the International Criminal Court to arrest Putin, they're going to arrest us.
We are not signatories to the ICC, so we cannot try him. It is a lie. Biden is a liar, a habitual liar who still insists he was arrested in the 60s fighting for black people's right to vote. He says it, then he gets caught saying it. He walks it back and then he says it again. Biden is a compulsive liar, which is why the Democratic leadership made him the nominee. Because if it sounds good, say it. Reagan was a liar. And the defense for his lies and Biden's lies are, it's a sweet, well-intentioned lie. Print the legend. What's the harm? Leadership is all about storytelling. So what if it's a lie? The lie reveals that he's a good man. That's what they say. It's a lie, but his intentions are good. Uh, last time I checked, lying uh, is, <coughs> is a sin. <clears throat> well, Jake Sullivan is our national security advisor, and that's a very important job. Condi Rice had this job. She got us into Iraq. Henry Kissinger had it. He got us into Cambodia. Uh, both of those were illegal, by the way. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski had the job. Uh, he funded Osama bin Laden to fight the Soviets. And he gave Osama bin Laden enough money and weapons to uh, start Al Qaeda and bring down the World Trade Center and parts of the Pentagon. Uh, Jake Sullivan, very powerful guy, national security advisor, and he gets to pick our next war. A lot of candidates for our next invasion. I'm hoping it's Texas. I hope we invade Texas and force Governor Abbott to shove a rusty coat hanger up his ass and keep wriggling it until he finally realizes what an illegal abortion feels like in a back alley. The only problem is shoving a rusty coat hanger up Governor Greg Abbott's ass is the only way he can maintain an erection. So you won't be proven any point by doing that. Well, we're looking for a country to invade. Ukraine right now is just a, it's just there to keep the military contractors happy uh, because, you know, we, we screwed the military contractors last year. We pulled out of Afghanistan and I don't think we will be sending troops into Ukraine, but we need to spend money on weapons. So let's send bombs to Ukraine and make sure all the NATO members increase defense spending. So they buy more American weapons and ship them to Ukraine, because that's how you bring peace to a war torn conflict by negotiating peace through bombs. Is there any negotiating going on? Any? Jake Sullivan our national security advisors auditioning several countries for a big war right now. Could be China, that would require more military spending, so that's a good thing. Or if we can keep using the imagery of dead children and dogs shivering by their corpses, we may be able to get America on board war, on board a war with Russia. We'll see. Anyway, the Biden administration is talking war crimes tribunals because the Biden administration is filled with inveterate liars. There are going to be no war crimes tribunals. There's going to be, if anything, war, more war, because America is a nation of war. We'll pretend we're lying about war tr crimes tribunals uh, as if America is a nation of laws. Yeah, we're a nation of laws, which is why nobody can seem to prosecute the Trumps. Just can't be, we just can't do it. We just can't find the crime that Donald Trump and his family of grifters have committed. We just can't find the evidence. So National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan held a press conference earlier this week. I think it was on Friday. I watched it and it was unbelievable. He spoke of Buka and the train station and the war crimes and the war crimes. And he kept talking about the war crimes committed by Vladimir Putin. And he said that our State Department now has a global war crimes coordinator. I'm going to assume that's not for committing American war crimes. I'm going to assume that the global war crimes coordinator is keeping track of other countries' war crimes, because certainly America doesn't commit any. And I'm going to assume that they're keeping track specifically of Russia's war crimes. And uh, that's what we're going to do, because America would never commit war crimes. We have the moral high ground. We don't commit moral 
we don't commit uh, war crimes. And if we do get caught committing war crimes, it's always a mistake. That's not who we are. That's not who we are. That's not who we are. So we don't, that's not who we are. So why tell anyone about it? Just cover it up and then charge Julian Assange with violating the Espionage Act for telling the truth about our war crimes. Why would Julian Assange tell the truth about our war crimes? That's not who we are. Jake Sullivan goes on and on about how America will be making the case to the international community that war crimes are being committed by Russia because America is a nation of laws. Jake Sullivan says during this press conference that our intelligence community will be analyzing data and helping prepare the case for war crimes against Vladimir Putin. And then he said, we are calling upon the independent media to continue to do their job by reporting on the war crimes being committed by the Russians in Ukraine. Yes, that's what MSNBC and CNN are doing all day, showing the same picture of a dead woman and her child on a perpetual loop all day. It's not to gin up war. It's so we can, they're trying to make the case that war crimes have been committed and we, we can take Putin before the ICC, the International Criminal Court, MSNBC and CNN, they're kind of like paralegals presenting the evidence for uh, the global war crime coordinator over at the State Department. They're working in tandem with the uh, intelligence agencies to present, make the case for war, a war crimes tribunal. Because this is America, nobody wants war in America, we want a trial because that's who we are. America, that's what we want. We don't want wars. We want, we want to use the, the courts, right? This is the lie Sullivan is presenting to the American people, to the media, conveniently leaving out that we are not signatories to the International Criminal Court. There's no trial. There's going to be no trial. But Sullivan insisted during his press conference that once the intelligence community and the independent media, once they make the case that war crimes have been committed, and of course the intelligence community would never secretly leak information to the news media to make a case for war or war crimes. There would be independent media acting independent, like Judith Miller acted independently on her own, did her own research. The intelligence community never leaks anything to the New York Times and gins up a war or gins up uh, Russiagate, which I happen to believe is partly true. But the information that the media was getting about Russiagate was coming from uh, Obama relics in the intelligence community. So Jake Sullivan, our national security advisor, uh, then goes on to say, uh, we're, we're, we're going to put Putin on trial. We are looking for several venues to conduct the trial. Sullivan said he is looking perhaps for a non-government organization that will conduct the trial. He's not sure yet. Never brings up the International Criminal Court. Never said there is, in fact, a place to bring a war criminal and put him on trial. It doesn't mention the International Criminal Court. It doesn't mention that there are 123 countries who are signatories to the International Criminal Court. It doesn't mention that America is not a member of the International Criminal Court. It doesn't mention that there is an International Criminal Court. We're looking for venues to conduct this war trial that is never going to take place. That's, uh, that's what Jake Sullivan uh, says. Doesn't bring up the International Criminal Court, because if Putin gets tried, so does Bush, Cheney, Condi Rice, and Barack Obama. America believes in the rule of law when it benefits America, but when the rule of law says don't invade Iraq, the rule of law doesn't apply to us. When the rule of law says waterboarding is torture, we insist that doesn't apply to us, even though we wrote that Geneva Conventions, those con Geneva Conventions. Uh, but then something happened during Jake Sullivan's press conference. Something really bizarre happened during 
Jake Sullivan's press conference. A reporter did their job. It was, it was unbelievable. Near the end of Jake Sullivan's press conference, a reporter had the temerity to ask Jake Sullivan an actual question. I'm going to read it to you. He, uh, it, it, the reporter asked, quote, Jake, regarding the International Criminal Court, is one of the reasons why the U.S. is considering alternate venues, is it because the U.S. is not a signatory? And does that undercut the U.S.'s push to hold Putin accountable with a war crimes trial of some kind when the U.S. is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court? Wrong question. I'm not making this up. Uh, uh, he was actually asked that, and it was the wrong question. So Jake Sullivan ended the press conference. He ended the press conference. He put together some word salad that the United States has a long history of collaborating. That's the word he chose, collaborating with the International Criminal Court, despite not being signatories. Then it was word salad, word salad, venues, jurisdiction, contexts, alliances. And that was it. Press conference over because he was asked an actual question. He was asked, why isn't America a signatory to the International Criminal Court? Why are you not even mentioning the International Criminal Court? How can you keep blathering on and on about Putin's war crimes and putting him on trial for war crimes when America won't join the International Criminal Court because we're guilty of the same exact crimes as Vladimir Putin? So Jake Sullivan, national security advisor, former lobbyist for big tech, for the military industrial complex, soldiered on. He, he spun some lie that America isn't looking for a war. They're looking to try Putin, bring him up before a tribunal and just ended the press conference insisting that the intelligence community was going to work closely with you guys you know, the press, the independent media, help us make the case that war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. That's what he asked the media. Work with our intelligence agencies. Let's present a case that war crimes have been committed. And once that case has been made, the Biden administration will take that case to the international community. Effing liar, effing warmongering, war profiteering liar. He gave the press their marching orders. Keep reporting on the violence in Ukraine committed by the Russians. Help us build a case for war, for war crimes. You're not creating propaganda designed to get America's blood boiling. So Biden has no choice but to join the fight against the Russians. That's not what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to build evidence for a trial. We're not asking you to get a bloodthirsty American people ready for war. Why would we do that? We just want the media to keep showing pictures of dead children so we can present a case to the international community and put Vladimir Putin on trial for war crimes before some fictitious NGO judge. And once... Uh, Jake Sullivan is asked the big question, what venue? We're not signatories uh, to the ICC. End of the press conference. We don't do war crime. Uh, we don't do war crime trials in America. We had the Nuremberg show trials after World War II, and then we stopped with the war trials because we don't want to hold our military, our leaders, our politicians to the same standards we held the Nazis. Can't talk about that. Most Americans, through the sin of omission, through Jake Sullivan's attempted sin of omission, by never mentioning the International Criminal Court, by never mentioning that we're not signatories, through the sin of omission, the Biden administration has the American people convinced 
that we actually uh, participate in war trials, that, that, that war crimes, when they're committed, the American government will bring Putin or Saddam Hussein b before a, uh, a tribunal. Remember how uh, Hussein was brought before the, the Hague? Remember how that trial went? Oh, right, right. They just hanged him. They hanged him. We don't do war, war trials. Uh, bin Laden, no trial. Do not bring bin Laden in alive. No trial. No trials. Jake Sullivan, like Anthony Blinken and Jen Psaki, they are hyper-educated pricks who think they're smarter than everyone. And when you call them on their bullshit, they become indignant. Press conference is over. Why did you have to bring up the fact that I was lying about war crimes? Press conference is over. No access for you. Sullivan just ends the press conference. It's like it, it, he, he sounded like me when I'm telling one of my anecdotes about high school. There's a, a high school. There's a story I tell about gym, the showers, taking showers in the gym. It's one of my great high school stories. And I've told it several times. It's a lie. I add some lies to it, like Jake Sullivan lying about how America is ready to, you know, not we don't want to go to war. We want we want a trial. We want a war crimes trial. Anyway, I tell this story and sometimes uh, one of my friends from high school will finish the story for me and correct the hyperbole and I get indignant and I just go, OK, story's over. I'm not telling it. I'm not telling that story about the guy who pissed on me uh, in gym class in the shower <laughs> or try to piss on me. I've added you know, some hyperbole, but the people who were there tell the truth about it. And then I stop telling the story because half of it is a lie, but it's entertaining. Uh, that's what Jake Sullivan did. Press conference is over. I'm not going to tell this lie anymore. Last week, I talked about the experts, experts, they don't want to be challenged. They don't want to be exposed. And, you know, my whole life, I have gotten into trouble for asking too many questions. I've asked bosses too many questions, corporations too many questions, banks too many questions, you know, and they do something wrong. And I, I keep just trying to understand it. And then I get fired by my boss. I've been fired by banks. I've been fired by accountants, divorce attorneys, all because I politely asked a question that they didn't want to answer. And they, there's an old trick. They make it about my tone of voice. That's it. I don't like your tone. I feel threatened. I once got escorted out of an office uh, because I was whispering and they found it menacing. I was having a, an argument with my boss and he was screaming and I was whispering and uh, I got escorted out of the office by security because I was, I swear to you, I was whispering and I was too calm and that my boss was threatened by that. He, he, he it, it seemed like, I guess he thought I, like I was a methodical serial killer because I wasn't screaming. I wasn't being emotional. They will find any excuse when you challenge them to uh, put it on you, to make it about you. I had an agent who did nothing for me because he's an agent. He's not supposed to do anything for me, but he did absolutely nothing. And one day I, I'm on the phone with him and I quietly asked him about why he didn't give this script to some. He said he'd given a script that my friend and I had written. And then I found out he was lying. And I said, did you give it to them or not? I, I, what's the story here? And he goes, uh, I don't like your tone of voice. No, you don't like the question, you effing. And uh, he didn't like the question. And he says, I feel threatened by you. I can't work with you anymore. Click. And he hanged up on me, hung up on me, hanged up on me. Uh, this is the story of my life. And I'm sure it's the story of everybody's life. You ask too many questions and then it's your fault. It's your fault for asking the questions. Banks, agents, managers, doctors, divorce lawyers, divorce lawyers, divorce lawyers, divorce liar. Liars and lawyers, they, these self-entitled 
white pricks with degrees and credentials. And the minute you point out politely that they lied, they didn't do what you asked them to do, or you may not want to pay this part of the bill because they didn't, they're billing you for something they didn't do, or maybe you're an accountant and this looks illegal. They fire me. I can't work with you. They make it about me. And I went through this once again over the weekend where an old show, show business friend of mine uh, that I know that I've been helping out, uh, he was dumped inside a nursing home over the weekend. And it was the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, which if you're a member of SAG-AFTRA, you uh, are told that's where you want to end up, at the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey. Well, my friend picked the wrong day to get sick. Uh, the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey was understaffed and they couldn't take care of my friend. He was in a state of panic. Nobody would answer the phone at the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey. And the nurses, there were two nurses. I think there were two nurses. And they said, we're understaffed tonight. I can't, I said, my friend needs help. I can't get anybody on the phone. And when they they did answer the phone over at the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey. Uh, they said, well, we, we, we'll call the supervisor uh, to help you. I said, okay, thank you very much. I wasn't being rude. I just said, my friend is in distress. Uh, he needs some help. And uh, they said, the supervisor will call you. Supervisor from the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, never calls me back. Instead, I get a call from the head nurse at the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, who says, uh, uh, we're done with you. You're, uh, we're, we're taking your friend and we're shipping him back to the emergency room of the hospital from which he came. And then they slammed the phone down. And now it's Saturday night. The actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey will not answer their phone. And I have no, no idea how to contact my friend. And they're going to ship. He's elderly, very old, and uh, can't walk. And uh, they're going to ship him. This is elder abuse. And he's in a state of panic. And they're going to ship him again in an ambulance by himself. And they expect him to be admitted into the emergency room by himself that's the actor's home in Anglewood, new jersey would they would not answer the phone to tell me where he's going what time he's leaving that's the actor's home sag aftra's actor's home in Anglewood, new jersey and i'm calling they won't answer and i'm on my way so i, I have to take an uber lyft to get to Anglewood, new jersey to, to before they before my friend is put on a stretcher uh, so I can ride with him to, to back to the hospital. Uh, they're not answering the phone. They don't answer the door when I ring. And I'm, I'm old. I'm smart. I've been through this before. I know how nonprofits work. I know how doctors work. I know how the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey works. They're going to circle the wagons and make it about me because I'm going to ask some polite questions that they're going to find embarrassing because it it's elder abuse and they're going to make it about me and I'm going to be talking very calmly and they're going to call the police on me. They're going to get me arrested for the crimes they committed. And uh, simple questions. Why are you understaffed? Why no receptionist? Uh, I'm SAG-AFTRA. Is this how you treat other aging actors? I, and I know that they're going to circle the wagons and call the police on me because they're threatened by my tone of voice, because it's always the questions that threaten these charlatans. It's always my tone of voice. So I called the police. Before I got to the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, if you're a member of SAG-AFTRA, Look into the actor's home. Find out where your donations go and how they treat the elderly at the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey. I called the police. I called the Anglewood Police Department. White privilege. I get it. White privilege. And I, I told the Anglewood police what was going on. And the Anglewood, New Jersey police said, uh, do you want us to do a welfare check on your friend? 
want us to go over to the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey. And it, it sounds like elder abuse. Do you want us to do that? I said, you might as well, because you're going to end up here either way. I mean, I'm going to I'm calling you now because once I show up, they're going to call you. I know the drill. I know how this goes. The minute I ask a question that embarrasses them, they're going to call the police on me. So please send over an officer. And, and so I showed up at the actor's home. I'm waiting for the police and I'm buzzing politely. No answer at the actor's home. No, nobody answering the phones. Nobody at the reception desk. Nobody home at the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, 8 p.m. on a Saturday. Nobody answers the door. Nobody answers the phone. And I'm just sitting there and the Anglewood police officer shows up. And just as the Anglewood police officer shows up, suddenly my phone rings and it's that nurse who slammed the phone down on me with her silky, sugary, sultry voice all of a sudden saying, hi, uh, I'm calling about your friend and we want to talk to you about uh, his transportation and and make sure you're okay with everything. She was so polite over at the actor's home in Angwood, New Jersey. And I said, so this is how the actor's home in Angwood, New Jersey works. You're the nurse who hung up on me. I guess I have to call the police first for you to call me back to find out how my friend is doing. And I said, it's too late. Go talk to the police. And uh, I'll tell you more about this on Thursday's show. It's still going on. My friend is fine, transferred, doing okay. It was like being trapped in an elevator uh, for a few hours. Do you, want, do you want an elderly person trapped, having a panic attack in an elevator? I don't. Uh, but the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, the reason I called the police is I knew they were going to circle the wagons. That's what they do. That's what the privileged, credentialed servants of the plutocrats who get the scraps from the oligarchs, you know, they get the, the crumbs. Uh, that's what they do. They circle the wagons. That's why 15, count them, 15 West exec lobbyists are now inside the Biden administration because they're all part of the same tribe. And they, they protect what Jake Sullivan protects Jen Psaki, who protects Anthony Blinken, and they gaslight you for, you ask the wrong questions, they gaslight you. You're the crazy one for asking these questions. They circle the wagons, and that's what Article 5 of NATO is, and that's what's going to get us into an effing war. Article 5 of NATO, which says an armed attack against one member state of NATO is an armed attack against us all. Let's circle the wagons, an uncomfortable question that's asked of the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, the nurses, the doctors, they're going to the supervisor, they're going to circle the wagons and make it about David Feldman. But I got I got the police first. Uh, an uncomfortable question posed to Jake Sullivan is a question posed against the entire Biden, Biden administration. Article 5, an attack against Jake Sullivan is an attack against the Democratic leadership. We protect our own. We circle the wagons. They gaslight you. You ask the wrong question, questions. They make you the crazy one. Julian Assange is the war criminal for reporting war crimes. He's, he's the criminal because they circle the wagons. Article 5 of NATO, an attack against the military is an attack against the government. It's an attack against the ruling elite. Julian Assange must be extradited. Article 5, NATO. Think about this. Hungary, Hungary, member of NATO, run by this piece of shit, Orban, who just got reelected, authoritarian, anti-freedom of speech, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant. But an attack against Hungary is an attack against all of us. Let's all circle the wagons to protect Hungary. France might end up electing Marine Le Pen, a racist, anti-Semite, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim. But an attack against France is an attack against all of us. NATO, Article 5. Turkey is run by 
an authoritarian. NATO was supposed to protect him because an attack, let's circle the wagons. I guess maybe NATO is a good idea. I know Trump wanted to get out of NATO, so it's probably a good idea to stay in NATO. But I have a problem with military alliances that don't come with peace alliances, because that's how World War I happened. See, military alliances without peace, without people working for peace, they spark wars. Article 5 is going to spark more wars, and they will be wars that will end up as big as World War I. Austria-Hungary, World War I attacks Serbia. Serbia is aligned with Russia, right? This is like NATO. So if Austria goes to war, then Germany is obliged to join Austria, their own little Article 5 there, right? An attack against Germany is an attack against Austria. And France, Russia, Germany, uh, France, Russia, and Great Britain signed a treaty promising to attack Germany and Austria if their member states were attacked. It's another version of Article 5, right? And that's how World War I turned into a cataclysmic nightmare. I don't know how many, 14, 50 million dead. Uh, the Germans knew about these military alliances, so they attack France quickly so they can win and then focus on Russia. But the Germans get bogged down in France and millions and millions and millions of dead people later, a stalemate. That's what war treaties get you. That's what NATO is. It's a war treaty. There's no treaty to prevent a war, just treaties to trigger a war. NATO is a war treaty, not a peace treaty. I get it. I get it. We need war treaties. There are bad actors out there, including Zelensky. I watched Servant of the People. He's OK, too cute by half but I am rooting for him. The point is there are bad actors, so we need armies, we need war treaties, but we also need peace treaties to prevent wars. NATO's Article 5, which Biden, is, it's like, it's like the, the fifth commandment is so sacred, that jump starts a war. And I'm sorry, when Hungary gets attacked, I wanna think about it first before I go off and fight in Hungary. Uh, how are you going to defend uh, sending Americans to fight for Orban? Well, we have to defend this fascist because if we don't defend a fascist like Orban, then, uh, then that's how fascism arises if we don't defend a fascist like Orban. I'm sick of hearing about Article 5. I want, about, I want to hear about how we drag Putin to the bargaining table. This is not appeasement. This is dealing with the sad reality of war and that Putin has nuclear weapons. I want Putin defeated. I want him to go. But what is the price? What is the price? Has this administration exhausted every opportunity for peace? National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says he's constantly on the phone with his counterpart in Ukraine. Why isn't he talking to Russia? Christ, bring back General Michael Flynn as our National Security Advisor. At least all he did was talk to Russia. Was Trump owned and operated by Putin? Absolutely. I believe that. But at least there weren't five million Ukrainian refugees and Count was dead when he was president. Trump is horrible. But because he was horrible, he couldn't be trusted to lead us into a war. Nobody trusted him. Some of us kind of sort of trust Biden. Come on, man, you know me. Yeah, I know you. You're a liar. And you would lie your way into a war so long as your brother Jimmy and your son Hunter could get a cut. I don't trust Trump. I don't trust Biden. I don't trust any of the people Biden has surrounded himself with because he is surrounded by people who circle the wagons and protect their own. There are no peacemakers in the Biden administration. All I see are effete intellectuals with no muscle mass flexing their degrees and talking 
tough. Talking tough. I'm not saying it. I am not saying anybody in the Biden administration trying to get the war to stop. Not saying it. I didn't see it before the invasion, and I'm not seeing it after. Why? Because I think Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, I think Anthony Blinken, I think they are formulating a Biden doctrine on the backs of the Ukrainian people. I think they are using Ukraine's blood as an opportunity to restore America's role on the world stage as leader of the free world. And they are succeeding. NATO is stronger than it's ever been. Trump was going to pull out of NATO in a second term to appease Putin, but Biden, no, no, we're, we're not isolationists. We're engaging with the world and we're going to restore the post-World War II neoliberal order where the American dollar and the American military are in charge and it's working, except if you're U uh, Ukrainian, then all you get is death and destruction and more of our weapons to ensure more death and destruction as America's root you on and declare the battle of Kiev has been won. That's literally how Jen Psaki spun it yesterday. The battle of Kiev has been won. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. Mission accomplished. You know, I get these angry emails from people who demand to know why I don't support the Ukrainian people. I support the Ukrainian people. I don't support Putin and I don't support any leader of any country who thinks the road to peace is paved by war. I'm not a pacifist. I believe in sticking up for oneself. I believe in building up weapons so people are uh, afraid to attack us. I don't want war. Now is not the time to start demonizing the Russian people or demonizing Putin. Now is the time to drag him, drag him to the negotiating table. Uh, so Jen Psaki, as you leave the White House and go to MSNBC to gin up the war over there, uh, how dare you congratulate the American people? for helping to win the Battle of Kiev. I'm gonna play this again. She said, the Battle of Kiev has been won and the American people should be thanked. They've protected their city, and that is because of their bravery, their courage, but it is also because of the, su the supplies, the military equipment, everything we've expedited, $1.7 billion worth from the United States and the commitment and dedication of the American people. How dare you? How dare you congratulate the American people for helping to win the battle of Kiev, all because we supported the war effort by sending $1.67 billion? I didn't vote on that. Why are you making the American people complicit in making this war last longer? It's you, the people from West Exec, Jen Psaki, who want this war to keep going. Some of us here in America want you to drag Putin to the peace table. Is it that hard for Joe Biden to say, if Vladimir Putin stops and pulls out, I promise Ukraine will never join NATO? Is it that hard to say that? Instead of weapons, you might want to try saying that instead. You know, after spending this weekend dealing with the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, it's become increasingly apparent to me that there is a significant number of highly educated doctors and nurses and administrators who are willing to live with a certain amount of death if, improve, if it improves their bottom line. Why hire more nurses, more doctors, or a receptionist after 8 p.m. over at the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, when Joseph P. Benincasa, the president and CEO of the Actors Fund, which runs the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, why spend that money when we have to pay him, according to the most recent IRS filing, somewhere north of $800,000 a year? That's your nonprofit actor's home, $800,000 for Joseph P. Benincasa to run the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey. No nurses, no doctors, no receptionists, 
They pay this guy almost a million dollars a year, but no money for more nurses or doctors. And he sleeps at night because he's one of those people who can live with death because people die. Our national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, our uh, uh, White House press spokesman, Jen Psaki, Joe Biden, they can all live with death because it's a part of life. So why not use other people's deaths to profit? to make a million a year providing substandard medical care over at the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey. Or if you're in the Biden administration, why not let some Ukrainians you never met, let them die so you can strengthen the NATO alliance and pour billions and billions of dollars more into our defense industry because people die. People die. You can't stop it. So as long as people are going to die, let's cut some corners, make more money. So what if they die sooner than later? They were going to die eventually. So why not make them go through a for-profit health care system? Why not make bombs that kill them? Why not? Why don't we dump 400,000 guns into the American streets and make a tidy profit and score political points and use gun ownership as a way to raise more campaign cash? Because people are going to die. So what if they die sooner than later? As long as they're going to die, let's make sure they don't die for naught. Let's make them die for something. Let's make them die so I can feather my bank account and my reputation. That's the way these people think. I love America. Actually, I love 99% of Americans. I was going to say I love all Americans. I love 99% of Americans. I loathe the people in charge of this country because to them, we're just a number attached to a dollar sign, and they are getting everyone killed. We will be back. We will be back with John Ross, I hope, after this. Walking 13 miles on every shift with not a chair in sight. Lifting 20,000 pounds a day, that don't seem right. Saving plastic bottles to have a place to pee. Injuries in this place are the highest in the industry. Don't believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. Don't tell me this sweatshop has become the American. American dream, we need to stand together. Can't do it on our own, we need to stand together and make our presence known. We need to stand together to get the union done. We need to stand together. What side are you on? One million strong, working two shifts a day. Packing all day long while the cameras are running away. 100,000 trucks tearing up and down the roads. Delivering stuff all over the world in 40 ton loads. When did this sweatshop become the American dream? Don't believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. We need to stand together. Can't do it on our own. We need to stand together and make our presence known. We need to stand together and get the union done. We need to stand together. Which side are you on? Stand together. Stand together. 
Call your mates, can't listen to music, gotta pack all those crates. Start to feel like a robot, but soon you understand there's more of them than you. That's always been the plan. Do not believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. And don't try to tell me this sweatshop will become the American dream. We got to stand together. We can't do it on our own. Stand together. We need the UAW, the AFL, CIO. We got to stand together. We can't do it on our own. We got to stand together. We need the American postal workers and the farm workers. We need the teamsters and the RWDSU. We need everybody. Stand Call together. the phone. Get on the phone. Call your neighbors. We need to stand together. Yeah, yeah. We need to stand together. That's what I'm talking about. We need to stand together. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinel, who's coming in heavy tonight. He's coming in heavy. He's got two songs later on Stand Together. Joining us in Deerfield, Massachusetts, I think it's Deerfield, is TV funny man, comedy writer, and gentleman farmer, John Ross. Hold your applause, please. <laughs> We're, we're about 11 minutes late. Your last guest run long? No, we're, uh, we're 11 minutes late. Yeah, your, la your last guest got a little, little mouthy, a little talk too much. Yeah, but, yeah I, I had a guest on the show. Yeah. Would not Wouldn't shut, shut the fuck up. Wouldn't, what is, sometimes I, people go, I, I, you know, I want to be polite. I want to yeah. be polite. I keep going, you know, you're being rude to our next guest. I listen to your story about the... Uh, your friend at the actor's home. Yes. And I, I would say the, the most criminal part of it all is the way you fucking pronounce Englewood. What did you live there? You went to school there. Yeah. Englewood. Englewood. Yeah. It starts with an E. You keep saying Englewood like it, it's a forest full of protractors. Why does it sound like every time <laughs> you say it, it sounds like it starts with an angle. It's not Englewood. It's Englewood. 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 Yes. That's the first time you've said it right. What is I don't understand what you, happens in your brain. I, I, it's an accent. People, people have <laughs> accents. Don't you have a, an accent? Don't you have an accent? Where were you born? I was born in Monmouth County. Monmouth? Uh, Monmouth? Monmouth County. We called it Monmouth. And, uh, Monmouth. Well, uh, yeah, in Long Forest Branch. Full of tractors. In, in, Long, in Branch. Long Branch. Down the shore. Down, so, down the shore. I got an exciting job. I don't want to make you feel jealous, but I'm yeah. a showrunner of a sitcom. Yeah. On Mike Lindell TV. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I know you've said yeah. like, you, you know, if you had to, Take a on a show on Amazon. You don't believe in Amazon, but you would take a job. Right? Yes. So yes. I took the job on Mike Lindell. It's uh, every story they've lost something, and then uh, they think it was but stolen. It's rigged. Yeah, they it think was something rigged. was stolen, and and then at the end they find it. You know, it's like oh, it was under the couch all the time. Wow. Yeah. That's a. How about a game show? Yeah, the, sure. The I mean, you know, uh, I think, you know, I'm, I'm pitching an hour long drama to them, too, where yeah. there's a murder every week and like you use a pillow to, to, you know, we do a little product placement where somebody's going to shoot somebody, but they want to silence it. So they put a, a pillow over the right. gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was going to do a 
I won't do a pillow biting joke so how is life up as the has the harvest come in yet I I was in Englewood yeah I was in Englewood Englewood how's it pronounced Engel Engel with an E like Marty Engels yeah can you yeah exactly do do that Marty Engels can you see the E in your head when you say it Engel Englewood Inglewood is in LA. That's with an I. There's okay. Inglewood. This is Angle. Angle. Ang- yeah. Inglewood. Yeah. I, I then, noticed. And the then, have you stopped saying Exxon Mobil? Like it, it's like hanging from a ceiling over a baby's crib. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it is disrespect. Do you remember how George Herbert Walker Bush pronounced Saddam Hussein? He would call him Saddam. You get yeah. The name from. Yeah. Yeah, that was senior, right? Senior, yeah. Yeah, I could believe he might be doing it on purpose. The younger one, I'm not so sure it would be on purpose. How do you pronounce Chipotle? I've we've been over this. I, how do you pronounce you it? And I did this once already. The T, you pronounce the T. Chipotle, Chipotle, pot. The T, the T is not silent. Is not silent. Chipotle. Lay and you keep saying Chipotle and it sounds yucky. <laughs> yeah, why would yeah, you pronounce you... the T? What? Why would you? Yeah, why would you pronounce it? <laughs> Look, they, you know, you, there are certain things that are just. Uh, How do you, you know, pronounce you... Jen Psaki? Right. I, I mean, it's there aren't uh, it isn't a rule. I mean, it's just how people want it pronounced why does Jen Psaki have a p in front of her s if her p is silent why do you have a p in front of Feldman <laughs> why does everybody want a p in front of Feldman? <laughs> <laughs> now, how's the farm yeah it's uh it's finally feeling a little bit like spring I did some I was doing a lot of outdoor work today getting the I'm I'm way behind getting the beds ready um for planting so i you know this summer i'm probably not going to do so much because a my daughter's getting ready to go off to college so bad bad idea i know i know but i look i got so much money i gotta just get rid of it you know what i mean i need ways (laughs) to spend my money so i'm figuring you know four years of college is a good way to blow some of it um but uh so you know we're going to be doing some traveling plus she's going to be working up at that organic farm again so she's going to be coming home with a a farm share every single day so i'll I'll grow my specialty peppers and i'll grow a lot of tomatoes so um had a had a baseball practice yesterday in the freezing cold i wore long underwear under my uh baseball pants i've never done that before you're Mormon. Yeah, I wore my magic underwear. That's how, that's how I pitched in a scoreless inning. Um, yeah, caught four innings and I pitched an inning. We played five innings. You're so, a catcher. Uh, I I have spent most of my time on a baseball diamond behind the plate. Yes, I didn't know that. You didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that you you and you could your knees can hold up everybody wants to know about my knees my knees are fine it's my shoulder that i've it's uh that throw to second base you know at every single year they yeah make it longer it gets yeah. further and further that throw from home to second every year where's the strangest place a fastball hit you as a catcher in the butt bob <laughs> <laughs> What, where do you even hit? Well, I mean, I, I've been hit all over, but you know, there you learn your lesson. If you get hit on a finger, if a finger gets hit with a baseball, um, that's bad. You learn to protect your meat hand. You keep it behind. Um, you know, the the baseball can often find that little spot, but you know where you just don't have any padding, like just above your knee pads. Uh, a little bit 
Um, I, I wear limited, they got, look, the guys don't throw that hard. I'm a tough guy. You know, I, 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 I wear the lightest gear I can. So there's some, now, why, here's the thing I don't understand. Cause I was staying with, and you, I got my baseball game. I got my knee pads and I got my condoms. I need protection. And then it's off to, and I'm sitting there with your family going, why does he need to wear a, a condom for protection, knee pads and a condom to play baseball? It makes no sense. And your son just rolled his eyes with disgust at you. Yeah. I don't know. What I'm <laughs> I, I don't know Boy, what you're talking about. Protection. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, oh, yes. How's um, I, I, yes. And I used to, um, you know, when I played in LA, I was playing in a very competitive league and I was hanging around, uh, f mostly for my defense. Uh, I had a, a, a cannon for a right arm, David. Uh, I could throw people out and I was, I was cat like behind the plate. I blocked everything and pitchers used to like to throw to me because I was smart and I, they liked the way I handled the game and I could look at a guy's swing and see kind of where there was a hole in it. So I, I knew where to pitch him. I could remember how we pitched him in the previous at bat. So, you Damn. know, I wouldn't start him with the same pitch, you know, we'd mix things up unless there was a guy, if I saw a guy who just couldn't hit, you know, my pitchers inside fastball, I'm like, just deal this guy three aces on the inside half. And are you really playing <laughs> baseball on that granular level where you, you're, like I saying, give him an inside pitch. Now, can can these pitchers actually place the ball that accurately? You know, um, <laughs> I would. Some pitchers, I will say to them before the game, I'll say, you know, do you want it? Do you want me to give you location? I'll ask. You know, what do you throw? If it's a, somebody I've never caught, you know, uh, or if I haven't caught him in a while, I'll say. So, what do you got? You know, one fast, two curve, three slider, four change. And I'll say, do you want me to give you location? And some of them will say, nah, you know, let the ball just go where it goes. And others will say, yeah, give me location. I, I can't promise I'll hit it, but, you know, at least it's something to try for, you know. So sometimes, yeah, you are in the big leagues, you know, as a hitter, when you're facing somebody who's throwing hard, you kind of, a lot of people think when they talk about guessing, you know, guessing what pitch is coming. Um, they think you're guessing like fastball or curveball. You generally don't do that. You guess inner half or outer half because it's hard to look. You either got to look in or look away. If it's somebody who really, you know, is throws hard. If you want to hit the ball with um, authority, you, you have to look either in or look out. And then when you get two strikes, you got to, that's why you can't generally hit with as much power with two strikes because you're in a more protective mode. Yes. So if you make it to the minor, if you make it to the minor leagues and you're a pitcher, yes, oh. and you've made it to the minor leagues. Yeah. What What are you throwing? What can you? What is the accuracy that you have? Well, look, there's there's different things that different pitchers have, and it's basically you either have you know speed, raw. You need at least two things. Like some guys. You know, I guess if you throw hard enough, if you just have raw speed, it's enough. But even that, if you just if you're throwing 105 miles an hour, if that's all you're throwing, guys will eventually time it. Um, so you have speed, location. So if you're able to spot the ball, if you, even if you can throw really hard and you can throw in and out and up and down and hit your spots. And then the other thing is movement. Like, can you throw? an off-speed pitch and, you know, have something break. Um, or does, you know, your ball have natural movement. Some guys fastball, they just can't throw it straight. It has like a tail. When I pitch, I depend on that a little bit. I don't, I throw straighter than I used to. I used to throw with okay. more movement. Is the catcher the closest thing to the manager on the field? Yes. Or is that the, it is the close. And when you he's single, the, only, the, for, the, the, the catcher is the only one who's not, who doesn't play in fair territory. Everyone else is on the field. You're in the catcher is in foul territory. So he's kind of off the field, like the manager. I see. And when you signal, at least in the minor leagues, if you signal for a breaking ball, mm -hmm. 
who else is reading that signal? The infielders. Uh, is there a code? To, 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 do they are there certain taps to so if you don't see it, does the third no. baseman? The third baseman generally is not. It's generally the middle infielders. The second baseman and the shortstop uh, will see it. I, I've I've heard that um, sometimes uh, middle infielders like a, a shortstop will signal to the outfielders like they might hold up some fingers behind their back. Uh, and that's so that a guy could get a jump, you know, one way or the other. I, I, I don't know that that happens, but I've, I've read that that happens. So and is the third base coach trying to read the catcher signs to determine no, third base coach can't see. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a funny thing. Um, a, a good catcher, will block his signs very easily from the third base coach he puts his glove down. And, but a lot of the times when I'm, cause a lot of these catchers don't have a lot of experience. So in the leagues that I play in the guy behind the plate, I'll be coaching in one of the boxes and they'll, they'll show me the signs just like I can see it clearly. And I'll go to the guys in the dugout and say, do you want to know what's coming? The, I'm surprised the vast majority of them don't want to know that if it fucks them up, they don't want to know or they feel like it's cheating or something to me, if somebody will tell me what's coming, um, I, I definitely want to know <laughs> I need that advantage. Right. Right. Now you don't watch major league baseball, right? I don't, I, you know, part of it is I don't have broadcast. We only have streaming. I, I think you can get some games on some of the things, but it's yeah, like, yeah, I, I, yeah. but, but by the time I spend, you know, all the time, that I spend playing and practicing and everything, it feels dumb to come home. And, you know, I have books I want to read and stuff, so I don't have time. When's the last time you watched an entire baseball game from start to finish? You sat down and just watched it, it, a baseball game. It's, it's been a while. It's probably been a couple of years, a couple, three. I probably watched them playoff or World Series. You know what I watched a lot of this weekend was I did watch the golf. I got kind of sucked right. into it. And my wife's away. <laughs> Huh? Yeah, my friend who my friend who I put in the helping out with the nursing home can sit and watch a baseball, just stare at the. T I mean, when he was younger, he could just stare at a baseball game and watch. Just understood all the intricacies. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty interesting, especially you know if you have somebody good call in the game. Uh, who you know, Vin Scully was magical. He could just tell interesting stories, and it was just. It was just fun listening to him uh, do it. And, you know, new things happen that you've never, you know, as, as many times as I've seen so many, I used to watch all the time, obviously. And yeah, I'd see something new. It's like, wow, I've never seen that happen before. He's like, how is that possible? But yeah. um, you know that they're, they're going to be changing the rules some because the game's getting a little bit boring. Um, they're because they teach they're playing launch. Football. They're, What's they're that? playing football. They're going to start playing football now. Well, in the they, they're in, they're into um, the uh, the long ball, the, the home runs. So they teach the kids now because uh, our friend Groff, his son is playing baseball. I, I saw his John Groff's son on Facebook. I thought that is like a Superman. Like, yeah, I, he, where did that kid come from? He plays for he plays for Kenyon College and he was getting his his hitting coach was like the Dodgers hitting coach. Um, and but they teach these kids launch angle, launch angle, which is like you're basically swinging up. And what happens is it's all or nothing. You either hit a home run or you strike out. And it's it's what they value now in the major leagues. That's why they teach these kids that. And the major leagues has just become a home run derby. and the problem right. is strikeouts ball. strikeouts take a long time. So, and you know, the, do you know what the shift is when they shift the infielders over to one side? Cause these guys who are trying to launch the ball, they all pull the ball. They hit it to their pull side. You know what that means? Right. So sure. they stack the infielders. They put all of them on the one side and Next year, you're not going to be allowed to do that. The shortstop has to play on the third base side. The second baseman has to play on the second base side. And none of the infielders can be on the grass. So it's going to change a little bit. And the ball, are they changing the ball so it's hotter? 
No, not not that I know of, but it is cr- I, it is crazy now that I remember when I was a kid, at like pretty much every major league team had one guy that threw in the nineties. You know, right. like yeah, like Nolan Ryan could throw in the upper nineties, and every team had, and usually it was like the closer, some guy, and is like, wow, he can throw like ninety five. Now it's everybody throws in the nineties. There's no, there's basically, and there's, and almost every team has like one guy who can like touch a hundred, like ninety nine. It's unbelievable. I pretty much, we have to wrap it. I quit base watching baseball because of Nolan Ryan when he played for the Mets. He was just so wild. Yeah, and I, and, and he was driving me crazy. He he had a fastball, but he it, most of his pitches were wild. And I went, "What am I getting emotionally involved?" I was a <laughs> well, he, he was he was my favorite player. I watched. I saw. I sat. They talk about like from beginning to end and watched it. Two of his seven no hitters. That's a pretty crazy record to think he's got seven no hitters, and the next closest guy has four. Well, you've been. You remember my record as a stand-up. <laughs> oh, oh, I have to say one thing. You know, I no know laughers. Go ahead. That, I, you know, I'm a pretty happy guy. And one of the, the reasons that I am happy is because uh, I, I don't have regrets. I don't sit and stew about what could have been, what should have been. And uh, however, I've spent a couple of late nights last, I think it was last week when I was on the show with the guy from... Um, uh what's our revolution jason is that his name yeah 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 they're, they're yeah, yeah, yeah and and he and he was interested but he found out we were both comics in the 80s and we were talking about the slap and he he wanted to know um what our experience was had either of us ever been like attacked on stage has anyone tried to come up on stage and punch us and i just have this awful awful regret that at the time i didn't say that no one in any of your audiences had ever tried to punch you because they were too sleepy. <laughs> that you, you, you had put them into a coma like state and as, <laughs> as they wanted to, it was like they, they could, you could see that in their eyes, they wanted to get up and punch you, but they just couldn't like their whole body was asleep. Right. Yeah, that was a missed that's... opportunity. I love you, buddy. It's good to I see you. I love you. Have fun. Tell the your rest daughter. Of your... Tell your daughter of... not to leave. All right. The rest of your voyage. Thank you, Goodbye. John Ross. Follow him. He's got a great Twitter feed at Fun with Friction. Fun with Friction. Follow him on Twitter. When we come back, we're going to be joined by Tom Weber. I'm looking at the calendar, so let me go over it with everybody just to make sure we're all on the same page. Coming up, the beloved Texas Tom Weber. Then at 7, it's Howie Klein. I thought he was bringing in Santa Claus, who's running for Congress in Alaska. Uh, At 7.30, David Pepper joins us, and he is the author of Laboratories of Autocracy, A Wake-Up Call from Behind the lines. Then at 8 p.m., Dr. Harry Fraud. Then at 8.30, Jason Miles and Pascal Robert join us. Peter B. Collins starts the nine o'clock hour. Then at 9.30, it's Professor Marianne Cummings. And then to bring it all home is Professor Mike Steinel. When we come back, we will be joined by the soul of office hour. I call him the soul of office hours. Texas Tom Wepper, and we're going to talk about peace and uh, coexistence. We'll be right back. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Trump, how can you be this smart? You must have eyes in the back of your head. A lot of people think I do, especially when I was younger, David. I could have played for the Knicks, David. People thought I had eyes in the back of my head. I was dropping dimes. That means assists, David. I played basketball, David. Yes, and I have a knack. I have a knack. Really? It's just a genetic thing. I have a knack. I had an, I had an uncle who played basketball, David. Sweetwater Trump. <laughs> Sweetwater, Sweetwater Trump? Sweetwater Trump. He had moves, David. Oh, my Lord, did this one have moves? 
Really? Poetry in motion. He could fake out all the blacks, David. He had moves. He could fake out anyone. He would get the ball and say, I'm going to buy your building, but I'm not going to raise your rent. And then before they knew it, their rent was doubled and they were out in the streets, David. But this is, we're talking about Sweetwater. This is, I don't normally talk about this, David, you know, but they wanted me to go pro because I had the same moves he had. I could fake these people out. I could say, I'm going to pay for everything you do, all everything you do for my hotel. And then before you know it, I don't have the money. I fake them mm. out. And we're talking about basketball. They wanted me to go pro. I said, no, give basketball to the blacks. Give it to the blacks. It's not fair. Let them have basketball. I'll take golf. Let the blacks have basketball. I could have played for the Knicks. I could have okay. played for the Knicks, but give it to the blacks. I said, give it to the blacks. I started the civil rights movement, David, giving basketball to the blacks. That is that is uh, Robert Smigel doing Trump. Uh, my friend who I was taking care of over the weekend uh, was in the emergency room. He was going a little crazy. And I played him 45 minutes of Robert Smigel. I guess it was March 15th, where he did Donald Trump for 45 minutes. And my friend, who was miserable and angry, and he was laughing so hard and going, this guy's a genius. This guy's a genius. <laughs> it just, it's like I, I have listened to Smigel doing Trump, that same 45 minutes uh, I think I've listened to it 16 times. Robert Smigel is uh, a genius. He is, a, he is the greatest television comedy writer. Uh, and that's, I think, Odenkirk. I think Odenkirk said that as well. So it's not just me doing hyperbole. Well, we do a thing called Office Hours every Friday night at 8 p.m., which has turned into something sacred it's we we started about two years ago during the covid lockdown one of the people i met is texas tom weber and i i kind of consider him i, I don't want to embarrass you but you're in my mind everybody takes something from office hours they they t we all take something from office hours and so uh you are to me the soul of office hours you've you have guided it you've said this is kind of like a chautauqua or maybe it was shiitake mushroom what's the difference between chautauqua and shiitake where the old chautauqua revival of art and religion and people camping out and getting to know one another and there's no office hours without texas tom weber and you uh, do a thing called, I always, is it spirituality and activism or activism and spirituality? Spirituality and activism and <laughs> enough of this stuff that you're saying okay. about. That's all uh, silly. And you, well, no, it's important because you've also, you, you teach uh, peace on, office hours and on this show you also teach art and uh you you've taught theology mm -hmm. uh and you were the director of youth ministry for 30 years at, where did you do that at, at a high school well, Catholic high over 30 years i did two things i uh i had one year when i was in pittsburgh when i was teaching in the classroom teaching theology at homestead pa and then I came to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, moved here. And for my first 11 years here, then I was a director of youth ministry. Uh, over the 11 years, I was at three different churches or three different parishes. Then uh, after that, just about ran me and my family in, into the ground. I mean that quite seriously because I was, uh, there were certain times of the year where I was working and I'm not even exaggerating, uh, between 60 and 100 hours a week. Uh, I just wasn't seeing my family, uh, you know, and my kids were growing up and I was just 
I was missing them. So finally, I ended up leaving, and I had told myself I would never go back into the classroom again. And I came back, and I, I loved it. I was really happy to be there. So did that. But one of the things that I loved was I got to teach so many different subjects and do so many different things over those years. So it was great. But anyway. You were talking at office. I just changed the date. On, <laughs> I forgot to. I'm, it still says April 7th. Uh, but I changed. Today's April 11th, correct? I'd have to look, to be quite honest. I, I'm blissfully ignorant of dates these days. Yes, it is. Yeah. So it's April 11th. You were talking Friday night at office hours about what's going on in Russia. You have taught us how to talk to one another, peaceful coexistence, how to tamp down violence. And you said some things about the war, the war crimes being committed in Ukraine by the Russians, which are true. There's no question. And you were struggling with it the same way most of us are struggling with it. I don't think you have bloodlust, and I don't think you want. No, no. Let, okay. let me tell you, here's the thing. You know, as a pacifist, I found myself conflicted uh, over the fact that I am in deep sympathy with the Ukrainian people uh, and watching, you know, most of the news that I, uh, most of the time I'm spending looking at news, it's really following what's going on in Ukraine and watching the uh, suffering, watching the mass exodus, you know, uh, what is, how many is that? Five and a half million now, I think it is. Whatever it is, the current numbers. Uh, out of the uh, country and looking at the devastation, uh, all the bodies. And, you know, I have to, I find myself in deep sympathy with the Ukrainian people as they're fighting back. And, uh, you know, I, I feel powerless. But uh, at the same time, as I've been thinking about this, I see a tremendous danger that I see within myself that I think is reflecting, reflective of what we're all going through right here. You know, back in the uh, first Gulf War, it was very easy to see the fact that we were in the midst of our first uh, really video game war, essentially. You remember Schwarzkopf would come on and he'd have his little video monitor and we'd see you know, it's almost like a little cursor. They you know, made a joke. Bomb flying into buildings and stuff like that. And it was so abstract. Well, this remember is he made not a joke so about. I remember he made a joke about a guy on a bridge and saying, well, this guy yes. had a bad day. Just yeah. trivializing the death. Right, of a right. Yeah. And yes. And, but anyway, it was so abstract. I mean, the difference here is that it, doesn't seem so abstract on one level. But on the other hand, when I'm watching a lot of videos, here I find myself kind of cheering for the uh, Ukrainian people when I see them taking out tanks and all this kind of stuff. And then I started thinking, Tom, you know what? It's in many ways, it's the same kind of thing. I'm not thinking about the people inside this except as a second thought, I'm thinking they're taking out tanks and that's abstract, you know, or you hear 15,000 troops that are killed uh, in the Russians and whatnot, and it becomes an abstraction. So anyway, I'm just saying that that's, that's a conflict that I see within myself right here. And uh, I see <sighs> A tremendous danger within this particular situation that I've been thinking a lot about over the weekend is, my God, you know, we should be at a point, this, this crisis should be waking us up to um, one of the two great crises that, you know, we've grown up with, both of them. One, of course, is, you know, uh, 
the whole situation with the climate. But the other is nukes. You know, we're, we are in tremendous danger and ever closer than ever before to nuclear war. And we're playing with fire right here. And we should be, if we were, if we had any wits about us as human beings at all, we shouldn't be quick to try to turn to uh, aiding and abetting all of the arms industry and lining their pockets for this being kind of a cash cow for them so that uh, they can move out more and more weapons to the people in Ukraine. And uh, instead of trying to deal with it on that level and realizing that as we're doing so, we're also laying the ground for um, Putin to become even more erratic in his behavior and more inclined to use the nuclear option. And that to me is really frightening. And we've got to really rethink this. We should be going, you know what? Now, right now, as we face uh, uh, the po real possibility of nuclear holocaust right here, we should be thinking about how do we get out of this mess and take another turn towards real peace. And what does that look like? You know, hope that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I say, well, we take nuclear warfare off the table because once we go there, there's nothing to discuss. I'm talking about conventional war, conventional weapons. Well, wait, wait, wait. Let's just stop right there. Conventional weapons today, the non-nuclear ones, but the heavy hitters are weapons of mass destruction. They don't have to be nuclear in order to be weapons of mass destruction. And we are seeing this with the indiscriminate killing that's going on. And of course, you know, we're as guilty of that as a nation as any. Uh, but, you know, we, we have to rethink that word conventional weapons and ask ourselves, what the hell does that even mean? Right. Uh, I'm reminded of the Kurds. I don't know if anybody has talked about this. Mm -hmm. You talk about, I think it was George Herbert Walker Bush, of memory serves, who encouraged the Kurds to rise up against Saddam Hussein but then refused to give them air support and they were massacred. This uh, to me, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. I this mean, is this is different sense, if that's what you're going to say, yes. Yeah, Ukraine is different, but it's reminiscent in that Zelensky and the Ukrainian people were enticed by Hillary and Newland and Obama, come join NATO, we'll protect you. And then they rose up and they found out, eh, not really. We were just here to make trouble for Putin. Yeah. Well, and of course, then that's, uh, what was the name of that treaty? Uh, the Minsk, is that correct? Yeah. The 2014, yeah. well, yeah. you know, we, in that, particular treaty, as I understand it, that had been laid down as one of the conditions is that uh, uh, Ukraine was going to be a neutral country. And I don't really see us putting that in front and center. Maybe it is behind uh, the scenes. I don't know. But I don't hear that being the primary point of talk. And I think you I only heard a little bit of your uh, discussion beforehand because I was doing some other stuff, but I think you may have touched upon that, right? Yeah. So on a spiritual level or Star Wars, people who are terrified lash out. I think, y is it Yoda who, who teaches us that, that when you're frightened, you choose violence? America, well, I don't know about yoga, but that's uh, that's certainly true. Yes, the fact that America is leading with weapons instead of peace suggests 
that we're a terrified nation, that we, we lost in Afghanistan, we lost in Iraq. The people in charge are terrified that we can no longer wage war the way we used to, even though the way we used to, we don't win these things. But uh, we're lashing yeah, what out. Are we afraid of? What are we afraid of, David? Because we are finding ourselves right now on losing to China to being the top dog in the world. That's our big fear, I think, right? Yeah, and that the American people are on to them. They're on to the military industrial complex and they no longer want to fund these wars because we're dying here. We're dying from neglect. Our schools, our healthcare system, we're, we're dying at home. And I think the people who are surrounding Biden realize that. They saw it with Bernie and they're terrified that they can no longer get the American people stupid enough to support these even dumber wars. Mm. Well, I, you're a greater optimist than me then in terms of, uh, you say the people, that sounds like the majority average people. And I, I don't really uh, see that in any conversation. You, you think the American people will always choose war? Well, what I will say is this, is that um, in the, before, long before, some months before the uh, invasion of, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the uh, lead up to it, uh, the, our media was, really ratcheting up in its own rhetoric, preparing, uh, laying the groundwork rhetorically for this war and, and legitimizing it before it even happened. And, uh, you know, the thing is, I mean, you know, it's the whole idea of manufactured consent. And I think that uh, when you have such a unified uh, echo chamber going on there and that's what the average people are listening to i don't think people tend to question as much as you seem to be indicating but maybe i'm wrong i'd like to be wrong there yeah let us talk about deep ecology what is deep ecology uh, deep ecology is a and thank you for uh, asking me this. Uh, we're just about to embark in a, or not, not just about, we've just embarked on a study of deep ecology uh, in an anthology of writings of great thinkers um, on this subject, scientists and philosophers of different sorts and ecologists. And deep ecology essentially is a philosophical uh, backlash against the predominant way in which we approach the environment. Uh, the term deep ecology is to, meant to try to contrast this particular philosophical approach to everything that's gone before. And everything that's gone before has been anthropocentric. You know, uh, humans are at the top of the uh, uh, evolutionary chain and so we view ourselves that way and we view everything in the world outside of ourselves as human beings as uh, being there at our disposal. And uh, so, you know, uh, everything is seen as a resource. And of course, this is, you know, uh, works very well within the, uh, you know, the culmination of this whole kind of philosophy is capitalism itself where everything is commodified, right? Um, so, and we see what in, uh, ended up happening uh, as you and I have been growing up, uh, especially since the 50s when I came around and you a little, just not many years later, uh, we saw the very first, for the very first time where uh, the amount of 
devastation that we're inflicting upon uh, and the use and misuse of resources and everything, the earth being no longer able to kind of cleanse itself. And uh, we're getting a backlash from nature itself. So deep ecology is a philosophy which views all of nature all of creation, if you will, as being interdependent. And there being nothing in creation that is disposable, that everything has its own part, and that it extends the idea of rights to include not only just human beings and not only um, sentient creatures, but even non-sentient creatures, if you will, or uh, aspects of our environment. And the easiest way to understand that is to think about the role that water plays. Water is non-sentient, but we can't, you know, we don't use water in a way that's respectful of its own, you will, if you will, right to exist. We're using it as a commodity, misusing it, and uh, so Deep ecology is asking us to look at things more deeply and recognize our own interconnectedness with all that is and to live in a way that is commensurate with that idea. So in essence, that's it. And there's you know much, much more to it, obviously, than that. And it is, uh, I think that it is very well grounded, not just in uh, philosophy, in a, a spiritual outlook, but it also is grounded in uh, all of the best of what science teaches us in terms of ecosystems. Wow. Well, we should continue that. Uh, are, are you covering this on spirituality and activism? Yes, we are. Yes. Uh, so the first two uh, Wednesdays of the month, we're going to be reading from this uh, book, but it's a large anthology, so I figure it would take us a, a year or something like that. I don't know if it'd take that long, but pretty close to a year to get through the whole thing. So uh, we're going to do the first two Wednesdays of the month, and then the last two or three, depending on how many Wednesdays you have in the month, then we will uh, be going into other uh, subjects and ideas. Right. Tell us about Art Attack. Uh, Art, Attack. Art Attack is a new group which I uh, host and began a few weeks back. I don't even know, uh, five, six, maybe five weeks, four, four or five weeks. And it is a um, community of artists of all different uh, skill levels. We have absolute beginners in there. And it the spectrum goes all the way through intermediate on up to semi-professional and professional. So on the professional end, for instance, we have uh, Bruce Mom, uh, his uh, wife, Renee, who is a nationally known uh, children's illustrator, children's book illustrator. And uh, we also have a friend of mine, Sharon, who is a... Uh, She's got three degrees. I can't remember what the third one is, but she's an art historian. Uh, she has also taught art on the collegiate level, university level. And she also is a master printmaker. And uh, so she has also been uh, on an almost weekly basis, been giving a, an art history lesson at the beginning of many of our sessions. And we meet on Sunday afternoons and then we also have a spin-off group that we call um, the Night Owl Roost on Thursday nights, uh, where from my time, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Central, we get together and uh, we're doing basically parallel play. We're doing our own projects and talking with one another, sharing our work and uh, also uh, uh, critiquing each other's work and I sometimes do demonstrations in there. So one is more, uh, we have a, in the, the um, Sunday group, we have a focus where we're all doing the same uh, project or exercises. 
and uh, and the other one we're kind of doing our own thing. I have seen people post their art from Art Attack. At the high end, you have Professor Marianne Cummings, who is, I think she's is somebody. When I first saw her work, I thought it was Cezanne mm -hmm. or Cezanne. Yeah, yeah. Time Maybe. travel. I mean, she's, you know. And then there are people who haven't drawn in years, people like Lane, who thought you got to pick up the pen and start drawing. And the, the improve, it's just been incredible. The, the improvements that I've seen in people who, you know, it, it's just, it's such a gift. How can people, I, I, it's done through this show, I believe, but how do people sign up for it? How do they find out about it? Well, now that's a good question. What I would do is I would go on Facebook and I would type in art attack with an exclamation point. And uh, there is a group by that name, which I host, and uh, put in a request to uh, be a member there. And then uh, I will uh, uh, take a look at uh, all of that. I have to say that I've got about 15 or more members that are coming in from all around the world wanting to be in it but uh i haven't accepted everybody not because they might not be great artists but be quite honest i'm it looks like they probably don't speak english and i feel horrible but well i don't, to, I, I don't know group, we're not multilingual <laughs> it's the problem but i think that's okay yeah I yeah I would love to, you know, if I if I could figure out a way to have everybody, uh, no matter what country you're in and what language, I would do that. But anyway, that's the way to do it. Just go on there. And otherwise, you can also find me on Discord and just PM me there. And Fantastic. I will be happy to set things up. We need to do this more often. Tom sure. Weber, Texas Tom Weber, thank you so much. All right, I'll God bless you. Thank you. God bless you, too. I'll see you. Uh, Thursday or Wednesday. Oh, you're uh, going to be coming? I hope that that's um, true. We, yeah. We did get you a couple of weeks ago. That was really great. Yeah. It was great. All right. Well, you take care. All right. Thank you. Bye bye so to you and to everybody in the audience. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Let us now go to, I hope, Los Angeles, where Howie Klein is standing by. Hello, Howie. Hi, David. How are you tonight? Uh, it's still daytime here, but I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Howie Klein is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC, and they raise money for progressive candidates. He's also the author of Down with Tyranny. I have some questions. I, I was reading some pieces over there that I wanted to ask you about. Were we supposed to have Santa Claus on tonight? <clears throat> yes. No Santa Claus. There, yes, Virginia. There is a Santa Claus, but we didn't book him, did we? But t let's do. Then we have Congresswoman Marie Newman next week. Next week is is Marie, but uh, Santa was supposed to be tonight. Oh, damn! I, oh, I, did I, we I, screw oh. up, or did uh, you screw up? Did one of his elves? No, his all elves didn't screw up. We 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 did collectively. Okay, I take full responsibility. So tell us, who, you. tell us who Santa Claus is. Santa Claus is a, uh, a Bernie Kratz uh, from, I think he was born in Washington, D.C. He lived in New York when John Lindsay was the mayor of New York. Lindsay appointed him to be, to be assistant police commissioner or something like that. And uh, he now lives in North Pole where he's a city councilman and the mayor pro tem. And uh, he's a very, very, very progressive. Like I said, he's a Bernie crowd all the way. And he's running for Congress. There's an open congressional seat. Um, Don Young passed away recently. And uh, Santa is running for that seat. Now, is, is it, did he change his name to Santa Claus? What's his, or is that his? Re no, he changed his name to Santa Claus you know, years ago. When Mayor Lindsay appointed him, or afterwards? After he was twenty-three when Mayor Lindsay appointed him, he's quite a bit older now. Okay, so this and, will be this will be exciting. Sarah Palin is 
running for Congress. In that, in that, for that same seat. So he's, it, so people are calling it Santa versus Pinocchio. <laughs> she doesn't have a chance, though, to win the primary, though, does she? Well, well, we, I don't know what you mean by that. There's a, she is going to win. She, you know, four people win the primary. They go on to the general. She'll only be one of them. But I, I thought the Alaskans are on to the Palins, that they, they know her, that she's not viable. <laughs> Well, some of the Alaskans do, and some of the Alaskans love her. I mean, you know, there's a lot of going on now. Uh, Trump has already endorsed her, and that's, that's enough for some people. Right. Let's turn to the primaries. What's coming up? It's already April 11th. What's... what's... Well, the, the first one that's coming up is, that, I, that I'm taking an interest in is, is May 3rd. And that's Ohio. So those are the Ohio primaries. So, you know, we have a fairly interesting Republican primary. And of course, we have a very important Democratic primary. So the Democrats have, uh, you know, they have congressional seats. The one that I'm most interested in is Nina Turner. She's running again against Chantel Brown, a corporate shill, just a conservative, nothing Democrat. Incumbent. She's the incumbent. She, yeah, she was just elected uh, uh, just a few months ago. So it's, it right. was a special election. So, so people don't really know her yet. And uh, she beat Nina Turner last time. The district is slightly different this time. Nina told me a few days ago that she feels that she learned some very, very important lessons when she ran last time, and she thinks she's going to run a much better campaign this time. Right. Can, can, I, ask I, you, can I ask you for a favor? Sorry? Can I ask you for a favor? Please. I, I've gotten uh, complaints about my eating on the show, and people hang on your every word. And sometimes when you're cooking, it, it's hard to hear you. Is, I know you're cooking. Is there any way is it, we can? I'm not exactly cooking. I'm, I'm just cutting vegetables. It, it, I know, but it's hard. To, sometimes it's hard to hear you. So. Of the like the, uh, the, the uh, what's it called? The, um, is it because of me walking away from the phone or is it because of, of me watching things? Yeah. All, of, all of the above. Is there all right. Well, all right. I'll, I'll tell Roland the reason we're going to be late today is because you're making a fuss. <laughs> late dinner, Roland, if you're listening. I'm sorry. Is there any way you could, can we compromise where you hold the phone to your ear and kind of crook your neck? Oh, I, I wouldn't want the, uh, the, you know, the phone to fall into the pomelo or something. Right. Uh, what do I do? Nothing. Does it not sound good now? I'm not doing anything now. If you could, I mean, don't I owe it to my, what, what would you do if you were I? What would you tell do? me? If, you need to tell me if I'm uh, not not uh, coming through uh, well enough. Right I mean, now. yeah, I feel like I don't want I want Roland to have his meal. I like the fact that me. But it is we do have you know our listeners who want to hear. What would you do if you were me? Do you not hear me? It's not as good. The sound is kind of like I like you holding the phone. To All you. right, I'm holding it. Ah, so I have my neck crooked and the phone between, and I will keep away from the pomelo. You know, it, it, it's like the voice of God now. It, I, <laughs> I, I hate to be a pain in the ass, but this sounds so much better. Okay, so, oh, okay. so who is giving up their Senate seat? That So Rob Portman, a Republican, uh, kind of a mainstream Republican who just could not stand Trump, but but a, but a mainstream Republican is very conservative. It's not like he's a liberal Republican. He was a very conservative Republican, just not a Nazi. Right. And he uh, he's 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 retiring from the Senate, so it's an open seat. So the Republicans, speaking of Nazis, have a whole bunch of them running. Uh, the ones that you've probably heard of are, are J. D. Vance, who's an, the author of the Hillbilly Elegy. Right. And. And the other one who's also very uh, much better known, is, at least in, in um, Ohio, is Josh Mandel, who, is, who was at one time the state treasurer. And, and they've been competing 
to see who could be the further the furthest right. Uh, and they're both doing well in, in that uh, competition. They're they're so extreme; it's just incredible. But I think that uh, Vance killed himself recently by saying, "Who cares about what happens in Ukraine? Nobody cares." And I think that was pretty much the end of his campaign. But Josh Mandel is mentally ill. It, I, he, yes, I would I would totally agree with you on that. He is- uh, and uh, there is there and there's also two Democrats who are competing. Uh, one of them is, is uh, Tim Ryan, who's a congressman, who, who really isn't any good. He was, he was a, a, a very, very, at best, mediocre congressman. He, he's not, he, he, you know, a lot of times, even though he wasn't great on the issues, but a lot of times, even when someone is, is okay on the issues, which he wasn't, uh, if they don't have courage and they don't have, they don't have the ability to uh, talk about issues that are important to them and, uh, and, and, and explain them to the people in, the, in who they represent, you know, what good are they? I mean, who cares if they just vote right? I mean, it's better than voting wrong, which he did half the time anyway. But the, thing, the reason I'm bringing this up is because he's been a, um, a, uh, an anti-choice Democrat. So, that, I mean, that, and, and this day and age, that's pretty awful, to, you know, to be against women's choice. And then he changed his mind after, after years and years of being an anti-choice Democrat. And he, um, but he never announced it. He, for, for years, he kept it secret. I mean, you know, he told me that he's now pro-choice, but he never like told the people in his district. So, you know, I mean, and he was basically because he was just afraid. Right. Uh, you know, and you know, do we really need more people who are afraid making their decisions because of fear? I don't think so. And I don't think the voters like that either. He, his opponent is, is an incredible young woman who um, worked in the Obama, Obama administration uh, named Morgan Harper. And she's, she's a, a full-fledged, fighting, courageous progressive. Uh, she's, the, the establishment is completely uh, behind him. But the... the, the uh, Ohio Democratic establishment is pretty weak. So, you know, I don't know what they're going to be able to deliver for him. He's definitely the favorite in the race. Uh, but, you know, it's not like she has no chance. But that is on the 5th of May, and I, or the 3rd of May. I think it's the 3rd of May. And people are voting already. Go back to the Republicans for a second. Is, is it between Josh Mandel and J.D. Vance? No, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's some rich businessman um, who's running as well, and he's doing well, but no one's ever heard of him, you know, except, you know, his name is Mike Gibbons, and and I don't think any of our, our listeners know who he is. So, so is it, be. I mean, so it is conceivable that Josh Mandel could actually get the nomination? Um, I would say at this point, if someone asked me to bet who's going to get the nomination, I would bet on him. I mean, you know, uh, you, you know, tr- Trump can change what happens there. I think the, the, you know, all the polling shows the same thing that uh, that voters are waiting for Trump to tell them who to vote for. So they haven't made up their minds yet. As, as you probably know, I mean, now we're, we're skipping ahead till um, May seventeenth, which is just you know, not that far away. It's a, a month away, and in, in Pennsylvania, there's a similar race where a mainstream conservative. A uh, Republican is retiring, Pat Toomey, and there's a bunch of very right-wing Republicans fighting it out. And there's also an interesting Democratic uh, primary in this one. So uh, should, we, should we go to the Democratic primary first? Yeah, I just want to ask you one quick question about what's going on in Ohio. I'm just curious, because I saw J.D. Yeah, yeah, uh, they are running from the Ken Melman 2004 uh, uh, Republican playbook. They're, they're running on gay marriage, aren't they? They're running on LGBTQ issues, it seems. Well, that, that's, that's no. It, that's part of it. They're running on, on the whole, uh, you know, the whole panoply of, of right-wing uh, culture war issues. That's w- only one of them. It's not, it's not especially the biggest one, but it's def- definitely one of them. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's a really bad lot. I mean, they are they have all bad candidates. Now, J.D. Vance um, had to dumb himself down to 
to make himself palatable. And he, and he was counting on Trump coming in and endorsing him. His, um, you know, his, his money bags, uh, what's his name again? The guy who started PayPal or one of the first investors oh, in PayPal? Thiel, Peter Thiel. Yeah, Peter Thiel. Uh, he gave him a uh, million dollars or $10 million, some godly, god awful sum. Yeah. And, and otherwise he wouldn't even be in the race anymore. He, 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 you know, he started off as a, as a real contender. And then as time went on, he got to be less and less of a, of a contender. And at this point, he, he doesn't really have much of a chance to win. So, you know, and, and the polling will, you know, Trump, if Trump comes in for him and there was a lot of talk that Thiel had promised Trump, you know, that he would give the money to any charity, you know, he'd make a giant, he has a few candidates. He wants Trump to endorse them. And uh, he's kind of said to Trump, from what I'm hearing, that he will give a, a large sum of money, like mil- millions and millions of dollars, to the charity of Trump's choice. But we know what Trump's charities are. They they're, they get funneled into his pocket. So um, it's, a, it's an, just an outright bribe. And so far, Trump hasn't done it. I, I, my suspicion is that he may, he may, but we'll see. Right. Trump likes to come out as, as a winner. Uh, and interestingly enough, he just endorsed not the front runner in the Pennsylvania um, race. This weekend, he suddenly came out and said he was endorsing Dr. Oz. <laughs> and I know it sounds funny. And, and all of uh, MAGA world is flipping out because Dr. Oz uh, has a long record of not being a MAGA kind of guy. He, you know, was in favor of many, many, many things that they hate, like Trans trans uh, trans operations for children, which is one of the big issues now. Right. <laughs> he, he, on tape, you know, long long tape, interviewing somebody, a trans uh, a young woman, and, in a very positive way. So they hate that. He was uh, pro choice at one time. He he was uh, too pro immigrant for them. He's a Muslim. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that the that uh, MAGA world is not happy about when it comes to um, uh, Dr. Oz. But it's professional but, courtesy. You know, he's a fraud, it. and Oz is a fraud. So you have to right, and not just a, just any kind of fraud, but a TV fraud. Right, right, right. Uh, so you know, Trump feels a kinship with him. Right. Uh, yeah, and we'll see what what that does. I mean, and, and he he wasn't winning the race. Uh, some corporate hack who was running the biggest hedge fund company in America, a guy named David McCormick has been leading. Um, so he also thought that, that Trump was going to endorse him. So we'll have to see, you know, what Trump's uh, endorsement is worth in, in this race. If Dr. Oz suddenly pulls ahead, then we know uh, it was because of Trump. 20% of this country is stupid enough and crazy enough to, well, no. How many votes did Trump get? I mean, it's, more, it's way more than 20%. Yeah, but yeah, not, yeah, 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 yeah. Is it? Yeah, I mean, right. I'd like to think that this party has just gotten so crazy, so stupid, that it's just even ordinary Americans who call themselves Republicans can't go this far. But no, right? This is, there's no limit. There's no depth, right? That's right. Yep, you're exactly right. I mean, no, that's where the 20% comes in. There's no depth for them. And that 20% could be 25% or could be 30% or maybe 35%. They're, you know, of people who just, you know, just fall for the whole thing. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you hear Trump, I hear Trump, and we hear a charlatan. We hear like someone who's a compulsive liar and who isn't even worth listening to. They hear Trump and they think, oh, my God, it's like Jesus. Right, right. Thank you, The Apprentice. Mark Burnett, NBC, they gave us Trump. I want to ask you about Ukraine, because you wrote some things over Down With Tyranny. You think Putin, well, tell me what you think of Putin and tell me what you think we need to do about Ukraine. Uh, The first one is pretty easy. The second one is very hard. So uh, yeah, I have very uh, I have very low esteem for Putin. I feel he's a, a butcher and a uh, war criminal. I also feel that this thing isn't going to end uh, when he's while he's in power. 
So we're, we're in a very, very difficult situation. I mean, you think that if, if Fox gives misinformation, I mean, imagine what it's like when, it, when it's in Russia and it's all state, um, state controlled, um, right. media right. and you can't, you don't get any, um, any other point of view. And, um, the Russian people are, are very much behind, uh, Putin now. Uh, everything I'm reading, including an independent poll, says that uh, he he was. Well, you, they have to be behind Putin, otherwise they get arrested. Well, they don't. They don't have to say anything. I mean, we're talking about an independent right. poll, but um, from what I'm hearing, uh, people are um, thinking that the 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 atrocities that have been described are so beyond the pale that they're impossible. They had to, they have to have been made up. And, you know, I, uh, someone was talking about that the other day saying, how could they even live with themselves if they thought that these atrocities, like what happened in, in uh, we, I don't know how you pronounce it. Buka, Bucha. But, but yeah. Yeah. You know, how could, how, or, or marry a pole. I mean, how could, how could someone like live with, with themselves knowing that their country did that? Of course, we all seem to manage to live with ourselves during Vietnam and uh, Iraq. Um, right. I mean, I if you watch Al Jazeera and see what we did in Iraq or what Israel does in Gaza, uh, you know. Yes, I do know. But we're not allowed to see those videos. Those are too dist- those are too disturbing. You have to go to Al Jazeera to see what is done in Gaza and what is done in Baghdad. Or what was done in Baghdad. Baghdad. Yeah. But you remember, uh, you're old enough to remember the war in Vietnam and the attack on Cambodia. Uh, you know, that, that, you know, I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I, when I say I couldn't sleep from, uh, from what was, what my country was doing in, in Southeast Asia. And, and in the end, I, I just felt like, like I had to leave leave America, and I did. Okay, so what what do we're in America? There's no question that Putin is committing atrocities. What do we do oh, about it? Also, do, do all of your listeners uh, believe that too, or do you have some uh, some crazy people who say that it's it, it's it's all made up? Well, I like to think my listeners know that that Putin is a criminal. Uh, on par with the United States, uh, you know, but yes, he's committing war crimes. He's, this is when you kill right. civilians, it's a war yeah. crime to kill civilians. America's killed. Close, clear. Close, I'm sorry. That we both, we, we, we should make it clear that we both feel the same way. Putin is a war criminal. Uh, Kissinger was, is a war criminal. Right. Uh, George H. W., uh, George W. Bush was a war criminal. Cheney. Dick Cheney was a war criminal. That doesn't, but that doesn't excuse Putin in any way, shape, or form. They're all war right. criminals. Exactly. So what do we do? By the way, I throw Rob Reiner into the mix for personal reasons. But uh, as a war criminal, yeah, he should keep his mouth shut. We'd get. Tell me, I. No, I, if, he, I, if Rob Reiner would keep his mouth shut, we could. People, more people would vote for people like Bernie. Uh, but that's a whole other story. War criminals, war criminals. What do we do? So what does America do? Have we lost our moral authority? I think we have. Yeah, I don't know that America could really do anything. I mean, uh, about uh, getting him to stop uh, short of going to war with him, which we may not have any choice at, at some point. I mean, it's a horrible thing to think of. Why? But, well, why is what? Why is it horrible? Why do we have no choice but to go to war with Putin? Well, what else? What is the other? What is the other choice? I mean, you know, the Neville, the Neville Chamberlain thing was to, uh, you know, give in to Hitler, uh, thinking, well, we'll buy peace by giving in to him, and it didn't buy peace. It we, bought peace for a couple months. We bought, but Chamberlain. <laughs> I mean, I, I was going to talk about that earlier. Chamberlain is reviled. The fact is. He had no choice but to make peace with Hitler because they he needed to buy time until Great Britain could rearm. He wasn't prepared to go to war with 
with um, I don't, I, I, you know, that's a, um, an interpretation of what happened that it, it's not like widely accepted. Yeah, because what because history is written by the people who sell bombs and the lesson that the takeaway from appeasement is, see, we need to build up our military all the time and, and fight wars. Well, by the time by the time uh, he was forced into going into declaring war on Germany, um, he, he if I remember, I, I'm trying to remember who was eight months or nine months before, like any bullet was fired in anger. Uh, and and they just let the polls like be uh, be absolutely slaughtered. So you know I I do not uh, have this uh, um, new look at uh, I don't believe in this new look at uh, Chamberlain. I well, mean, I, I'm it, not going to defend of... appeasement. I'm just saying that if you cannot fight your enemy, you uh, and and by the way they declared war and then sat it out for two years and let the Russians do all the fighting. It, well, I, I think they, 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 no, they sat it out for uh, uh, eight months or nine months, not, not two years. I well, mean, the Russians, in, in Italy, the Russians, America but, and Churchill decided to let the Russians do all the fighting, and we would fight in North Africa against Rommel with the, the Britons while, we re, while the, Brit, the Brits and rearmed and waited for D-Day, 1944. So... You know, we bought. But it's not like uh, like our side wasn't fighting. They they were. They, you know, I mean, not yes, North Africa, but also in other parts of, of the world. And what became Yugoslavia, they were fighting there. They were fighting in Greece, um, you, and um, obviously uh, they got they got their asses kicked in um, in uh, Belgium and northern France. But why can't but, we? Why why do we? Why do you feel we have no choice but to go to war with Putin? I don't, I don't understand that. I didn't say that. I said that we're not going to have a choice. I didn't say we have no choice, meaning that we have to do it now. But I mean, you know, for example, the the U.S. is bound by treaty to um, to defend other our NATO allies. Right. So in other words, you know, attack one and you attack them all. Well, well, I'm, I don't think Putin is going to uh, not attack them. I mean, I think his next target is going to well there's a couple of little targets but i think they have every intention of going to going to uh into poland and now that we have um uh what is it called um finland saying that they're joining nato this summer uh putin has made clear he has he has he has designs on 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 finland i mean russia has been chipping away at finland for a century they take a little here and they take a little there they keep taking you know i think it's 12 percent of finland is now uh is now incorporated into russia and everything that i wrote in that story about um how russia defines nazis and not and denazification everything that was said that they said in that uh, propaganda piece about ukraine all of that is true about about uh in their mind about Finland. They, they have every intention of going into Finland, going into Poland. How is the U S going to uh, handle that? You know, there were, you know, the same way that Hitler said, all we want to do is free um, German speakers. Well, well, Putin is saying the same thing. All we want to do is free Russian speakers. And you know, you, Russia, there are a lot of Russian speakers in, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, like a lot of them. And, uh, you know, he's going to say, well, I just want to take the areas where um, there were Russian speakers. And what, what does the U.S. do then? I mean, we're not we're doing the same thing that um, Chamberlain did right now that, that he did in Czechoslovakia, where, where we're not we're not um, taking an aggressive stance. I don't know. I don't know if if we can, but we're not. And uh, when I say an aggressive stance, I mean, we're not doing anything that's going to make Russia uh, declare war on us. Um, but what happens when he goes when he, he, he goes after a NATO ally, which I expect is going to happen? And I've, then then what do we do? Well, I've heard this. You know, it's the domino theory. This is a threadbare excuse for fighting a Cold War or a hot war. Putin won't stop with just Ukraine 
and you have to stop him at Poland. I'll, I, I don't know if he would invade Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, all these places that Russia has claims to. Now, you know, you, you could say, or you could have said, the U.S. shouldn't have been allowing these countries into NATO. But, you know, it's too late now. Is it too late? or? Well, not, it's not too late for Finland. I mean, we don't have to let Finland and Sweden in. I mean, Finland, the U.S. has been encouraging Finland to join NATO for a very long time. The Finns were afraid. Now they're more afraid because of not joining. So it, until recently, only 20% of, of Finns in, in polling wanted to join NATO. It's now over, over 50%. Don't you do everything you can before you go to war to, to, to sit down with Putin and work it out? Yeah. Do, do you get you, a sense? Have, do, what do you get, do? Do you get a sense that this administration is begging for peace? Yes. You, do, you, you think the Biden administration is, is begging Putin, is trying to negotiate with him, uh, having summits, well, yes, but having a summit with, you know, um, Biden isn't going to do any good. So they're sending other people who, you know, might be able to uh, do it better, like whether it's Macron or, um, you know, the head of government of Austria or the head of government of Israel. I mean, they're sending surrogates to talk with him. And, you know, and I'm sure once a deal is made, in theory, then Biden, then it's Biden's turn. Right. But we are we spend more on defense than all of NATO combined. Shouldn't it be all of NATO? We spend more on defense than, than the next 10 countries combined. Right. So, but don't you think Blinken and uh, and Biden uh, should be trying to prevent? They are. OK. I'm I not, think that trying to prevent. I, I, I mean, I, I don't. They want to go to war with Russia. I think they very much don't want to go to war with Russia. Now, there, I know there are a lot of people who disagree with me, both on the left and the right. But, um, you know, the thing is, is war is different now. You know, it's not a matter of who has the most bombs. You don't need the, the most bombs. You, you, you know, the, with, nuclear, uh, with nuclear bombs, you know, they can take out a major American city. We may ultimately win. But what you know? What would be the what would be the point of winning when uh, a couple of American cities are smoldering ruins? Well, we have to wrap it up. Howie Klein is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack. They raise money for progressive candidates around America. Read him every day over at Down with Tyranny. Uh, thank you, Howie. Thank you. And I feel terrible about Santa Claus. I don't know what we're going to do. Maybe what we'll do is uh, next week we're going to have Marie Newman as our guest. And then the week after, I'll ask Santa if, he'll, if, he'll, if he will forgive us and come on. Uh, and then I have another special surprise guest. Uh, and another, since you asked for incumbents, I have another incumbent who, who said he he's going to try to do it as well. Wow. That's fantastic. Thank yeah. you, Howie. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Follow Howie Klein over down with tyranny uh, on Twitter. If it's still around, uh, I just read that half the tweets, uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon did a study of all the tweets on Twitter about Corona COVID. Half of them are bots. Well, David Pepper is a lawyer, writer, political activist. And he is author of Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake up call from behind the lines. It's good to have you on the show. Thank you for doing this, David Pepper. Thank you, David. Good to be with you. Thank you. Mike, before we get to, well, you're, you want to talk about Laboratories of Autocracy. Uh, the Republicans have a trifecta in how many states? What is a trifecta? And then how many states have that? I don't remember the number, but it's when you they have governor, uh, Senate and House. And it, it's a whole lot of them. Uh, too many. I'll just say that. Right. What is an autocracy? Well, you know, we think of it in one way as um, 
sort of, I guess, Putin style government. But what I try and explain in my book is we're seeing a new um, we're seeing a new form of it in, in this world right now. And, and the most perfected form is what they're all celebrating in Hungary, uh, Orban, where uh, it they're the, the academics call it a competitive autocracy, which almost sounds too good for what it is. Oh. Basically, it's every single um, outcome is predetermined but they go through it a process that makes it feel legitimate. But the same people are always in charge, even if they don't represent a majority of that population. And that's that's what, that's sort of, if you look at why Tucker Carlson and CPAC and Trump and now Marjorie Taylor Greene are all so admiring of Orban, it's because he's, he's figured out how to do it by, by controlling the media in certain ways, which he's done, by gerrymandering the heck out of his parliament, he basically gets to be in charge no matter what the people think. And the reason I call the book Laboratories of Autocracy is that is where our state houses are not only going, but in many cases, they're basically already there. They are, they are in many states, even when the people vote for the other side, these people are still firmly in control of their state's driving seats, which is these state houses. Right. The argument for states' rights is that each state is a laboratory for democracy. Right. The idea is you can try different things, and if it works, other states will pick up on it, and eventually it will bubble up to the federal government. Kansas, I think uh, the guy's name was Bra Bra Brownback, Sam Brownback, Brownback. Brownback. studied the government, lower, ta uh, lower taxes, and supposedly Kansas learned its lesson. Even the Republicans learned their lesson and said, you know what, uh, lowering taxes is not is is going to destroy uh destroy not just the government but the country right. so sometimes we do learn short-term lessons briefly where where are the worst laboratories in that's autocracy? Great, so so and that's you just picked up on the top of my book so what's happened is the observation that's been made for centuries that state houses can in in this sort of naively optimistic view Oh, can, they can be this great source of positive innovation. What the Koch brothers and the far right has learned for 40 years is they can also be models for doing negative things. Attacks on democracy, trickle on economics, extreme social policy. And so they flipped the script and they have been using states in a way that, have, as I use the title, that have been laboratories for all the wrong things. You know, something horrible passes in Texas attacking Roe v. Wade. If that gets upheld by courts, they'll do it everywhere else. The, the don't the say gay bill in Florida, it's already in Ohio. They always are learning from another. So they literally, for the same reason that states have the, have the power to be laboratories of a democracy and good things, they have the same power to be laboratories of negative things. And who's the worst right now? You know, I use Ohio in my book because I'm from here and, you know, we are this bellwether state. Right now, we're the bellwether of many things bad, unfortunately, including the downward spiral due to our corrupt and rigged state house. But I'd say other ones that are really extreme. Uh, Wisconsin uh, is really, you know, uh, you know, this is a state that was blue, including for its state house. It's governing like a deep red state. Tennessee, you know, Texas, Florida, uh, Indiana. You know, it's funny when I wrote my book and I, I uh, laid out my book. I started getting emails from people all over the country. Oh my gosh, you just described my state perfectly. Um, it, your story in Ohio is very similar to these other states. Um, and um, so, yeah, there, there's about eight or 10. But, but, but to be clear, there are dozens of states that are operating in this way. And so in one way, they're all doing the same thing. And right. again, if one state does it and it works in whatever frankly, negative way that they want to work, a whole lot of other states will be doing it in the next year. What is ALEC? ALEC is basically the group of the, 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 the corporate funded group that figured out everything I've just been saying about 30 years ago. And so rather than in individuals, and I agree, Ron, Wisconsin is a mess. Um, rather than each state going through the things I described on its own, Alec figured out that these legislators who no one knows love going on trips. They love being toasted as champions of the cause. 
And they love taking legislation that's written for them by the private sector and that, this group, Alec, and going back to their state house and passing it. And that's why a lot of the bills that we're talking about that are passing in these individual states, they weren't written in those states. They were written in some, um, in, in some conference somewhere, often by the private sector folks who benefit from that so-called public legislation. So the ALEC is essentially a, sort of a combination of has privatized and I'd say weaponized these undemocratic state houses to serve this right-wing economic agenda. So basically what, what, the, what the far right on the economic and other social issues have figured out, they don't need Congress for much. Why? Because almost everything they want done, they can get done through state houses. And ALEC is one of the now many mechanisms they're using to say, skip, you know, skip Congress. We don't need to deal with that. We can get our agenda done in state houses. And they're so gerrymandered that the people that pass the things we asked in the past, even if they're really unpopular or turn out to be abysmal failures, those people still get reelected because they're in districts they can't lose which is not quite as the same as in Congress. So ALEC is sort of one of the, one of the places, I, the way I describe it, they've hotwired all these state houses to accomplish the white, right wing agenda all at once. Is the problem that the so-called standard bearers of democracy, I think you would supposedly find them in the Ivies, although Cotton and Ted Cruz come out of the Ivies, but is the problem that the people who are supposed to protect democracy are hyper-educated elitists who don't want to bother with the state houses because you don't get rich and famous covering the state houses or helping out in the state houses unless you take bribes? Isn't that the problem that I, there are too many pamp pampered yeah, elitists? I, mean, I think there's some, there's some elitism about it. I also, though, think that those who care about democracy, and I'll put, I hope that's not just Democrats, by the way, I hope it's a broader group, but most of politics is still thought through as personalities, you know, people looking for the next Obama or the right. next, you know, Pete Buttigieg or who, who you name it. And that means we're waiting for these sort of savior like figures who normally are not at state houses because no one's looking at level. We need them to be these heroic people. And, you know, you talk about Alec, they don't care about that. They care about the institutions of power. And if you are the most boring, non-impressive, you know, person, if you're in that state house seat voting to gerrymander for the next 10 years, they love you. They don't need you to be impressive. They don't need you to even be able to say three sentences. And, you know, some right. of these people can't. So right. I think part of it is that, like that we're looking for that great savior. And part of it is, that we look at the big federal legislation is the big win. And again, they figured out that in their state, gerrymandering or some other law that passes that no one's even paying attention to gets as much done as whatever big announcement happens in D.C. So they have a more patient strategy. They have a more disciplined strategy. And we're waiting for these high moments and silver bullet things that, that when they come, you know, we, we think we've won every, by the way, one of the, one of the signs that their strategy is working and ours isn't is we basically fight over the federal battle. That's our big map. That's our big battle. Right. Their battle is state houses. Cause that's where you control democracy. We won everything that you could hope to win in 2020, right? White house. We picked up those Senate seats. We have the house. Does it feel like we're winning the battle for democracy right now? It doesn't because our no. battle is too narrow. Their battle over democracy, their battle of controlling state houses, they succeeded in 20. And that's why they're still winning the battle over democracy, even as we thought we won our main goals in 20. So it shows you they've got a deeper battle happening. And I, I say this all the time, until the side that cares about democracy wakes up to that's what this battle is about, and it's being fought in state for state every single year, not just presidential years, until that side figures it out, the other side's gonna keep winning. And you can even lose when you think you're winning if you're not paying attention like we just saw happen. It's interesting. So supposedly our side, the Democrats, we have authoritarian impulses. We have this hero worship of the Kennedys, of Obama. Uh, we just love our leader to the point where we're, 
we're, we'd be willing to accept a strong person, a strong man, an Orban or an Erdogan, because we believe in a strong federal government and we don't pay enough attention to what's going on in government. So just give us a charismatic leader who will solve all, all our problems. That's how you end up with an autocracy. You're saying that the Republicans, even though they're run by corporate America, have a bottom up approach and the Democrats who are also run by corporate America have a top down approach and you always lose if it's top down. It's got to be a groundswell. It's got to come from the people because all politics is local as Tip O'Neill. I mean, there were, I'd say a lot of the organization of their, by the way, I, I think that on the Democratic side, you know, we, even if we look for exciting personalities, we still believe in the rule of law. Uh, so I wouldn't put us in the same category of, of what, what the other side's doing, which they are running over the rule of law right now over and over and over again, and there's no accountability for it. But I would say that theirs is quite top down too, but they understand that those local, when all those school board races were happening last fall, um, that was grassroots in a way, but the money was coming from up high. So they right. are focused on those positions. They understand the power of those positions over democracy, state house, state Supreme Court, even a school board that I think Democrats really get. We really want to focus on those swing Senate seats and a few other exciting federal races, maybe some governor races occasionally. But we don't have, we aren't seeing the broader playing field and we're not seeing, you know, that these other positions have massive levers. Uh, I, by the way, uh, John, I do wish I had a PhD and could be called Dr. Pepper. Um, I'm looking at the comments there. Um, oh, yeah. We don't they're gonna see, what's that? Doctor, don't pay attention to the no, chat. I, I, I have a JD, so maybe that sort of counts. But my point is, yeah, they, they are focused on many of the levers over that that have an impact on democracy that democrats just too are too too often aren't focused on enough we are talking with david pepper author of laboratories of autocracy a wake-up call from behind the lines who's the most dangerous republican you think josh mandel is running in your home state yeah the governor jd vance Great these question. are the worst these are the worst of the worst, aren't they? they Mandel is they're, they're more, on stupid, they're more craven and stupid than they are dangerous, but they, craven and stupid. Yeah, right. Cra the, my new theory is, and we are, we've seen it play out. If you have no backbone, if you are craven, you're as dangerous as the most dangerous person because you'll do what they want and you'll provide cover for their bad deeds. Rob Portman's an amazing example. He, he, he seems like a good person. He's polite. If you were in a room with him, he'd be polite, but he has no courage. So he's gone along with almost everything Trump did. He helped cover up for the, for the Zelensky uh, shakedown. And because he helps cover up for it and he seems like a decent guy, it provides cover to Trump's misdeeds. So I think the people who lack courage are actually as dangerous as the most dangerous person if they won't stand up to them. Uh, uh, to your question, though, Mandel is, as, I mean, if people don't like Josh Hawley, uh, Mandel is 10 times, um, 10 times that. He's horrible. J.D. Vance, to me, is like an aggressive Portman. He'll say whatever he needs to say, which is also as dangerous as it gets. The people who... Who, all we know about them is that they'll say whatever they need to say. That's that's how you end up in a really bad place as a country. So, uh, you know, Vance, Mandel, yeah, not uh, scary people and people that that, you know, should be nowhere near a U.S. Senate seat. Um, right. Yeah. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. I'm not leaving the party. I want to kick people out. A lot of my time is spent attacking Democrats and people complain, well, why don't you go after the Republicans? I do. I do go. But I'm angrier at my own. I'm angrier because you know that J.D. Vance right now is talking anti-LGBTQ and transgender to to get elected. But I also know that Joe Biden is to get elected is saying, I'll be the most pro-union president you've ever seen. 
And as a Democrat, I find that offensive to hijack things that I really believe in and not follow through. To me, that's really, I'm more offended by people who pretend to be on my side and then screw me. Who are you angrier at? The Democratic Party or the Republican Party? Me, I mean, I, I'm more angry at the Republican Party, but I think here, here's my broader view, though. What, but why? Well, let me ask but you. Let me why? Are you... That, I because I I think right now in our country, one side is literally going at the jugular of democracy, um, and I don't ever want to equate the failure of the other side to fight effectively with that horrible intent. But I do agree on this. If you look at the history of our country, there's always been those who would undermine democracy, okay? And the, the variable, and this is where angry isn't, my, isn't the word I use for me, but the frustration I have that, that I think you and I would overlap. The variable of what happens to our democracy is not, are there people fighting to undermine democracy? They are always there. The variable is how hard do those who care about democracy fight back? And when they right. fight back really, really hard, democracy does well. And if they shirk or fail to fight back or cut deals, like not like letting the filibuster stop them from passing voting rights bills, democracy loses. So of right. course I'm mad at Republicans for talking democracy, but boy, am I frustrated when I don't feel that there's a fight on the, on the Democratic side in an understanding that the, the, the scale of their fight it determines everything. And the right. history of our country, um, you go back to the moments where democracy was under attack, when those who cared about democracy did not step up and fight for it, it lost for 70 years, we call Jim Crow. And right. it was a bunch of politicians in the late 1800s that stopped fighting. They quit. Right. And, and black voters so in particular, that- and black people in particular, paid the price for 80 years. So I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm angry as much as I'm just deeply frustrated and will never stop pushing for our side to get in the game in a way they're not in the game right now. What is our side? Well, I, I, well I'm, I'm a Democrat, but I would say the broader side is those who believe that in the end, it should be for the people to direct this country um, and not you know, the, the small group right now that are trying to run it through through the Republican Party. And well, when you say we, are, our we side, are dangerously close to having a, a locked-in system of minority rule, pushing almost entirely policies on individual states and the country uh, that, um, that well, are- Let me ask um, you, what are, do, you believe, do you believe in Medicare for all? Um, let me think about the best way to put that. You have to think about that. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not honestly. I'm not. I'm. Tr- I'm not getting into every individual issue. I. I. Um, I'm. I'm not engaging on the individual issues. I don't. I can't say that. Uh, you know, I. I want to have a system that's as broadly as possible, but I'm not going. I don't really. I'm not. That's not really what what I'm writing about or pushing on. I. Really? I, I my my priority right now is. There are many who believe in Medicare for all. There are many who believe, you know, in the in the Buddha judge, Medicare for all who want it. That's a really important debate. Yeah, I understand it's not a trick question. I'm sorry I didn't answer it as eloquently as could have. I believe that the, the, the broader and deeper commitment to democracy is right now the more important issue to unite around and then have that out. And my worry right. is that we are letting debates, and this is how we got Jim Crow, we are letting debates on on these issues divide us in a way, like put it this way, I've, I've been supporting Nina Turner for years. Uh, I support right. people who, who don't agree with her on, on Medicare right. for all. But my deeper commitment right now is to democracy and then let it, let it play out. And, and what I worry about is that we are letting our divides, um, we are letting our divides over other issues blind us to a deeper tackle democracy that at some point means we'll have worse health care than any of the current current plans that are being debated you're in me- i just, just heads up just to, to be, you're in medicare for all countries so i don't oh, want to I be get rude. It. i understand this is med this is oh, i this understand is, i i, I this, get it i mean I'm, I'm, I'm literally, and, and and i'm in 
I'm in democracy country. And I think that the deeper issue How right now, fight? we cannot we cannot even have a Medicare for all debate if the, if the direction we're going in continues. And, and, and pe people on this call, and I agree that I'm talking to Alicia. Yeah, I, 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 never, I have not had the Medicare for all question come up. I understand it. I'm saying that if we don't all, if, if we don't all unite between Medicare for all and those who have a different view for healthcare that's not quite Medicare for all, we're not going to have a debate. We're not going to literally have a democracy. And, right. and that's I, sort I, of my deeper, that's, that's the deeper view I come to with. And I, I, I understand the, um, we, we I, I like, understand that viewpoint well. I, 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 we have six minutes left. So democracy is, can often seem like an abstraction. Uh, one third of the people who, 100 million Americans could vote, but they don't vote, is part of the reason they don't vote is because there's nothing to vote on. Like what, why go to, I think, don't you think a lot of Americans feel, why should I vote? They're not voting on anything I care about. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, issues so, uh, that are. I, I think the Republicans. But, but, but I, yeah, of course. And, well, and, let me, and I let think me ask that, you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I think the Republicans are good at isolating a couple of issues and fighting to the death for those right. issues. Yeah. Abortion. I never, I never thought they were serious about abortion. Turns out they were. I never, th you can't get an abortion in some states. They keep their promises, the Republicans. They fight for abortion. They fight for uh, no taxes and for the destruction of government right. and for a strong military and right. strong cops. And right. they, and you know where they stand. Mm -hmm. The Democrats are running on the fumes of FDR. They're, 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 they've been branded as we're on the side of labor, we're on the side of the Enlightenment. They, 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 they took one real stand, the Democrats, and that was pro-choice. They can't even say they're pro-abortion, they're pro-choice. Right. And they're losing that. They can't even fight for a woman's right for an abortion. Right. So what do the Democrats have? They, the, the Democrats, what do they offer? So I'm not arguing Medicare for all yeah, no, with you. What do the Democrats have to offer to make people, make the 100 million people who don't vote, vote for them? They, they don't. You know what's I'm a Democrat. No, no. I'm I a Democrat. I, I'm going to purge. What's interesting is if you look at almost any issue that Democrats stand for, including Medicare for all or, you know, broader Obamacare, whatever, whatever, whatever your lane is, all of these are supported by the broad majority of people. You know, common sense gun reform is broadly popular. The reason that they gerrymander is because almost everything Republicans stand for is deeply unpopular. The reason Mitch McConnell is telling Rick Scott to stop talking is because everything they stand for is deeply unpopular. Most of what they're getting through, they're doing through state houses because that's where they can go to get unpopular things done. So one of my big takeaways is that Democrats need to stop hiding as if our most of our viewpoints are unpopular. They're not. People want abortion access, and that's a majority viewpoint. People want common sense gun reform. People want some much more aggressive way to get people covered with health care, whether it's Medicare for all or more robust Obamacare or somewhere between. And we need to stop, you know, we need to stop hiding the fact we're getting bullied into thinking that we somehow represent the minority. No, most every view dealing with climate change is a popular thing. Most people want to see it done. I saw a survey today or the other day banning books is like. 80% unpopular. So one of the things that these gerrymandered non-democratic places do is they're so aggressive, they convince the majority that they're not even the majority on in terms of who believes what. So I, I think that it, one of the one of the main so takeaways. Let me let me let me address that. We're talking with David Pepper. 
He's author of Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake up call from behind the lines. You're a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. Right. I'm not leaving the party. Good. Some people are going to have to leave the party. There has to be yeah. a purge of the Democratic Party. We have to get rid of certain people in the Democratic Party. That's that. And I, I'm not leaving. Uh, the problem, as I see it, isn't a problem of democracy. We have a problem of Democrats who offer zero to the American people. Mm -hmm. So the, if, if you want to save democracy, you have to have a party like the Republicans that pick a couple of issues and fight to the death for those issues. And the problem with our democracy is the Democrats because they offer zero. Well, that's why I don't, I, I, I just don't agree with that. They I mean, offer the problem, nothing. That, what that's the about, that's about politics. That's about but, politics. But, but why, if why you're not vote? impressed by their message, if you're not impressed by their message, and, and I, I don't disagree with you, there's all sorts of things I put in my book about what they can do. But one side is literally attacking the function of democracy itself. They have gerrymandered dozens of state houses so that you cannot win, even if you have a great message. You are guaranteed to lose. Okay. We had a wave in 2018. Democrats in Wisconsin showed up far bigger than Republicans, and still the Republicans controlled the state house. So to say that their message is weak, so they're attacking democracy, it's just, I, I think, I. What do we, the Democrats stand for? You can debate me all day, you know. What do the Democrats what do they stand what Democrats for? Stand for? But, but that is not what do they stand to, for? To, to, hold on, let me finish. Let me finish the point. You just equated that to being against democracy because you don't think their message or their core belief is clear enough. I couldn't, I don't just, I don't agree with that. Um, well, I think the Democrats you think stand 100 for 100 million a people, broader, a broader million middle people. class. Well, let me finish. Let me answer. Okay. They, I think they stand for a broader sort of public good that tries to pull pe a broader group up, a middle class based economy that provides sort of enough enough basics, including healthcare, housing, you name it, so people can can succeed in life and live a good life. The other side does not believe in that. Again, there's a broad spectrum of what that means. They could be better at doing it, of course, but but this is where I'll disagree, and and I get I get grief myself for not being rah rah enough to Democrats. To equate that weakness of, of putting that together, however they think about it, into they're the problem with democracy, I don't think is, is fair. I mean, that's literally would be like saying, you know, Orban's opposition just needs a better message. When, when their side is literally rigging the playing field so you can't win in states like Ohio by making a state house so not one district is a competitive district, that's a deeper attack on democracy than the fact that one day one side has a poor message. Right. So you have you have 100 million people who don't vote. So you have 100 million people who don't believe in democracy. You, you, you haven't been able to explain to me precise. Let me tell you what the Republicans stand for and why they win. I know they rig. I, I'm not discounting what you're saying. They do rig our they don't play fair. Uh, but you gave me a very vague definition of what a Democrat is. I'll tell you what a Republican is. Don't kill my baby. You're talking about their All, message. This is just- well, Hang on, let me finish. Yeah. Don't kill my baby. Don't take away my guns. I want a strong military. I want justice. You do something wrong. You're going to go, I want you killed. I want you locked up. Hang on for one second. And I don't want to pay taxes because I want people to work. And if you don't work, you don't eat. That's the way I was raised. And quite frankly, I want America the way it was. The 50s where white men ruled and women kept their mouths shut and immigrants kept knew their, knew their place. That's they have made it very clear where they stand. And there are people who say, you know what? I like that. The you Democrats mean, David, stand if, if, for zero. If, if that message were good, why would they be gerrymandering? 
Almost everything you Donald just said. Trump, Hold on, let me finish. And then I got Donald to Trump. Donald almost Trump. everything you just said, their gun, their gun positions, they're with about 20% of American voters. Getting rid of Roe v. Wade is about 30% of American voters. White supremacy is not a majority value in a diverse majority. Almost everything you just said they stand for is actually in the minority. The reason they gerrymander and suppress is because they would, if you ran everything you just said in a fair district, they would lose. That's why, you know, I, you're crediting them with this great. Now, I agree. Well, you're being a, to be a lot being better. Because we have Democrats. Wait a second. We have Democrats who get elected, but they're Republicans, like Joe Manchin and Cinema and Tester. They run in the Democratic Party as Republicans. So it's unfair to say that the, re the Republicans are unpopular. You know, uh, yes, they've lost every presidential election except and 2004. they would lose at the state level if they... they if everything, if they were confident that everything you described was a winning message, they wouldn't be breaking law after law in Ohio to gerrymander themselves so not one of them has a competitive race. And, and so I, I, I think we are living like- You can't rig a landslide. You cannot rig a landslide. You get a hunt, you get the 100 million- you, you need to read my book. They have 62 seats in Ohio. 50 of them average 20% or more uh, margin of victory over 10 years, and the next 12 were 10%. They have in, in Wisconsin, the Democrat Wisconsin voters voted for a Democrat by nine percentage points across the state of Wisconsin, 18. That translated into a two thirds majority in their state house so they can talk like you just talked and pass the craziest laws and never lose. The point is, everything you just described in a fair election is a losing message. And what, what do Democrats need to do? And this goes back to the message of we don't have a lot of time to get through all this, but um, I would love you to come back. Part, for the most part, for the most part, back? what's that? I would love you to come back. Okay. I would love but to. For the most part, let's be clear. And, and this goes to some of the questions in the chat. They have basically taken the public assets of our country and privatized them all. OK, they have taken public school dollars and public energy dollars and small towns, and they've taken all the resources and thrown it to their private donors. And that has led to disastrous public outcomes in states like Ohio, and people freezing to death in Texas, and four days of school a week in Kansas. And that's the goddamn message that our side needs to be fighting on. If you care about public outcomes, like public education and broader healthcare access, and people not freezing to death in Texas, and the fact that you only have four days of school a week in Kansas, then Democrats are going to broaden the public outcomes and lift you. And that's the kind of mess that the reason we won the Democratic race for governor in Kansas is because we talked about those public outcomes. And Beto O'Rourke right now is, is actually running a good race because he's talking about why the hell do people freeze to death in Texas? And so what we're seeing is a massive movement of public resources of the private. And in there, I believe, is the broader message that Democrats can, can grab onto to fight back. It, by the way, and what I love about that messaging is it doesn't balkanize voters. People in a small town with only four days of school a week are as pissed off as people in a big city. People in a small town that's dying are as concerned about a big city that's, that's having trouble. So I, I honestly think that that's where the message is. And in, in, in the big picture direction of their side is a, is a massive privatization of public assets. And that's why I go through in the book. The, there is a downward spiral. Ohio right now, whether you know, we are in the low 40s on every way you can measure healthcare, including number one repeatedly in opioid addiction. We are the number one state in the country in public debt of our students. Oh, our school system was ranked- But Biden with the stroke of a pen. What's Biden that? could have ranked- with a stroke um, of a pen. Yeah, he could. It, it, we were fifth in the country. We were fifth in the country in public education in 15 years ago in Ohio. We're now in the mid 20s. And so my, my point for Democrats is that's where your message is. And again, you're with the people when you talk about that stuff. Uh, so, so I, you know, I think that, that there is there's a lot of message in there. And what I would say to any candidate is, uh, what I'd say to any candidate is, get to your state and in your state 
figure out what are the public outcomes that are cratering because of these, these corrupt and rigged state houses. And in those states, if you run smart on what's cratering that everyone cares about and is sitting around their dining room table talking about and how you're going to fix it, that's your winning message. And in, in Michigan, you may not have loved it, but it was fix the damn roads. In Kansas, it was let's get back to five days of school a week. In, in, in um, Texas, it may be why did the energy grid freeze because they privatized it. That, to me, is how you start winning, winning it back. Okay, we've been talking with David Pepper, author of Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines. Will you come back? Because this was a spirited... Yeah, I will. I'm happy to. Thank and, you. And by the way, I do. let me just keep my book out there, because I, I it, Laboratories of Autocracy, David, uh, uh, send me your address. I'll send it to you, because you'll see, okay. you know, I, I know you didn't love my Medicare for All right. answer, and it was a little bit vague, but I'm about trying to see the bigger picture and not getting into the right. debates about issues that that are frankly getting us away from the the worst thing that's happening we're not even gonna have a medicare for all debate folks if we don't fix the problems i'm talking about and right. everyone I, I, who cares I, about health care we I, I would love to uh, have them all agree to disagree for a little bit so we can save our democracy and then let's have right. Abbott on the other stuff but we need a democratic right. system in the first place to actually have these debates right just so you know and, and i would love you to come back this is leftist country we are That's fine. We are, this is Bernie country. So good. I, I have been on more indivisible calls, our revolution calls. I right. don't I'll, democracy. If we don't have this group, though, unite with others, give about democracy. We're going to lose it all. And you're not going to get your view done. And nor will anyone else except the right. far right wing. I, I would and, love and to have I've been a, someone I, my whole career. That. Just to be clear, I was chair of the ODP, never endorsed, had Hillary and Bernie. Bernie was organizing in the Ohio Democratic Party. And, and one of my better friends in politics is Nina Turner. Uh, so right. I, 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 try, I work with basically a whole lot of people. But if this right. we have seen in our country's past, if we let our divides, if, the, if all those who care about democracy, let our divides over individual issues have us keep fighting, the other side's going to take it off. And, and we have to figure out a way to solve that. And I go through that in my book. They love that right. we're fighting on this side. They love it. Right. Right. Let's continue this because I disagree with you on some things, but uh, let's continue this. Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake up call from behind the lines. David Pepper, thank you. Please come back. Thank you. Take care. I, I love a, a spirited discussion. Thank you. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Let us now go. Sorry to keep you waiting, Dr. Harriet Fraud. Dr. Harriet Fraud is the host of It's Not Just In Your Head. And uh, you're, 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 it's not just in your head, but we can't see your head. There you a little tilted, a little lower. There you go. Uh, hi. It's not just, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, uh, I didn't see it was a passionate discussion. Yeah, I, and I and I was. Uh, it's unfair to bring a guest on and who's selling a book, uh, and for me to uh, bring up. But when uh, here's my thing about the Democrats: the Republican Party is uh, cancer. They're a curable cancer. Mm -hmm. And I hate cancer, but I don't dignify cancer. I dignify the surgeon who's supposed to go in there and cure the cancer. And I look at the Democrats as the surgeon who is uh, out playing golf. And uh, I'll, I'll get to the operating table and get that cancer taken care of. Uh, eh, actually, it's not that the cancer is not that bad. Uh, I think I'll take a vacation. That's who the Democrats are. That's who the Democratic Party is. They are indefensible. And I'm not giving up the Democratic Party. I'm kicking people out. There has to be a Stalinist purge of the party. And you have to start kicking. If you can't, if I, if you have to think about Medicare for all, it's you get out of my party. Yeah, if that's we would also if, have to. I, I, I'm not compromising on Medicare. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We would also, the Democratic Party 
wouldn't have to be so wedded to the same capitalist donors that give to the Republicans that they don't want to do anything to cause a problem. And they just go along with civility while they're being hit by a hatchet. You know, there is a whole idea that it isn't, doesn't matter as much. We have to please the donors in the pay to play system. So the progressive Democrats are willing to shake things up. The others are not worth supporting. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. Most importantly, uh, is there any evidence for the theory of mental illness based on biochemical imbalances and brain disease that is the basis for all psychological meds? I think this country is so mentally ill and uh, there's a pill for everything and now there's a pill for mental illness. What happened to the talking cure? Uh, self-reflection. Now it's just a pill, right? Yeah. Well, what has happened? First of all, it's important to establish that no one, even the psych med cheerleaders, can come up with any proof that human misery is a result of brain injury or biochemical imbalances. Every state that human beings are in, because we are not we are not separated from our minds and our bodies, is a biochemical, has a biochemical component. That's unavoidable. I'm a little confused. Let's define the terms here. So what is a, a, a biochemical, what, what, what are psych meds? What, what are you talking psych about with meds psych meds? Are medications given to patients on the basis <clears throat> that they have a biochemical imbalance in their brain due to a brain disease. There is zero proof, even in the greatest proponents of psych meds, that there are any provable brain diseases. What there is, is a combination of four corporate entities that rule, and they rule around the Diagnostic Statistical Manual a manual that plugs misery of human beings into pigeonholes called diseases. The first conference way back when was already 56% sponsored by and participated in by sponsors from the drug companies. Now it's a larger percentage because part of what the diagnostic statistical manual is designed to do is make everything that is human sadness into a diagnosable disorder that can be medicated and that can be medicated by psychopharma, the most profitable of all in the pharmaceutical industries. And it's a cooperative arrangement based on a cooperative using of the diagnostic, <coughs> excuse me, statistical manual. It's a cooperation of the doctors, the psychiatrists who are now psychopharmacologists who used to see people for an hour, but then once insurance took over and they get about a quarter of what they used to get, they see four people an hour and spend 15 minutes checking on your meds or prescribing your meds. So the first thing are the doctors overwhelming psychiatrists. The second thing is psychopharma, which then provides the pills at wild profit. The third thing is the insurance companies which much prefer prescribing medications than they do paying for hours of therapy. It's much more cut and dried, and that plugs into the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. The fourth are the hospitalized, the hospitals that put people in mental hospitals where they give them even more drugs until their insurance runs out and then cured or not, they're out, okay? So you have a corporate four horsemen of a mental, mental apocalypse, and one in four Americans is on psych, dreads, psych drugs, and it is hell to get off of those psych drugs. It can take- And what are those? What? what are the drugs? 
What, 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 like, what, give well, me examples. The antidepressants are the biggest example are the antidepressants like Paxil, Prozac, Serotin. Um, there's endless ones. There's a guy right. named Peter Bregan who's written all about this, who listed there are endless ones. They're so very profitable. The others are antipsychotics, which are even more dangerous and less, and they have no proof at all also. Another one is anti-anxieties, like Zoloft is the most famous one. And these are prescribed because people fit human misery into these pigeonholes and prescribe a drug. It's a hoax. It's a multi-billion dollar hoax. And the way they market this hoax to get it to succeed is not only direct to consumer advertising, and we are the only nation in the world that allows direct to consumer advertising, except for New Zealand, which allows it only with certain provisos. We're the only ones that allow it uh, across the board. The, the ad, I'm sorry? That's obvious, the direct consumer um, advertising and advertising in medical journals. What's much more influential is to buy very influential psychiatrists and doctors like Dr. Biederman, head of the Child Psychiatry Association of the United States and professor at Harvard, who suggested that they use Zyprexa, a Johnson & Johnson drug, for children with anxiety and upset. It made the children obese, it gave them diabetes, it didn't get over any of their problems, they made billions, okay? Also, psychiatrists don't, when they write articles, including laudatory descriptions of drugs, don't have to sign their names and also divulge which uh, companies they're on the take from. At the end of the article, it doesn't say Dr. So-and-so, GlaxoSmithKline, Merck Laboratories, et cetera. So you just see them as experts that influence their fellow and sister doctors. Another marketing genius is to pay psychiatrists, the minimum is 30 grand a year, to occasionally have little gatherings at their offices where the company rep provides the wine and cheese and the doctor in question lauds the drug. If he says anything negative, or she does, or they do, then they get quite a scolding from the drug rep, and if it continues, they're kicked right off the gravy train. These payments go from minimum 30 grand to millions. Okay, I, thought they, I, thought that, I thought that was no longer allowed, but uh, I think that was... So uh, you're saying that there is a miseration among our families and their kids and instead of addressing the causes of a child's unhappiness, or parents, or anyone's parents, we just give them a drug and hope that that fixes it. And that's right. That's it. And it does often make, although it doesn't solve the problem, it does make blunt the emotions around it. It blunts people. They are, in psych speak, comfortably numb. And so, it's a little like Soma in Brave New World that you drug the population so they don't rise up. There's someone called Noreen Hertz who wrote a book about how as a society abandons its people, people get psychologically and mentally ill. And right. if you look at it, you can really see that because the poorest Bronx with the well, you're, greatest... You're, break, oh, you're, you're crime, breaking up. I, hang on, you you broke up. I'm hanging on your every word, and you broke up. When a society, you said, you, well, you said society abandons its people. They become mentally ill. They feel right. abandoned and horribly lonely, and they they become desperate. And when the basic organizations that used to hold people up, whether it was the family or the job and the union people fall apart. And you can see that clearly in New York City, the poorest borough where the people get the least support. 
and are the most ill from COVID is the Bronx where there are the most shootings and all other serious crimes because people go mad from privation. And that's right. what happened in this country. And these are profiteers lying to people and profiting and leaving them with terrible problems. Because once you get hooked on these drugs, first of all, they usurp the brain's ability to soothe itself. Second, they're not a social solution and humans are social. We need connection for mental health. Right. When you're born, if a baby isn't held and cooed to and caressed, they have what's called failure to thrive. They can't sit up, they can't develop, they die. We are so intricately social. And when people are socially abandoned, they fall apart when they are disconnected. And that's what's happening here. And the profiteering psychopharma establishment is exploiting that. And people right. aren't being helped. It's terrible. And they are being drugged. And to get off of these drugs can cause terrible pain. So this yeah. is a terrible thing. And one in four Americans is drugged. And one in 20 of our children is too, by Ritalin. And Ritalin was exposed fairly soon after it was introduced as a plot by the drug makers of Ritalin and a few psychiatrists to create a diagnosis of hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, in order to hustle Ritalin. And it is prescribed it is forced on many school children because they have such boring, sedentary classes that kids get hyper, of course, because they need to move. And right. so this is, this is a hoax perpetrated on us. And right. people who are taking psych drugs in the beginning often feel they really are helped because it's a placebo effect especially if there's a side effect, you think, oh, this is really doing something because I'm sick, right? Right. But all it does is blunt you. Even in the cases of schizophrenia, people can figure it out. They, they take drugs that destroy them. This is a terrible thing. Right. This country, I, I, I love what you said about how when a society abandons its own people they the mental illness intensifies i feel i don't feel i know we've abandoned our people we have we are not loved we are consumed we're, we're treated for. as consumers we are not loved no we're not cared no, for at all. all no and uh we're mistrustful of everybody because everybody's trying to get something over on us and that, all we hear is ads who are lying all the time and most americans believe those ads unfortunately they they you look at your phone and we have no critical thinking they they've stripped us of that they've got us just looking into our phone being fed lie after lie and an alternative universe i mean facebook is already talking about meta the meta universe culture we're there already we're already in an alternative alternative universe. great example is ukraine it is true that the russians are horrible they're also there's a general from the ukraine that said that they move bodies from all over to that busha to for a photo op before the u.n meetings but they're still you know brutal however we circled russia with hostile bases which we wouldn't even tolerate in cuba 90 miles away when there were no others we circled them with hostile bases of nato which is an arm of american imperialism and the Ukraine has 1,500 miles of border with Russia and their basic pipelines go through there and they wouldn't stand for it and they gave many warnings. But the United States is worried that the alliance that was emerging between Russia and China, China the most populous and best economy in growth and Russia with its military might 
would be a real contestant to US imperialism in the world. So they decided to knock out, to push this Ukraine thing, knowing it would push the Russians into a long unwinnable war, very long because we keep arming the Ukrainians. And then they would be weakened as we were in Vietnam, which we lost Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, right? And right. so that we could bleed them. And the propaganda blitz that we get is frightening. Not that, you know, war is always terrible. And it is also true that the first casualty in any war is the truth. But the blitz we are getting is frightening. And I think that this society, we are not protected. We're not protected from the drug predators. We're not protected from our medical. We're protected by weapons. our our weapons. We're, we're so right. they, they get they, they get us so scared because we're not protected that we want guns and Boeing and Raytheon to protect us. That's how we. Even though they failed, and we've we've lost every war since World War II except for Korea, which was a draw. And right. since we have lost them, the we're not looking so good. And so we have to knock out the opposition. And that's what this Ukraine is about because look, we're always at war. We never saw the victims of Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam. We never saw- Or, health, or America's healthcare. We don't see the victims of America's healthcare system. Can you- No, we don't. Hang on for one second, please. I just want to, we're running 10 minutes behind. So I just, uh, we have guests waiting. So I just wanted to tell Pascal and Jason that we're, we're running 10 minutes behind. So if that's okay, well, let's talk about- Maybe join this discussion because he, I know he has a lot to say about it. And well, let's talk about Marine Le Pen. Yes. Is Marine, let's talk about France and its lurch to the right with Marine Le Pen. Is she going to do what her father couldn't? Who is Marine Le Pen? Marine Le Pen is a fascist who was smart enough to see that her father's overt discrimination against the mass of people, as well as his hatred for anyone who wasn't white and born in France, was a bit over the top and he was losing votes. And so she came on with Nazism, you know, with fascism light, and also was smart enough to advocate some issues very important to France's working people. Macron was supposed to appeal to both left and right, but only, uh, but abandoned the left. You could see that with the yellow vests. And Macron supported cutting the retirement age, I mean, expanding the retirement age from 60 to 65 in France. Whereas Le Pen was smart enough to oppose that and to also advocate for working people to stop the, some of the taxes on gas so that people could manage in rural areas. She's much cleverer than her father, but she hates immigrants. And that, that element is still there. And we ought to remember because our press is so biased, she got 23. 0.1% of the vote. Macron, who is the left candidate, not the CP, the CP had to run their own candidate, otherwise they would have had as many as Le Pen, but whatever, they got one point something. But uh, Mac Mélenchon got 22% of the vote and he is an out leftist. And that is not mentioned here. The French people are very upset with the middle right, which is what Macron is, and they're voting against that. And what's interesting now is Mélenchon, who got 22% to um, Le Pen's 23.1%, told his people by no means vote for Le Pen, but he didn't say vote for Macron. So either he's waiting till Macron offers him some big concessions to say that, or he will assert his power as a leftist by having Marine Le Pen win. But things are not what they seem in the, in the American press. If you read 
in some of the French press, it's really quite different. The difference between 22% and 23.1% isn't all that vast. And the Communist Party got 1%. So it would have been 3% if it was communists and uh, Mélenchon versus 23.1%. As it is, it's 22, 23.1. 1.1 point difference. So that ought to be noted because they do have a left. And yeah. so it's a I remember Hollande. I remember they elected Hollande uh, to Yeah, election. although he clearly sold out. And because of yeah. that, the socialists got 1% because that party was really discredited because he really sold out. And it used to be a mass party. But I think we'll see what happens in France. But I, I think as an American, what we should notice all this hoopla about Marine Le Pen, Marine Le Pen, 1.1 point difference. Right. Very quickly, your thoughts on our new mayors clearing out the homeless encampments. I think that's savage. He doesn't have clean, safe housing for them. What is he doing? Well, you know, I, you're, you're breaking up. Uh, I apologize. Can't out of the hundreds, out of the hundreds of people who's in camp, right? Only five people decided to to shelters. Do you know why you can't take a person holding on to their few belongings in a bag and throw them in the garbage and throw them out of their home and then want you to go with your solution? So that's a disgust. Absolutely. You're, you're, you're but he's a Democrat. And it's a failure. But he's a Democrat. So he's on so our what? side. So what? So Manchin. No, he isn't any more than Manchin and Sinema are, or any more than really Biden is either. Yeah. He is a strutting, swaggering egotist who is doing the same old stuff. Help you're, you're breaking up. I, I, Again, I'm sorry. This is yeah. my internet connection. Well, we're, anyway, we're, Pascal yeah. is a wonderful speaker, and I've and he and Jason should go on because they're great. Great, Dr. Harriet Fraud. Thank you. We love you here. Uh, can we? Uh, we we hope uh, your internet gets I'll better. Be with my internet, and I will do something about it. We'll see you Mon uh, next Thank Monday. You. Oh, next host Monday. of uh, Capitalism <laughs> Hits Home, and it's not just in your good. Thank you. You'll Stephane. hear me too. I hope. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. We're, we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to get some water. And when we come back, we will be joined by Pascal Robert and Jason Miles from the This Is Revolution podcast. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. We will be right back. What am I doing here? Here we go. I'm traveling light, got everything I need. Got a little bottle of wool light and a little bag of weed. Got to saw bellow novel, cause I really like to read. I'm traveling light. I'm a creature of the road, got no regrets. Gave up my postal code and cigarettes. I'm doing much better with a touch of Tourette's. I'm traveling light. Just need a clean room in a Motel 6. Not too close to downtown, but not out in the sticks. I need my pen and teller, magic kit, so I can do my tricks. Got my favorite pillow, which I call Mr. Fluffy. Four kinds of allergy pills in case I get stuffy. A pound of Epsom salts, cause my ankles get puffy. I'm traveling light. 
two pairs of socks and shorts in my little valise, a couple of passports, and my sex doll Denise. I'm staying real quiet so they don't call the police. I'm traveling light. sedatives and my antipsychotics a high speed parallax motor cause I'm into robotics and my little red speedo I like to do aquatics I'm traveling late got my CPAP machine and my George Foreman grill a copy of Lolita and my little blue pills a Navajo blanket in case I get a chill I'm traveling late got my margarita mix and my rusty old blender a 50 tequila in case I go on a bender my attorney's number in case I want to change my gender I'm traveling late In case I have some visitors For breeze if my room is stinky A Polaroid in case I get kinky My Jesus bobblehead And my Star Wars bedspread I'm traveling light I got my rabbi costume And my portable dark room My hair plug lotion And my expensive wrinkle cream My Emmy statue For my self-esteem I'm traveling light my podcast mixer and a fancy microphone, my exercise bike so I have a place to hang my pants, my very valuable Hummel collection, a menorah made of fish heads, a Christmas tree, I like to keep my options open, don't you know, a shoe shine kit, a skill saw, a crossword book, a large supply of mechanical pencils, a year's worth of New York magazines I've been trying to get around to read, some scripts that I've been tweaking for those people in L.A., and my own Thank you, Professor Mike Steinel. He'll be with us later on tonight. He's been away for a while. And welcoming back to our show are Pascal Robert and Jason Miles. They are the hosts of This Is Revolution. Welcome, the two of you. Thank you for coming back. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're having, I, I don't know if it's me or you or the internet, uh, the government not liking what we're talking about. That could, that could be it. Uh, I'm against charity. I do not believe in charity. I believe in government. I believe, I just dealt with the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, which is a nonprofit, the head of the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey. It's a nursing home. Head of the actor's home in Anglewood, New Jersey, earns, according to the latest, uh, the most recent IRS filing, $800,000 a year. That's a nonprofit, a 501c3. Seems to me nobody in the government, including Anthony Fauci, makes $800,000 a year. Seems to me the government should be providing uh, health care and uh, nursing homes, and it should be free. It shouldn't be provided here in New York by is- Israeli hucksters uh, who are killing old people. Uh, there's, there's a problem with Israelis running a lot of nursing homes here in uh in New York City. And uh, so uh, talk to me about charity and what you call philanthropic capitalism, please. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can, sir. Oh, thank thank you for for having us again. I really appreciate it. I want you on all the time. I wanted to actually split you two up and have one of you come on Mondays, one of you come on Thursday, and the dog. Uh, is it your dog? Oh, yeah, there's there's yeah there's these crazy dogs that live behind me. Sorry. Um, dogs are not crazy. They're oh, the, these ones the owner, are the owners. There are no t- like with children. There are no such thing as terrible. Oh, 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 they're mad. They're mad. They're mad at something. I think a rabbit ran by. But um, we did a a new video essay that's dropping on Wednesday, and I let you and uh, and Hannah see the advanced copy um, of the of the newest essay, which is on philanthropic capitalism, which is basically a new way to say greed is good. Um, I'm 44. I grew up in the 80s and I've watched Wall Street too many times to count. And I, as soon as I got the idea to do this whole philanthropic capitalism thing, I I didn't want to show the Gordon Gecko speech because I think um, when you think of that era and when you think of that character, you think of a different kind of person. You think of a greedy Wall Street tycoon. You don't think of these nerd billionaires um, that uh, that gained so much wealth in the in the eighties and nineties. And in doing the research for for the paper, there was so many. I'm going to go inside. Right here. <laughs> while you're ta- while Jason is silencing. The dogs. Uh, there's there's a, oh, a dude not. outside that's this antagonizing the dogs. Um, as I was doing research for the uh, for the essay, there were so many different ways to go because people like Bill Gates have their hands in, in so many different uh, facets of public life, from uh, vaccines globally, and and using vaccines as a way to say well i have the answer for uh, like infant mortality in the global south even though the answer is probably clean drinking water don't worry about Mm -hmm. that we'll just manufacture vaccines um education streamlining like you know we're we're falling behind in global education i have the answer um but in actuality the answer is in in his mind was just to standardize education so you can have a monopoly on uh, software for education and, and actually digitize the way we look at education. Um, and that's just a few things. And then I think maybe the most um, the heinous thing that was done was in India with the removal of the $500,000 rupee notes that literally caused people to commit suicide when they thought money was worthless. And all these things go on under the guise of doing good to do good. And I know better. Mm -hmm. And everything I named was undemocratic. No one voted on these things. No one had a say so in these things. And we kind of put these people on a bit of a pedestal. Maybe not everyone watching this show, but we have to remember that we are a very small minority you know, of the population. So most people look at these captains of industry as intelligent and they know better. And one thing I did try to say in the video essay is that we're coming to a point where collectively we know politicians lie and we know corporations lie. But there's something about these people doing good to do good, right? Because when we think of the Gates Foundation, we think that this man is putting his own money. How many times do you see the staggering numbers? The the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has an endowment of like $44 billion. It's a lot of money. Where does they can't get away. It just keeps growing. It it keeps growing. And and because people don't think about Microsoft, they think, well, well, you know, who the hell uses Internet Explorer anymore? It's like, no, this. This guy is is ingrained in so many different facets of society. And again, very undemocratic, these maneuvers that they do. I mean, I'm sure there's parents on here that had to deal with the ordeal that was Common Core, and even teachers were pushing back on it. 
They were silenced. When you have that much money, you literally can control the research that's done. And then you control how people read the studies. So right. that to me is frightening. At the, you know, everyone talks about it, you know, billionaires, millionaires, there's too many of them tax them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think, I think we get that to a certain degree, but we don't understand what these people then do and how they use things like hustle culture and eco-capitalism with people like um, the CEO of, uh, of Whole Foods. Like, I have a nicer way to do things. We're going to be sustainable. We're never going to have a company in here that doesn't have a, a large uh, uh, footprint, ecological footprint. But you're not really slowing down consumption. You're still playing to uh, capitalist consumption. You're not making the world a better place. You're creating this function of I can buy something green. Um, and now I'm doing something to make the world a better place. I own a Prius. I, I only shop at Whole Foods. Um, Oprah has helped me <laughs> see my inner self. So now I, I, I don't have to uh, question the, the labor relations between myself and my workplace because it's all inside. You know, Sheryl Sandberg does a lot of the same things with with the idea of lean in feminism. And when we think about these, these characters, they have a massive platform and there's not much pushback. I mean, I challenge people to find negative press about Bill Gates. It's not easy. Well, since the divorce, we found out that he was a lot with you and Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> there were, he was a sexual I, I predator didn't even find any of that Microsoft. I, I didn't really even find much of that stuff. I, I did find, and I, I didn't put it in the, in the essay because it would have been too long, all of his uh, deposition in 1998 is, is on the internet and various ways to find it it's like 12 parts and it's all kind of scattered but uh you know even going through his deposition um he is he is the definition of the, of the term hubris so and i, I know pascal has uh, has also uh, another take on on philanthro capitalism and and its roots oh well first of all i'll say thank you very much for having us both on david uh and um I love having you on. Thank you for doing this. Not a problem. Is that um, I really appreciated what Jason did with this uh, video essay, but I'll be very, very candid. It was very triggering for me. And I will tell you why. I know that's a very young... You're from Haiti. Thing. You're no, from Haiti. From Haiti. No, no, no. We don't have to go there. Within the context of American politics. Because Jason didn't know this. But before Jason and I started working together, I had been doing extensive amount of reading in the history of not only black politics, but black institutional development, organizational development, civil rights organizational de development, educational development. And what I had found out is that the American philanthropic institutions or the foundation world has been socially engineering black America literally since emancipation. The historically black colleges and universities were created by finance capital in opposition to the aspirations of the freedmen who were former slaves, who wanted an empowering education system, but they were given these black colleges with a subpar educational system that was designed to keep them subservient and promote the kind of degradating sharecropper economy that they had been living under under slavery. There are two very good books if you're interested for your audience, they should read. One is called The Education of Blacks in the South by a man named James Anderson. And the other one is called The White Architects of Black Education by a man named William Watkins that detail explicitly how these institutions were created by the largest of the philanthropic world and the foundational world to literally demobilize the educational and the political and social aspiration of Black Americans in this country, particularly after emancipation. So I'm talking about 
uh, excuse me for one second. This is revelatory to me. Historically black universities, our vice president is a graduate of one. Well, mm -hmm. let me just clear. I'm not trying to disparage these schools because by the grace of the fight that the black students and black parents had to fight against the philanthropies and against the administrators who were pawns of these philanthropies, they tried to salvage a decent education for their kids. And it literally caused them to have to fight these institutions to make these schools something that was worthy of their children attending. And so when did they become, uh, when did they stop becoming a, a an experiment in social conditioning and and uh, a we source of it. The, well, these schools were founded. We were founded in the 1860s. The major changes to make them more educationally edifying institutions didn't start till the 1920s and 30s. Interesting. The rise Very of the Communist Party was a counter hegemon to uh, to what was going on with the uh, philanthropic world in, in Black America. J David, I would like if can you if you will indulge me. Jason Whatever you so uh, triggered me with this. I had bought a book about one of my favorite uh, African-American sociologists. His name is E. Franklin Frazier. He wrote a book that if you haven't read, I suggest your audience read. It's called Black Bourgeoisie. And the book is an expose on the Black elite in America. It's an old book from 1957, but it's probably still classic, most eloquent treatment on how class within Black America, and we always talk about how the problem America has is that they perceive of all Black America as some kind of urban poor underclass, which has never been the case, is that the, the book exposes by E. Franklin Frazier called Black Bourgeoisie, how there has always been a buffer class of intermediaries within the Black community who, who posture themselves as elites, who basically are racial ventriloquists that work at the behest of the ruling class. Now, for many of your audience, this might sound like a revelation. It's not a revelation to me. It's definitely not a revelation to Jason because we've seen and we know how these institutional mechanisms have worked within the black community going back over a century. And how, how does it work? How do they absorb there's a they have there's, institutional mechanisms also tied to foundation largesse that create a class of university pedigree African Americans who, by the fact that they can act as a racial uplift mechanism, in other words, let me give you a simple metaphor when a white Anglo Saxon goes to Yale and becomes a member of Skull and Bones or goes to Harvard and becomes a member of Porcelain, he doesn't create a charade with the white kid who's in Appalachia, who was a coal miner, that he's uplifting him as, as a model of what he should aspire to, and he's going to take him together up into the promised land of liberty. The right. white kid in Appalachia realizes that that, that that white boy is his enemy, and the white, the white boy in actual Appalachia, and white boy from Skull and Bones, would rather see the kid in Appalachia dead. We would agree. Yeah, I, I, the, yes, community, the Negroes who have that posture will say, we are uplifting the race. Our fate is tied to your fate. Yet they have the same class antagonism as the white chap from Skull and Bones or the white chap from Porcelain at Harvard. Right. So right. you see how this creates an internal conundrum that most of white America and most of black America would be obscured to because the, the canard of racial kinship obscures the class contradictions that exist among black people. Right. And it creates the illusion that there is no systemic racism that keeps African Americans down and that all they have to do is work hard and not steal the pound cake and pull up their pants and <laughs> well, I, if you want, I want to read a small paragraph from E. Franklin Frazier's biography. And when you realize this, you understand how these institutions come about. So if you could give me a couple, this very briefly. Yeah. The, the recruit. Uh, I have to take off, David. 
I have to take because I have to do a. We have a sports show that goes on right now. It's just me. Pascal doesn't have to stay. I mean, he doesn't have to go. So Pascal's going to stay. Okay, Jason Miles. We'll see you. We'll see you next week. I hope. Yes. So Great. Wednesday, six p.m. Pacific Standard Time. The video essay premieres. Personal Jesus: The Seduction of Philanthro Capitalism. Thank you, Jason Miles. All right, Pascal. Jason. Yes. Please continue. I will continue. So this is from the book E. Frank and Frazier Reconsidered by Anthony M. Platt. This is a biography of the famed African-American sociologist E. Franklin Frazier. The recruitment of prospective Afro-American intellectuals into higher education was achieved, but not motivated by corporate philanthropy. Far-sighted foundations such as the Rockefeller Foundation, the Rosenwald Fund, and the Russell Sage Foundation began to provide scholarships for Black graduate students to finance research on African-American communities. This is a quote. It seems that ever since the Negro has been free, noted E. Franklin Frazier in his typically sardonic manner, some foundation has watched over his destiny. destiny. Right after his emancipation, the Peabody Fund was giving him wrong advice. Then later, on, then later on, the Rosenwald Fund corrupted his leaders. Let me go further. Concerned by the volatility of race relations and the increasing militancy of the new Negro, some business and political leaders looked to higher education as a way of training future leaders who would steer an alternative course to the Afro-American socialism of The Messenger, which was a publication, and the Pan-Africanism of Du Bois and the Garvey movement. As one sociologist warned, there is a large and steadily increasing group of men more or less related to the Negro by blood and wholly identified with them by American social usage who refuse to accept quietly the white man's attitude towards race. What basically Frazier is saying here is that white philanthropy was financing higher education for black elites to neutralize them and make them pacify. Are they that, were they that calculating, that smart? They're yes. able to, wow. It's, it's social control, it's mind control, it's, you th the illusion of choice, you think you have choice, but you're being herded uh, the way they want you to. Exactly. And this, yeah. these people became the class that became the founders of the civil rights movement, the, the NAACP, the Urban League, the, the, all the Congressional Black Caucus. The, 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 the conundrum of Black politics and the Black political class is a product of this social engineering that was intentionally done to create a buffer class of university. Listen, I'm a university pedigree. Man. I went to college. I went to law school. I went to Boston University School of Law. I have uh, you know, all of that pedigree. But because of a historical family attachment to radical politics and personal choices I made in affiliating myself with people like Bruce Dixon and Glenn Ford of Black Agenda Report, who are former radicals, who didn't come from educational pedigree, I had developed a politics that intentionally became counter hegemonic to my own class educational background. So I became a class trader, if you will. Right, right. Okay. And the idea is that if it works for you, it should work for everybody else. Well, they, no, they don't want it to work for everyone else. If it works for me, you should keep trusting me to be your leader to uplift you. And I get, I want to, I'm going to be very, very blunt, rather crass, and very direct with you, David. You don't mind. Sure. There are no black professionals. There are black no, there are black no black engineers. There is no Kamala Harris. There is no uh, no uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. There are no black businesses. There are no black capitalists. There are no black upper middle class without the ability to leverage the misery and suffering of poor and working class Black people, because that is the linchpin to getting the ruling class to make the con policy concessions necessary to make a Black middle class. Right. Is it just Muhammad Ali who was able to do it completely his way because well, it was Muhammad Ali was a boxer I mean it was a you know I know I mean can you so 
All right. Yeah. There are, are there any examples of African Americans who break through on their own terms without? No, I mean, listen, I'm not. Listen, I'm not saying these people don't earn. Listen, they all they obviously they went to school. They did all the things that they did. But what I'm saying is that the ruling. The, I'm not saying these people don't deserve what they have achieved on the merits of their work. What I'm saying is that capitalism in America is racialized, and the reason why all African Americans aren't an underclass like most people think is because America needs a class of Blacks to engage in social control of the majority of Black America. To what end? To, the to end control? Of, yes. Maintain to control. the requirement that you have to have what? Surplus redundant labor that is racialized. You know, i.e., when white America is 60% of the population, do you think they didn't want to know that they make up 45 to 50 or 60% of the welfare recipients? Of course not. Only black people get welfare. Did you know that? Right. Because repeat if they that did know that, they would rebel. Right. Let's, let's repeat that again about the, the welfare, who the real welfare queens are. No, I said that if white people realize that they actually make up 50 or 60% of the welfare recipients, and they didn't, they didn't think that all black people are on welfare and it's just them, like everyone believes, right. then what would happen? They would rebel. They would wonder why is it that the American ruling class is so terrified of white working class gun culture? It's a very simple reason, because they realize these people have the numbers to revolt. Right. Right. So you have to give them a distraction and somebody else to blame yes. for their immigration. Capitalism in America needs an N-word so white working class folk don't have to believe they can ever be one. Well, not to traffic in conspiracy theories, but when you look at Ukraine, uh, the Biden administration, they shot their load last year with Build Back Better. They couldn't, they couldn't pass Bernie's build back better. They couldn't help the, the working class. They probably never intended to work to help the working class. And now it's Putin. It's, it's almost beyond, it's shameless in how transparent it is. Of course. Biden's poll numbers magically skyrocket and go up. He's the great right. world foreign policy leader, right. blah, blah, blah. So how should we react to the, 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 the imagery of dead children, dead women in uh, Ukraine? I mean, I don't watch the news. Neither I read it. I just read about it. What I, we have people on this show who are equating Putin to Hitler and that we have to do something. And I do not I, support I do not support the Ukrainian invasion for a variety of reasons, simply because number one, I think it was a very bad timing. But I understand what were the pro provocative steps by the West and NATO expansion that brought Putin to that precipice that I don't think he should have indulged in. But the problem we have with the propaganda we're in right now is that you can't even have a balanced conversation to explain what brought Putin to the point of doing something that even most people who are the most radical parts of the left would say he shouldn't have done it. And I don't think any of those folks, many of who are my comrades, are trying to say, yeah, Putin, go ahead, take out those Ukrainians. What they're trying to say is like, listen, there is a context to how we got here, and much of it has to do with the fact that the Russians have been feeling like their geostrategic location has been encroached upon by NATO expansion. Now, right. that doesn't sound controversial to you and I, but because we live in a media establishment of binary good guy, bad guy, we need Hitler, we need uh, Tojo, we need Mussolini, to motivate the deaf, dumb, and blind to buy into this charade, mm -hmm. you won't get an effective 
discourse in the media thoroughfares about what's right. going on because it's not profitable empire. And we are in an empire. I know you know that, but most Americans don't. When you were at law school, do they teach conflict resolution, how to tamp down conflict or it's how to- class. I didn't take it in law school, but they do have classes on conflict resolution. But then there's no money for lawyers if you don't escalate the conflict. You can make that argument. Yeah. Pascal Robert, happy Ramadan. Are you, yeah. How was your fast? It's going well. I broke it just before we uh, had the show today. So you start your fast at what time? So sun, sunrise, about 6 a.m. Let me just ask you a question. Not that I'm proselytizing. With the Jews, 24 hours, once a year, you don't eat. And it never happens again until next year. Ramadan, you have to fast every day for a month? 30 days. Not, but it's, it's, it's only between sunrise and sunset. So after, before sunrise, you have a small, like some fruit, some water, some juice. After sunset, then you can have a meal. You can eat and drink regularly. Right. But if you're Jewish, you just do it once a year I'm for 24 saying, hours straight. I, I'm not trying. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not selling you to saying different. I, I, I understand. <laughs> All right. Pascal Robert is the, uh, is the host of This Is Revel. I love having you guys on the show. I, I, would, I wanted mm -hmm. to split, split it up so I could have Jason on Mondays and you on well, Thursdays. We'll our show on Thursdays. I, I know, and you won't change that. Uh, okay, we'll figure something out. Thank you, Pascal. How do people follow you on Twitter? Plug away. At P R O B E R T 06, at P Robert 06 on Twitter. Um, uh, Google me, you'll see me on Black and Gender Report, Newsweek, Huffington Post. Um, I got lots of writing out there. That's great. Thank you so Check much. Out this is Revolution Podcast on your relevant podcast apps and on YouTube. This is Fantastic. Revolution Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please come back next week. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. I think we have, I think it's Peter B. Collins. Are you up next or is Professor Marianne up next? I'm a little confused. Let me check our schedule. It's Peter B. Collins talking about one of Professor Marianne Cummings' favorite subjects, the collapse of the FBI frame-up of the Wolverine militia in Michigan. And who is, uh, who is your sidekick there? Uh, this is Chloe. Uh, David, I, I have discovered that if I include Chloe on any videos where I appear, uh, the numbers just shoot way up. Uh, oh, good. So, now, is she a mall, please? She is a Coton de Tuléar. That is an offshoot of the uh, Bijan family. And uh, one offshoot is the Havanese. They went to Cuba. And this offshoot went to Madagascar. And uh, she, 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 was, she was born in the exotic location of Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where the trial, <laughs> the FBI frame up of the Wolverine warriors, or whatever they're called, the Wolverine watchdogs, uh, wound up on Friday in a total collapse for the FBI's attempt to frame these guys. All right, right. Chloe, she wants to go. So uh, Professor Mary Ann Cummings was the first one to talk about this on our show. You know, I'm no fan of white supremacists, militia members, people with guns, I always like to think, you know, if the FBI is going to violate somebody's civil liberties, it might as well be these guys. Tell us the background first. What, what happened initially? Well, initially, a guy who was known as Big Dan until the trial, and I think his uh, last name is Harris, uh, let me get that right. No, Chapel, C H A P P E L, Dan Chapel. He was a military veteran and he uh, acted as a whistleblower. He had gone online to some Facebook groups where 
he wanted to continue to uh, practice his military chops. And he discovered that this group was full of uh, angry armed right wingers who were loosely aligned with Trump. I wanna make it clear, these are not the proud boys or the promise keepers. These were angry white males in the state of Michigan. There was one guy from Delaware. There were a total of uh, the, the, the six who were prosecuted. Two of them did what most people do when the FBI overcharges you. They said, I'm facing 25 years in prison, so I'll take a plea deal. Plea deals get people to sing the song of the prosecutors. And despite the fact that those two men who took the deal took the stand in the case and said that they believed that they were part of a plot to kidnap Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, and there were various schemes. They were going to take her out of, on a boat in the middle of a lake and uh, uh, conduct some kind of a, a trial. Uh, they were going to go to her summer home and they cased the joint. They looked at the local area. They decided they would uh, blow up a bridge to prevent the authorities from uh, getting at them too quickly. But hmm. when you actually boil it all down, the concept for the activities of these would-be white extreme gun-toting militia wannabes, it was all directed by Big Dan. And Big Dan was in constant contact with his FBI uh, agent who controlled him. There were as many FBI informants and operatives in this case as there were defendants. And so I am delighted by the outcome of this trial. And these are unsavory characters. I mean, one guy was such a lowlife that he lived under a trap door in the basement of a vacuum cleaner store. This was That's, where, go ahead. Well, I mean, low life or poor. I mean, uh, he was, sounds like he was a victim of economic circumstances, no? Uh, I think he chose this life. Uh, he didn't have a regular job. Uh, and uh, he was a pretty extreme character. But what right. these guys did was they, they smoked weed and they talked about things in a larger than life way. They bragged, they, you know, my gun's bigger than your gun. <laughs> and they, they were uh, losers. And yes. Some of them, you know, may have been victims of, of the economic distress that Michigan uh, exemplifies. The auto workers who got laid off, who, uh, whose jobs were shipped to Mexico or elsewhere. But those are not really direct drivers. This was a, a, a group of people who listened to Donald Trump. They were pissed off about uh, the lockdowns, the mask wearing and the as the vaccines became available they were worked up about vaccine mandates but the central focus here is that the fbi wrote the script for this screenplay which now has 97 rotten tomatoes <laughs> and the jury deliberated for a week they flatly acquitted two of the defendants. They were hung uh, on the other two, and the judge uh, declared a mistrial. The prosecutors say that they will retry those dudes. But I I'd like to take a moment here, David, to review the media coverage, because critical consumption of American media is really important. And this story surfaced <clears throat> just five weeks before the November 2020 election. And just like 
that guy who used to do uh, To Catch a Predator on mm -hmm. NBC. Uh, Chris Hansen. Thank you. Chris Hansen, tall guy, big I hair. Worked, I, I worked with Chris Hansen. Uh, I was one of the predators. So we worked <laughs> together. You see. <laughs> well, then you oh. know what happens <laughs> at, at the end of every sequence on To Catch a Predator. They exposed this schlub who thought he was going to get to get laid by an underage girl. Right. And as he discovers the pickle that he's in, he tries to run. And of course, they let him run out the door. And then six cops pounce as the cameras are rolling. It's a rough takedown of a guy who doesn't have a gun. He's just got a hard on. And <laughs> they make sure he goes down face down to, uh, you know, put his, his member at some risk of injury. Uh, right. So these guys had a hard on for the governor of Michigan. And they were upset, uh, like a lot of people were. Uh, who, you know, who didn't like government control, who were misled by Trump that the virus was like the flu, the Kung flu, and mm -hmm. that all of this was overreach and overkill. But central to this is that the coverage was stenography of the FBI story. So we were told when the takedown occurred that they had interrupted a plot to kidnap and possibly kill Governor Whitmer. And we all said, holy shit, this Trump militia white supremacy thing has really spun out of control. MSNBC and, was all over it. They almost oh, forgot about Russiagate for yes, a second. Yes, they did. But they employed the same uh, uh, tactics. And now we know Jen Psaki is uh, being offered a gig to join uh, Nicole Wallace, former White House press secretary for Bush, uh, as a program host on MSNBC. Mm -hmm. And so this coziness is an element of fascism where the government and the media collude to brainwash people, or at minimum, feed them stories that uh, are not fair and balanced, are not fully researched. They are, uh, you know, news releases and pronouncements from the government. So I want to single out BuzzFeed. Uh, BuzzFeed is this bizarre right. media platform. And you have to, if you really want to see the best of the work by their investigative teams, and they are good, good reporters, you have to do uh, BuzzFeedNews.com. Because if you just go to BuzzFeed, you're going to get listicles. You know, 10 reasons why uh, Pete Davidson and Kim Kardashian uh, are going out on a date and they love the paparazzi. Uh, you know, 10 ways to uh, knit your eyebrows together. I mean, it's just ridiculous what, what they do to grab eyeballs. But the original reporting, which I covered here on the David Feldman show, uh, was from BuzzFeed. And they, they had the whole story. And they presented it as a government plot to frame these individuals. And that is the correct framing of the journalism. But here is the post-trial coverage from the New York Times. Headline, two men acquitted of plotting to kidnap Michigan governor in high profile trial. And it runs, uh, you know, uh, I, I printed it out on regular paper. It's about three pages. And nowhere in here is any hint that this was an FBI concoction. Quote, a series of missteps during the investigation and the eventual, eventual failure to win any convictions against the men who went to trial raises questions about the ability of federal law enforcement when it infiltrates right-wing groups to develop convincing cases without infringing on the rights to speak freely and own weapons. Now, that hints at the government conspiracy to convict these schlubs, but they cannot even say that that is a possible scenario. Uh, 
Next quote. Yet the very existence of those recordings and text conversations underscored defense lawyers' theory of the case, that the supposed plot had been conceived and nudged ahead by a network of FBI agents and informants who preyed on the worst instincts of their loose-lipped targets. The defense lawyers described the men on trial as big talkers who were never going to commit any kidnapping. But they don't describe the payments that were made to Big Dan. He, he was given more than $50,000 wow. to, to run this operation. And some of the other informants... Well, wait, the, FBI, wait, the FBI is paying people to plan an operation to kidnap the governor. Three years ago is the latest information I have, David. The public budget of the FBI for paid informants is more than $40 million a year. That is not likely the total amount. There were 15,000, and Trevor Aronson has confirmed this data point, 15,000 paid informants over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. You know, I don't even know what a, I got, I, I'm sorry, I don't even know what a paid informant means. So, Well, a paid informant is typically somebody who has a legal problem. They have a criminal record. They have charges that they're facing. And so they take a deal where they say, well, look, uh, make this case against me go away and I will help you by infiltrating a mosque. And you heard some of the examples that Trevor Aronson shared with us just a few weeks ago. These cases where, you know, an 18 year old kid didn't have a car, couldn't drive. Uh, wanted to blow up a shopping mall because he didn't really have the capacity to blow up a courthouse, which is what he originally told his handler. So he didn't have any money. He wanted plastic explosives. And his, his handler said, well, I, I know a guy who will buy your stereo speakers and trade them for plastic explosives. So this is a runaway train. And We've seen Trump, you know, fire James Comey, talk about the corruption at the FBI, but he only cares about it as it affects him. Right. Not the hundreds of Muslim Americans who are currently in prison because they took plea deals after being overcharged by a U.S. district attorney based on the information that came from FBI charging documents. And so we have a very serious problem, and the media is part of it. So let me continue a little more here from the uh, New York Times. Uh, the prosecution's case was hampered by a lack of clarity on what exactly the men were accused of plotting. Now, they don't criticize the prosecutor or the FBI for its sloppy investigation or for even, you know, considering the scenario that they created this whole case. And I have to underscore, David, that I didn't want Trump to win in 2020. But he has a legitimate complaint, not about a rigged, uh, you know, election process, but elements that were arrayed to make him look bad. And I don't have any doubt that this case affected a lot of people who said, oh man, I was gonna vote for Trump, but if this is true, I simply can't do it. Now maybe they didn't vote for Biden, but there's that middle ground where they may have decided not to vote for Trump. Okay, so one more saying, quote from the time. Well, hang on, hang yeah, on for ahead. one second. So you're saying that the FBI once again influenced a presidential election, but this time, in favor of the Democrats. In 2016, when Comey announced that he was resuming the investigation into Hillary, that helped Trump. Now they they wanted to make good on that. Well, you know, Comey was gone, and this was Christopher Wray, a Republican appointee. Uh, right. Also, the, the 2016 example is a mixed bag because James Comey in early July exonerated Hillary Clinton. And then it wasn't until, you know, early October because the FBI New York office 
had the uh, Wiener laptop that led them to reopen the case. And I, I agree that that certainly tilted some voters away from Hillary in 2016. Okay, one more quote from the Times. Defense lawyers right. sought to portray Mr. Chapel, that's Big Dan, a military veteran who pretended to befriend the men while surreptitiously recording them for the government. The defense lawyers tried to portray him as a leader of the group. He sometimes led training outings and gave advice about the plot, including when he floated the idea of using explosive outside the governor's home when she wasn't there. And on one outing, Chapel and others videotaped themselves jumping out of one of the other suspects' PT cruiser and taking cover behind its doors while they fired rifles. They were hmm. acting like G.I. Joe, not G.I. Jane, uh, and, you know, working out their yayas, playing soldier boy. So this case fell apart because the jury system worked. Even though they had two participants who took the plea deal and testified against the other four, the jurors smelled bullshit because they acquitted two of them outright and couldn't come to a verdict. We, we, we have no knowledge of the jury room. The jurors have not gone public. We don't know what the deliberations were like, uh, but we know that they could not reach a verdict. And so the media is explaining this away. The Washington Post is a little bit more uh, uh, explicit. Quote, uh, the case marks one of the rare instruments, instances, pardon me, in which an entrapment defense was even partly successful in a terrorism case. That is a, a real true fact. But does the Post then put its investigative reporters on to try to discover the work that Trevor Aronson has done? They can buy his book for 30 bucks. And he details case after case where the FBI has been doing this for years. But our media gatekeepers are not sharing that with the people who are learning this news. The, and, and here's a good quote that the Post uh, included. The attorney for one of the men, whose name is Michael Hills, the attorney, told reporters that the FBI's conduct in the case was unconscionable and the verdict was a repudiation of the tactics used by informants and of undercover agents. So. We, we really need to understand the implications of this case. And it's not gonna come from the corporate media. And that's why I value your program, David, and your indulgence of me to uh, oh, I'm, share I'm this information at, at some length, because <clears throat> we're, we're not going to see any real change in this unless there is an uproar from the public because both parties in Washington are satisfied with the status quo. They have gone along with this since the Patriot Act was passed the week after 9-11. And they don't want to look back for the same reasons that the Post and the Times and MSNBC don't, don't want to look back. They'd have to admit how badly they fucked us with right. these reports. And there's no Judy Miller here who can be fired to uh, take the fall for the bad reporting. They're just going to move on and hope that it gets washed away in the fog of the war in Ukraine and their wall-to-wall -wall coverage of that. Thank you. Let's, can we, do you have time to talk about Ukraine for a second? Sure. Uh I should bring in Professor Mary Ann. Please do. So I don't keep waiting. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let her comment on this, because she was the first one to talk about this. Well, she's a oh. Michigander. Hello, Professor Mary Ann. Your thoughts on all of this? You know, I, I just found out that something happened in, in, in Michigan today. <laughs> there was some trial and an outcome that people weren't expecting. Yeah, uh, I just glanced over in my Google and said, oh, well, you know, and, and you know, um, I remember listening to 
the one of the attorneys that was probably the one that Peter just quoted. And man, he did not think that there was a problem for his client in this trial. He was, he was, uh, looked like a guy who was pretty confident that he could get his client off. I believe he was also, and worked for the FBI at one point. So, so he kind of knew you know, how these things went down. I don't think they just started doing this kind of thing, you know, with the war on terror. There are probably, you know, people doing this kind of thing in the FBI for a long time. Well, Marianne, and you know, my own experience goes back to Chicago in the era right after the state-sponsored killing of Fred Hampton. And I was doing oh, this late yeah. night talk show and I frequently had the lawyers for the Hampton family who were suing the government uh, mm -hmm. for money damages initially, but they really wanted to expose COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. And it, you know what we can see here is the antecedent of today's FBI uh, sting operations. That's the phrase they use for framing people. Uh, but the tactics really have just changed because of the digital age and greater uh, firepower in weapons available to the public. Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh, don't worry about that. I think that by the end of the year, if the Ukraine war is still raging, I think the Democrats will all be embracing the NRA. <laughs> They'll be embracing like, you know, citizen defense. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I thought people lost their minds after 911. I mean, it was a horrible feeling I had, not because the buildings came down. I thought, well, that's the other shoe dropping, but just the reaction of people who were even very liberal and very progressive. No, we got to get behind our president. No, we don't. And, and when I suggested that they may have possibly let this happen on purpose, I mean, I had my father shrieking at me you know, uh, over mm -hmm. Christmas that year. And it was just, but I just had this sinking feeling. Like, I know these guys were aware that something like this would happen, but to get their plan, and PNAC, remember that document that they gave to Bill Clinton, I think in 1998, yep. Um, yep. where basically they thought that we needed to engage the military to like shape the world the way we, a certain, we wanted it. And uh, we may need a Pearl Harbor type event to motivate the people to get behind something like this because mm -hmm. apparently they were worried about this Vietnam War syndrome we were all supposedly suffering under. And uh, yeah, um, and how easily people can be manipulated. That's the other thing. I would have thought that, you know, I get angry and I, ca I can feel myself, you know, just having uh, just knee-jerk reactions, but at least I've been training myself over the decades to step back and acknowledge that I'm having knee-jerk reactions. And if you're having knee-jerk reactions to something, that means if you're not thinking about it, somebody can really just jerk you around. And uh, I think we are. When you're just afraid, being... when you're afraid, you can mm -hmm. do it. You can be talked into anything. Yeah. No, I don't fear, fear well, it works. And fear has been actively used by both political parties, uh, particularly since 9-11, where Democrats make you afraid of the Republican candidate, and then and a real scary guy came along. <laughs> yeah. And, right. and Republicans just demonize liberals and socialists and communists and claim that, you know, we are this great grave risk that must be eradicated. Uh, and that fear works in both directions. Yeah. And both parties. Yeah. Go ahead. I noticed something similar now that Fauci has pretty much waved the white flag of surrender to the Joe Rogans of the world, I think, until the next big surge comes. But they're pretty much saying, I think, take off your masks and just have at it. It's, well, I think the I Biden do. administration is pretty much, you know, it's like, COVID, people being afraid of COVID is no longer useful for the Democrats at the moment, if I can be deeply cynical. And they just want everybody back to work and, and pretty much whatever the rhetoric, you know, the policies have been remarkably similar with both the Trump and Biden administrations. I mean, neither one was willing to have a real lockdown. 
like Michael Osterholm said we really needed to do, four to six weeks, you know, just as a lockdown, everybody get paid, but, you know, and we can, and we basically can end this. And that, there was a window of opportunity with a new president, a new administration, people were relieved it's not gonna be Trump anymore. And, but that didn't happen. And- well, it's, it's, title, it's, title 42 at the border. Oh. <laughs> You well, know, they're I going mean, to start rescinding that. Yeah, but yeah, that was like, I mean, that was deeply cynical manipulation. What is Title, what is title 42 at the border? I, I saw. It was, okay, it was invoked by Trump uh, for the Remain in Mexico program for asylum seekers. And this is a clear violation, not just of U.S. law, but the asylum rights uh, embedded in the Constitution. And so they said, well, we have a public health emergency. So we got to keep these people and, and nobody did any testing to see what the level of infectiousness was of these people seeking asylum. Mm -hmm. They simply declared that as a group, they were a risk if they were allowed in the United States. So Biden came in and the Times uh, did a pretty good investigative piece that ran this Sunday uh, where they showed the infighting in the administration. And Ron Klain is uh, the chief of staff to uh, Biden. And he is a, a real centrist, a corporate Democrat, who I would compare to Rahm Emanuel in the Obama White House, who allowed the president to put on a, a more progressive veneer, while the real policies are quite conservative, if not uh, cruel. And so Ron Klain uh, was telling all of the different immigration and Homeland Security and uh, HHS gets into it because of the public health declaration. Uh, so there was some sort of a meeting, uh, March of, of 21, where Biden uh, said, who do I need to fire <laughs> to uh, end this infighting? And it does seem that Biden wanted to end the use of Title 42. There was an effort to uh, modify it, which then a, uh, a Trump judge uh, disallowed. And so that process has been appealed. And I believe Biden now has the authority to rescind uh, that Title 42 declaration. But it's Democrats, including Cinema and a conservative Democrat congressman from Texas who are saying, oh, no, this, this uh, you know, unconstitutional policy, uh, if you lift it, is going to be bad for us in the border states. And, and so the administration is still riven with this conflict, and uh, it, it is not far from where Trump was. Yeah, well, you know, we don't have real leadership at the top. When you have like Regency governments like this, you know, they're, they're inherently weak because they're just rife with infighting and people wanting influence over the boy king or the, you know, sunsetting president or, you know, so they're just, it, this, is, this is what we get, it's sad because this was, a, this was a moment made for somebody like Bernie Sanders who could have stepped in and it's not, I didn't expect Bernie Sanders would win, but he would show how one fights. And just the fact that somebody was taking a stand oftentimes kind of sways the situation. But and it, this, it, and it's just crazy. I, I mean, our border policy, the, refugees are a certain class of people that's been recognized for decades and decades. Any like civilized country understands taking in refugees. The fact that we have, got the refugee intake all kind of tangled up with our, you know, Department of Homeland Security and basically treating them like criminals or people breaking the law. They're not breaking any laws. It, it's, it's just a mess. And it uh, is too bad that there is nobody with the motivation in the administration that could just, you know, basically pull out a, a moral and an ethical solution to this. Well, and similar to the politics of the uh, <clears throat> triple B package, uh, 
the Democrats look at the polls and they run scared. They're afraid to lose. And by not trying to win, they lose even bigger. <laughs> They're a disgrace. Yeah. Well, you know, people don't like, and, and that is the problem. The reason why Bernie could so, and I think would have won decisively if he had been the nominee, um, he would have been doing battle with a lot of the Democrats, but he would have been, he would have, he, he would have been more likely to out some of the Democrats. I mean, he's trying to do that now from his position as chair of the Senate Banking Committee. And that's a position they may not last. You know, after November, we could we could see a much different situation. But, uh, you know, that's that's kind of where we are. And, uh, you know, I think that people and municipalities are actually taking it upon themselves. I know in Aurora, we've have we've had declared ourselves, uh, you know, a safe city for uh, immigrants because we've got a huge immigrant population here. So. And the. It, we, we do not welcome ice in, inside our city. So that helps. Uh, David, anyway. before I um, uh, yield to the gentle lady, you had asked about Ukraine. And I, I'd like to ask each of you um, how you are processing the reports about Buka. This is the town that is north of Kiev. And uh, the Russians occupied it for a month. And when they left, uh, the reports are inconsistent, but there were not uh, credible reports that there were bodies on the street. And then we see the videos of, and it's, it's distressing, uh, these corpses that are uh, you know, just kind of scattered along the, the main road there uh, heading out of Buka. And I feel like there is, you've made the point previously, David, that I appreciate that we can hold two thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you are a Putin apologist for asking if Ukraine is creating some propaganda in order to try to get the United States and other nations to do more, to give them that no-fly zone, to uh, I would bring do in. That. That's what I would do if I were Zelensky. I, I, I'm, he's a, you know, he ran a television network. Well, he's an actor, too. Uh, yeah. So uh, Scott Ritter, who, you know, I deeply respect, the former UN weapons inspector who uh, has written quite a bit. He served in uh, marine intelligence in Moscow uh, in the early 90s. He's not, uh, you know, unschooled on these issues. And he has been, uh, I believe, banned from Twitter. And I think interviews have been taken down from YouTube because he has asked questions about whether this is a, a setup uh, or was it elements of the Ukrainian military who killed Quislings, the, those who they felt had collaborated with the Russians during the month-long occupation. That is a, a common artifact of war. And I am not rationalizing any of the killing. I don't support Russia shelling uh, schools and hospitals and apartment buildings, but I don't for a minute believe that Ukraine has attacked itself. And, you know, there are pictures on Facebook of that missile that was inscribed for the children that was launched at the train station in uh, the eastern part of Ukraine last week. Uh, and I've seen people who want to claim that that was a Ukrainian missile. Now, I don't know the extent to, uh, you know, of, of Zelensky and the Ukrainian government's efforts to manage the narrative in a way to raise alarm outside of Ukraine. But I think it's healthy to be skeptical of the reports about Buka. And essentially, we're being told, if you don't believe the official narrative, you are 
un-American, you're immoral, you're, you know, I mean, it's just all kinds of name calling that goes on. So Marianne, what, what's your view of that? Well, you know, it kind of reminded me, uh, I had been following it at the time, but I remember back in 2014 hearing about Assad gassing his people and everybody up in arms that we got to go to war with this country. That's a red line he crossed. And I'm just like looking at this going, wow, that guy, you know, he's a survivor. He may be evil, but he's a rational actor. I mean, that would be the dumbest thing he could possibly do. And, and Obama was being egged on to invade at that point. And then he backed off at one point. And part of the, and one of the reasons, big reasons why is because uh, Theater Postal over at MIT and his team went in there and they did the inve forensics investigation of the site and determined that it hadn't been, uh, that it hadn't been, uh, that this, this crater hadn't been caused by something from an airplane. And plus the composition wasn't what was originally reported. Uh, and by the way, the, uh, the, sir, the rebels had some similar uh, poison gas products and so on and so forth. It was a very long detailed uh, report that they made. So Obama listened to the scientists. Um, Postal and his team similarly debunked a claim in 2017 where even the Democrat, that there was a, there, there was a gas bombing. I think it was a chlorine gas bombing, not a sarin gas bombing. And We're many people- attacks tonight that Putin used chlorine. Okay, so that if the, this is coming from the Azov Battalion, again, that's like the worst, the dumbest thing that the Russians could do at this point, you know, in terms of anything they could do, any, anything they want to accomplish um, it, it, going in there. So my whole point is, is that we've been down this road before and we have ignored the science. I mean, the Democrats were cheering Trump of all people. Yeah. Dick Durman said that Trump became president because he launched a few, lobbed a few missiles into Syria. I mean, it was just the dumbest thing. So um, my initial reaction is if the Azov Battalion has reported the use of get chemical weapons, um, my knee-jerk reaction is uh, Azov is probably used chemical weapons or is about to use chemical weapons. Um, there was a report about two weeks ago, there was stories about Russians using uh, chemical weaponry and a Reuters report came out, leaks from the defense department that uh, basically said they found no evidence for this happening. And then that story just kind of went away, you know. But well, I think- it was, a, it was a preemptive false flag report. Yeah. We were told that uh, Putin was going to use chemical weapons and blame it on the Ukrainians. And so, you know, we get into this <laughs> contest now, is my false flag bigger than yours? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. I think it was like NBC <laughs> News that even admitted, you know, that they were doing that. It's like, well, it doesn't matter if it's true. We have to get, the, we have to get in front of the narrative before Putin gets there. And I'm going, okay, up is down, black is white, war is peace, you know, whatever. It's just, a, and this is the problem. Like you pointed out, people who have credible counter narratives, I mean, serious people with credible counter narratives are being blocked. They're being, uh, they're being uh, taken down from Twitter and Yahoo. In other words, they're trying to see to it that as many people as possible have a very limited set of options for information, very limited out outlets for information because they're crafting a narrative for this. So I asked people who I know are smart, I honestly asked them, I said, why would you trust any story that's coming out of official US or Ukrainian sources any more than you would trust a story out of Pravda or TASS? I mean, well, and, and this wall of propaganda, and David, I do watch uh, cable news uh, just, you know, a couple of hours a day, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the U.S. propaganda machinery is amplifying the Ukrainian propaganda machinery. We should be uh, reporting honestly about whatever it is that reporters mm -hmm. find. and. Right. This, what I just described, 
is another uh, supporting argument that the U.S. is using Ukraine as a proxy, using Ukrainian soldiers as cannon fodder to settle scores with Putin. And if we weren't doing that, our media, which talks about journalism but doesn't practice it very much, would be actually saying, okay, you know, let's just look at the facts here. Uh, were those bodies on the ground uh, when the Russians left? And if so, uh, you know, what, are, what is the sequence of events? There is a report that the mayor of, of uh, Buka uh, told the Ukrainians to stay inside because there's going to be cleansing. So I don't consider that proof, but it's important not to censor, stifle, or only report things for the purpose of denying them. Mm -hmm. And so our media is manufacturing this, uh, this consent. And when I watched Jake Tapper, he got his tour into Ukraine last week on CNN. And you know everybody he interviews, he basically is just a shill for Zelensky. Where's the no-fly zone? What's going on here? You know, he, he just has this unbridled outrage. Well, when Walter Cronkite and Eric Severide covered World War II, I don't believe they operated that way. They reported, you know, the facts about different battles and the efforts to displace the Germans. But it wasn't done in that, uh, you know, the, the sports model of the Homer. Right. And we're getting Homer coverage about a war that is not ours. And I think it leads to uh, valid skepticism. But skepticism is not deemed valuable in the current context. Well, you watch the go ahead, Professor Marianne. No, I, no, I, I agree. As I said, there's very few independent reporters out there, very few from the Donbass. And I worry about this Patrick Lancaster. I am thoroughly expecting that one of these days he's either gonna be killed or all of his videos are gonna be yanked off of YouTube. I think he's getting a growing audience now because he's probably or the, has been the only English speaking journalist reporting from behind the lines in the Don Donetsk, the Donbass region in the, from the rebel areas because he's an American, married to a Ukrainian in Donetsk. And what and, does he report you know about this guy? Who is he? Uh, I just found him months ago. Uh, he was posting, he had a post on, on YouTube, but uh, he now has, he is Patrick Lancaster and he's uh, been report. he's been reporting from Donetsk for years. He also had done extensive reporting. You know, there was a war between Azerbaijan and Armenia about a a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And he was reporting from that area, which, you know, nobody is reporting from it. The first time I had ever heard of that was, you know, looking at his YouTube videos. Going, I just, oh. I just want to interrupt to say that yeah. uh, before I retired, uh, I covered the battle over Nagorno-Karabakh mm -hmm. with uh, a friend of mine who's a former CBS reporter who is of uh, Armenian descent. And there was no decent coverage in the U.S. about that. And there was no context given mm -hmm. for this age-old struggle that goes back to the Ottoman Empire and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, killing of the, the uh, Armenians by the Turks that is still disputed by the Turks when it's called genocide. So anyway, sorry. <laughs> well, there, there, there's no context for anything. I mean... Over 500,000 people have died in this war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And it's mostly because this group, this, this, this military group, they call them the Satingre Liberation Front or something like that, was somebody that we had charged with spearheading the war on terror in Africa many, many years ago. And they're running amok. And, you know, it's just that they're also spearheading our military incursions into Somalia. And mm -hmm. no one even knows anything about that, let alone questioning, like, what in the world have you been accomplishing in the last 
20 years, let alone the last year and a half where all these people have died and, and for what? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're just, uh, we, we're highly filtered. Um, I love office hours. Unfortunately, I've been getting very little sleep. I've been, I've been staying up until 4.30 in the morning. But somebody had played um, an interview that was very recently given. It was uh, real, sponsored by Real News. And I can't remember the fellow who was interviewing him, but it was Noam Chomsky was being interviewed. And he's kind of trimmed his Rumpelstiltskin beard. <laughs> he looks about 190 years old, the way his hair is all grown out. But uh, anyway, this guy who was you know, clearly liberal and very progressive was getting clearly irritated by Noam Chomsky. Because Noam Chomsky was insisting on putting all the, everything that's going on in Ukraine in a context, you know, and not only did he mention, he ended up mentioning, you know, talking quite a bit about the the 2014 coup. But I mean, he's a, he just started talking about the whole um, evolution of NATO after the collapse of the after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and this guy was clearly impatient with any of that. He just wanted. Noam Chomsky, I think, just to say that Russia, bad, bad, bad. Well, you know, he said, of course, Russia committed a, a terrible, terrible war crime. But let's get, where are you a child? We live on a planet, he is basically telling him, where are you live on a planet that's run by gangsters now? You know, this is how, they're, they're, I had been telling David, you know, international law, I mean, we took a wrecking ball to that. You know, as far as I can tell, the International Criminal Court is basically for the occasional despot in a third world country. That if, has, as long as they're not white. Well, except yeah, the, exactly. the, the, the Serbians uh, and, and the fallout from the, the war in Yugoslavia, they're not uh, non-white. But most of the other uh, suspects who've been brought to the ICC are from third world shitholes. But uh, I, just on that note, the Times had a story today that the Biden administration is, is at least talking about signing on to the ICC. Uh, and in that report, I learned that Ukraine is not a signatory no. to the International Criminal Court. So all this talk of war crimes, and, and, and I don't want to leave the impression that I look at this and don't believe that war crimes have been committed. But the idea that, that anybody's ever gonna be held accountable, uh, when Bush is held accountable, then maybe <laughs> we can turn to the more recent offenders. Uh, but this is a charade. And uh, yes. I talked about at the top of the show, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, had a press conference talking about how we're building a case against Putin uh, to bring him uh, to trial for war crimes. And he, in the press conference, he said, I'm asking the journalists, the independent media, to please continue to uh, report these war crimes and work in tandem with our intelligence agencies. Together, we can build a case to bring to an international venue never mentions the International Criminal Court. And at the end of the press conference, a reporter accidentally did their job and said, what about the International Criminal Court? Uh, are you afraid of bringing it before the International Criminal Court because you're not a signatory? And he goes, OK, press conference is over. Yeah, pretty much. He, he did word salad, you know, venues. And, you know, we, we can still bring a we can still bring a trial to the ICC, even though if we're, we're not signatories. What he's asking the media to do is create propaganda to get our blood boiling and get us ready for war. There's no trial. You, the, the media has been now convinced, no, you, you're our paralegal, Jake Tapper. Help us build a case against Putin so we can take him before the ICC. There's going to be no trial. There wasn't a trial for Saddam Hussein. There wasn't a trial for Osama bin Laden. There's going to be no trial. Uh, I, I don't want to argue with you, David, but there was a show trial for Saddam 
uh, you're right held by you're our right. puppets in iraq you're right you're absolutely it had right. no no substance but we went yeah. through the motions before and and also we reinstated capital punishment in iraq uh in order to execute him yeah. <laughs> he he was a brutal guy and i'm sure some people died at his under his uh regime as we call it but technically there was no capital punishment in iraq under saddam hussein <laughs> yeah well you know my what, what's concerning me is just how little discussion of diplomacy and peace is going on in so-called progressive circles yeah. i mean because that's more than just people who are educated, I mean, that's a culture. I mean, that's a culture and people who are, you know, like have at least a commonality of, of thought in terms of the way the world is. Howie and Klein, like, I, yeah. Howie Klein, I love Howie Klein. Yeah. He said, I do too. he said, uh, he wrote a piece over down with tyranny. I'm not speaking out of class. He, you know, uh, he said that, you know, we may have no choice but to go, we, you know, the it, events may cascade to the point where we may have no choice but to go to war, that Putin will invade Poland and Article 5 of NATO says we have to go in. We may have no choice. We may have no choice. Yeah. Uh, I, I do consider that from time to time. I, I, I don't want to make that choice, but here's what we have to be able to separate and under this you know propaganda uh, uh blanket we are at a loss to make an honest choice but uh you know if putin does use a nuclear weapon if he does attack a nato country we are bound to respond the nature of that response is not really clear uh but you know will we provoke putin into a chemical or nuclear weapon deployment because the hawks in washington really do want a war with russia and so will consent be manufactured in that way and so this this is where it's very difficult to separate the propaganda from any kind of reality in order to reach consensus on a, a very you know difficult and uh, a potentially fatal decision well you know um the one thin hope I have for the current situation is that the Defense Department posturing has been consistently way less aggressive and way more circumspect. I mean, even for this uh, latest round, even for this latest atrocity in, in Buka, they came out with a statement last week that said, we have no independent confirmation of any of the stories that are coming out. Mm -hmm. A spokesperson had amended it like, well, we don't have any reason to disbelieve the Ukrainians either, but we just don't have any co independent confirmation, mm -hmm. which means like, yeah, we have no intelligence on this at all. And it's it's like, they're not, they're kind of, I, I don't know, I would be reading tea leaves, but it was just like those leaps a couple of weeks ago to time and to Reuters about uh, the, about the, the real, reality of the war on how Russia is operating and plus the, the Reuters article about the uh, uh, lack of evidence for chemical, for, for chemical usage, war usage. I'm thinking that there's somebody, and they're not leaks by the way, I mean there are sanctioned leaks, they're not somebody who's speaking out of turn. The, the, these are, I, I'm sure that these were leaks that the uh, Defense Department really meant to put out there because you know they know what this means out of the yahoos in the State Department really believe. And it was, uh, somebody asked me on office hours where that article was um, about uh, Cheney and Wolfowitz and Newland and those people not only believing that US military should be used you know, all over the world to con contain rogue groups and, and also maintain openness to resources, but to also break up Russia and then break up China. 
And that was Ben Norton who wrote that article, wrote about mm -hmm. two years ago about Victoria. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, I'll dig up that and, and article and put it up. But that's well, very scary. I, I'm, that I'm gonna sign off. Oh, I'm gonna okay. sign off and let Marianne uh, have her segment. I do just wanna ask Marianne, how do you manage to uh, expound in a very uh, articulate way while you are reading the chat and posting in the chat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm multitasking and that's, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> I, I don't read the chat until after I uh, sign off. It's too distracting and I, I've never attempted to respond. <laughs> but but there are very good questions that come up in the chat too. So, you know, and I try mm -hmm. to respond to some of them, but um, anyway. All right. Why don't we do this? Uh, let's say good night. This was a great segment. Thank you, Peter B. Collins. Uh, let's say good night to Peter B. Collins. As always, great job for a treasure trove of Peter's radio shows, podcasts, and interviews. Go to peterbcollins.com. And thank you so much, Peter B. Thank Collins. Thank you, David. Bay Area Radio, Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer. Well, we will come back with Professor Marianne Cummings. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. I'm going to play some music uh, from uh, the great Professor Mike Steinel, and then we'll come back. Where is it? I wanted to play a new song by... Uh, where is it? There we go. New music. Well, sort of new music from Professor Mike Steinel. They've protected their no, that's city. Not, and no, that is no, no, because no, no, of no, their no. bravery, their courage. But it is. No, that is not new music from Professor. This is new music from Mike Walking 13 miles on every shift with not a chair in sight. Lifting 20,000 pounds a day, that don't seem right. Saving plastic bottles to have a place to pee. Injuries in this place are the highest in the industry. Don't believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. Don't tell me this sweatshop has become the American. American dream, we need to stand together. Can't do it on our own, we need to stand together and make our presence known. We need to stand together to get the union done. We need to stand together. What side are you on? One million strong, working two shifts a day. Packing all day long while the cameras are running away. 100,000 trucks tearing up and down the roads. Delivering stuff all over the world in 40 ton loads. When did this sweatshop become the American dream? Don't believe those TV ads, things ain't what they seem. We need to stand together, can't do it on our own. We need to stand together and make our presence known. We need to stand together and get the union done. We need to stand together. What side are you on? Stand 
can't use your cell phone You can't call your mates Can't listen to music Gotta pack all those crates Start to feel like a robot But soon you understand There's more of them than you That's always been the plan Do not believe those TV ads Things ain't what they seem And don't try to tell me this sweatshop Will become the American dream We got to stand together We can do it on our own Stand together We need the UAW, the AFL-CIO We got to stand together We can do it on our own We got to stand together. We need the American postal workers and the farm workers. We need the stand together. Teamsters and the RWDSU. We need everybody. Stand Call together. the phone. Get on the phone. Call your neighbors. We need to stand together. Yeah, yeah. We need to stand together. That's what I'm talking about. We need to stand together. Professor Mike Steinal will be joining us in a little while. Back with Marianne Cummings, Professor Marianne Cummings, who is a Parks Commissioner. She's an elected official, Parks Commissioner Aurora, Illinois, as well as a particle physicist. What did you want to talk about before we got sidetracked? Oh, I, oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, Biden hit an all-time low in the CBS polling today it came out and it's just it is so ridiculous at this point i mean it could be so easy for him to salvage democrats prospects you know i, I would nothing is guaranteed but you know do a couple things you promise to do and you don't need the congress to do that you can cancel student loan debt and if somebody wants to make an issue of it and take it to the Supreme Court, let them be the most unpopular politician in the country. Right. You can forgive medical debt. You can, uh, with, you can, by executive action, expand Medicare if you acknowledge, if they were to now acknowledge that we're still in the middle of a pandemic. So, you know, these are, these are very easy things. And they're amazingly popular immensely popular and they won't do it. So, you know, um, apart from the fact that we might start World War III, even though we seem to be irrevocably heading to climate disaster by our complete inaction in that front and all these deals that they're making that are kind of fake with the, with the Europeans on how they'll be able to make up for their lack of access to Russian gas. I mean, wow, you know, Climate change concerns are just completely out the window. I mean, we're not, it, literally, there's no leadership on the planet. But apart from that, you know, nobody really, nobody in my neighborhood cares. I mean, it's, Ukraine is still polling low, uh, way below inflation in terms of people's number one concern anyway. So if you thought you were going to get a boost by being the war president, I think there's a little bit of war fatigue, particularly as that it doesn't look like there's a war. I mean, there's no parades in the street. There's no people signing up to go. Uh, and you can, by the way, I, I remind my friends that, especially those who are white enough, I said, you're white enough. Do you want to help Ukraine? Go over there and fight. <laughs> it's like- Yeah, I've been getting nasty, I've been getting nasty emails from some listeners who say, you know, you're a coward. You don't want to go to war in Ukraine. If you were in Kiev, you'd be crapping your pants right now. And I read it and I go, well, where are you writing this from? Yeah. Why aren't you over there fighting this war? And by the way, I was watching a video this morning of uh, 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 Boris Johnson and, and Zelensky presumably wandering through Kiev, cobblestone roads, look very, looks very European. Do I know Kiev? I have no idea where they really are, but it didn't seem like they didn't, they weren't even wearing armor or, or, or flak vests or anything else. And so it kind of didn't seem, 
there's a weirdness I find for all of this. I can't put my finger on it exactly, but uh, I've been watching, a, I watched a couple episodes of Servant of the People. It's on Netflix. It's Zelensky's TV yeah, show. I watched a little of it. I watched oh, a little of it. That, that is just, it just reads weird to me. I'm sure that I'm not getting all of the humor because of, and I'm sure there's a language problem, but it, it's, it's not that, it's just, it seemed like such a slick Aaron, uh, Aaron Sorkin type US production. It seemed like it was their version of the West Wing. And I think weirdly, it seemed like it was packaged. It was written for us as much as people in Ukraine. So I, I'm thinking that, um, you know, what a perfect package. You have an actor, you know, you have a coward press, uh, uh, an alternative press that has either been suppressed, uh, shut down entirely, or, you know, pummeled into, you know, basically being fairly servile to the interest of the U.S. state and their Ukrainian clients. It, it, it's just a weird thing. And in the meantime, people in other parts of the world are seeing just a shift. Uh, it's, it's no longer a unipolar world. I mean, whatever happens in Ukraine, if it doesn't end in nuclear annihilation, I mean, this is kind of, Russia has turned its back on the West, I think pretty much. And I think they don't mind burning their bridges. They think that, you know, there's a new- Well, Ukraine burned, Ukraine burnt their bridges. Uh, did Ukraine burn, burn that bridge to Crimea? I mean, there was that one a big uh, corridor that Russia built to Crimea. Um, right. I always thought that that was that was probably one of the like the most vulnerable situations. You, considering that that their naval base there is one of their key strategic security points, um, but but in just general, um, you know, they. I think I think I mentioned last week that Putin, we are helping Putin sell this to his to his population because you know this is something that's being put upon in Russia. This is not something he's doing. His uh, he's basically undercutting his professional managerial class and his oligarch class. Um, as somebody mentioned last week, it was like you know we're we're seizing yachts from oligarchs. People in Russia are cheering. You think they like their oligarchs any bit better than we like ours? I mean, it's just yeah, fine. Those assholes taking money out of Russia is what they're doing, you know? So, right. Anyway, kind of like, um, uh, our oligarchs, they have no skin. And our oligarchs have no skin in the game. They don't live in well, America. Isn't that the sign of the time? You know, I was uh, one of the uh, articles I was following, I've been following a Marco uh, Bron Bronco Marcetic who writes for Jacobin. He actually lives in the Chicago area. One of the few people writing about this. Um, but I'm just following links in other Jacobin articles and they're talking about, you know, de degrowth as, a, uh, as an economic trend because, you know, we really cannot be manufacturing all this stuff, all this all this activity and hope to like you know deal with the climate crisis but i thought you know we really don't have to build up our manufacturing base immediately we can just commandeer the wealth of the billionaires and just have a massive redistribution of wealth from just commandeering these guys who stole from us in the first place but when i was growing up um a billionaire didn't exist in this country to first order Billionaire, billionaires are what existed in third world countries because, you know, one strong guy could just loot everybody because there wasn't the systematic uh, institutions in place to prevent them from doing, to prevent them from doing it. So, you know, you've got the Marcos and who is it, the uh, Sohartos and all these third world dictators getting fabulously wealthy. And they got, but key was they got fabulously wealthy because they could keep their people in such dire poverty. And right. it's not, it, it's not a, a hard concept. I mean, these people, Elon Musk and Bill Gates, what wasn't Bill Gates supposed to give away all his wealth? He said he was going to, you know, basically he just, systematic. He just like can't. tripled it. Can't it just keeps growing. He makes the mistake of accidentally investing in all the drug companies that 
He's oh yeah, he and telling them under no circumstances, you know, make the uh, intellectual property open to the world. Yeah, you know, I know. All yeah, right, just, we, we we should we, we should wrap it up. We're we're running a little late. Okay, no, uh, I just wanted to. Uh, I just and I also wanted to mention because you did say something in office hours um, about Nazis in Ukraine that you keep going to one article in the nation in 2014. There's a great article in the nation in 2017. Uh, but I'm sorry. I am, there was a great article from nine, from 2019 rather, and and that was citing contemporary articles. A lot of them written in Israel. Some of them written in Horowitz, you know, about being appalled by what was going on in Ukraine. Um, well, I have, I actually, yeah. I, I have, I have some stories because I was researching it, and the, the head of the AD, Anti Defamation League gave an interview in Horowitz. I was going to work on this over the weekend, yeah. but I didn't have time. That the, the Anti Defamation League says that. There's no evidence of yeah. temples, mosques getting burnt to the ground in Ukraine. That no, the Az there isn't that. But remember, they, the people that were first attacked by the brown shirts, well, first of all, they, the, the Nazis were first attacking gay people, people who were disabled, and people who were Russian, people who were Slavic. In fact, part of the reason why they constituted a special brigade, the SS, is because when they were in Russia ordering, when they ordered troops to kill Russian prisoners, regular army people couldn't do it. I mean, just, no, we, they're prisoner. I mean, we, we fight people on the battlefield. We don't do that. And they realized that you needed a professionally trained group of killers to systematically kill people. So uh, yeah, there's uh, been a whitewash. Uh, I was going to say, why don't I just put this in the chat? So, because um, Marcetic, oops, uh, this is the uh, Jacobin article that was uh, from last week. And uh, he was talking about how people who were openly say, worrying about white supremacy, Nazis, an FBI report in 2019 about how these guys seem to be recruiting people from all over the world much like the Mujahideen was recruiting people from all over the Islamic world to train in these madrasas like schools in Afghanistan. And that was Zbigniew Brzezinski's great idea to like, you know, let's train these guys, unleash them on our enemies like the Soviet Union and, you know, how that worked out. Um, but that did, do, that did bring down, that war did drag down Russia to an extent that the Soviet Union probably, that was probably a huge contributing factor, but Anyway, he, uh, he addresses this in the article that it's like suddenly all of these people, even the New York Times, who last year was referring to the Azov Battalion as neo-Nazi, are now all referring to them as far-right ultra-nationalists. But the bottom line is that um, even if they weren't Nazis, we have created and we've helped create, and apparently our CIA has been helping to train these battalions, a situation where peace may be damn near impossible in Ukraine because these people, you know, whether or not they nominally control all of the armed forces or even a very tiny fraction of the, uh, of the parliament, they feel absolutely free to call to openly threaten the president of their country should he engage in any diplomat in diplomacy with Russia. That's, that's a terrible corner we've backed ourselves into. Let me read you. I subscribe to Haaretz is like the New York Times of Israel, and mm -hmm. it's it's middle of the road and it's hypercritical of Israeli policy towards the Palestinians, and they mm -hmm. they try to be even hand. This is from uh, Haaretz, uh, February twenty fifth of this year. Of this year, yeah, yeah. And this is what uh, Kiev's chief rabbi, Yonatan Markovich, says. I don't know what Putin is talking about. I can only say that in terms of anti-Semitism, we're very secure here. 
Incidents are very rare and the government takes care of them. We're now in a war situation and hear sirens and see smoke from our house. So I don't want to get into the issue of anti-Semitism. It's not relevant. We're in a war and we're all coming together. That's from Kiev's chief rabbi, which means he's like, you know, the chief rabbi for all of Ukraine. He's not complaining about the Azov battalion or C-14 or about the eastern Ukraine that the from what I've been reading, I mean, Nazis hate more than just Jews. They uh, always hated more than just Jews. Right. But <laughs> oh, that was, you know, that's but, the problem uh, about just limiting it to anti-Semitism. I mean, right. ask the Roma, ask how the Roma have been treated in the last few years. Right. And it's pretty. But the Anti-Defamation League is pretty good at lumping the Jews in with the Roma and the gays and uh, the communists and, the, you know, the, the protected groups who had to wear certain stars under Hitler. The Anti-Defamation League says there's no evidence that there's a significant threat of uh, Nazis taking over, neo-Nazis taking over Ukraine. They say no more so than the threat of Nazis taking over Russia. That, you know, every country has its Nazis. Every country does not have uh, battalions that are official parts of the national security that open display Nazi, openly display Nazi symbols. And by the way, the, uh, Marcetic had mentioned the Anti-Defamation League in contrast to the Simon Wiesenthal Foundation and a whole hassle of other Jewish organizations that are deeply concerned about kind of, and are also a little uneasy about how suddenly uh, within the last year, people have been going a little soft on, you know, this neo-Nazism. As I said, it's, you know, not just about anti-Semitism, it's about you have these people who have radicalized even moderate politicians in the, in the parliament to the extent that you know, Zelensky really isn't free to engage in diplomacy without significant danger to himself personally. And as I said, that's one of the biggest concerns we should have. Um, you know, look, the, I think what, P, what, what uh, Peter B. Collins just said, that we can hold thoughts, more than one thought in our head, that there is a really problematic aspect of, of the Ukrainian armed services. And there's a really problematic aspect of this war going on for any right. greater length of time than it has. And that, you know, what's completely lacking is adults, particularly in the West, sitting down back to the negotiating table that, you know, serious diplomats had worked out. And I'll say this, right. the Minsk Accord. I think I was saying that wrong. Right. So, so I, I know I, I went back, I've saved that nation article. Uh, it, it's written, I, I mentioned this on the show, it's written by Lev Galinkin. Yeah. Five years uh, for the nation magazine, five years mm -hmm. after the Maidan uprising, anti-Semitism and fascist inflected ultra nationalism are rap rampant. This was written on February 22nd, 2019. Mm -hmm. I think Poroshenko was, I don't think Zelensky was elected yet. So you do the hyperlinks on this. Uh, these stories of Ukraine's dark nationalism aren't coming out of Mas uh, Moscow. They're being filed by Western media. Uh, so I click on that and it comes, it's an opinion piece by Michael Colburn in, uh, from 2018. Uh, the World Jewish Congress, uh, it's a hyperlink, it's a dead link. This is the nation, the Simon Wiesenthal Center. They cl I click no. on that, it's a dead link. This is it's the nation. It's weird, isn't I, it? Have that, you, are you that there? Actually, yes, that is weird. Uh, and then another that article. Links, huh? Hmm. And Ukraine, inve and then there's one from Human Rights Watch from 2018. So, as I said before, the Nation magazine keep you know had this piece in 2019 about anti-Semitism in Ukraine, 
and they kept hyperlinking to stories that were two years old that was back in 2019 and now the links are dead things change uh the links are dead yeah well one of the things that um gabby martin was talking about when they took all of her you know years and years of stuff off of uh rt was that you know it's not just the programs she said my mother recorded all the programs it's just that there were significant we broke significant stories and now they're all dead links you know so there was true that there wasn't a whole lot of reporting in the regular although there were a lot of new york times articles in the in recent years that were concerned about some of this stuff i now posted one to panelists and attendees i'd only been posting to panelists i should learn by now but um, something that uh, eric zeus that uh, howie klein had been posting on his uh on, on on down with turning you know different views from uh, ukraine of course, Zeus's articles, several years ago, they were appearing in Salon and they were appearing in BuzzFeed News and other Western sources, but now they're mostly appearing in alternative sources or like the New Zealand press or things that are not the US or the UK. So when you tell me that a certain article has dead links, because I usually go through, I, I posted that particular article like a, two or three months ago, and I, I usually go through all these links in, in an article. So if a bunch of them are dead, oh boy, it's kind of making my point earlier. It's just like, you know, we want to sort of, they really want to funnel the news through very few outlets to get, to get control of the narrative here. So this is from 2015, USA Today. A drill sergeant who would identify himself only as Alex wore a patch depicting Thor's hammer, an ancient Norse symbol appropriated by neo-Nazis, according to the Anti-Defamation League. They go on to interview the drill sergeant who says he's a Nazi, but added with a laugh, no more than half his comrades are fellow Nazis. He said he supports strong leadership for Ukraine, like Germany, during World War II, but opposes the Nazis' genocide against Jews. A spokesman for the Azov Brigade, Andrij Diachenko, said only 10% to 20% of the group's members are Nazis. You know, I think... Yeah, maybe, you know, we're just not. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, t people, a lot of people call themselves leftists. A lot of, you know, but they're not, I mean, people call themselves Nazis if there's no... I'm looking for evidence of mosques and temples uh, getting blown up. I know there's evidence of, uh, I'm not discounting the, L the attacks on the LGBTQ. They're almost as bad as uh, here in America. Well, again, you know, the history of Nazism, I mean, before they were systematically wiping out the Jews, they were, you know what the pink triangles were they were systematically right. wiping out gay gay people people with disabilities we showed a very controversial movie at the film society for me lab well, hang on for a second if you could send me because i yeah. i would you okay. know one of my one of my as a kid one of my hobbies was reading about the holocaust and the kennedy assassination i find nazis where there are none uh, I'm having, I would love to find Nazis in Ukraine. I'm having trouble finding You're articles. Having trouble finding, well, okay, well. So if you could send me, because I, I yes. wanted to talk about it on the show today, and I can't find, everything I'm reading says that the Azov Battalion plays with Nazi imagery, that they're not uh you know it's for show and that they're and, and they've and they've dialed it back that they're they're not the same ideologues that oh uh, they dialed it back yeah you know they're they got a pr firm <laughs> this is kind of i i'm, I'm going to send this as a for instance I mean, who, who's, where, where are you getting the information is glenn greenwald saying this I don't know what Glenn Greenwald is saying right now, but uh, 
there was a, I just put something in, in the chat. Um, there, and it was funny because this was an article that appeared last year. It was from the Iowa, uh, Ottawa Citizen and there's been a little bit of a scandal because apparently uh, the Canadian Armed Forces apparently have been training, training neo-Nazis and, uh, and these militias in Ukraine. And the scandal wasn't, hey, you may be training uh, neo-Nazis in Ukraine. The scandal was, oh, there have been photographs with the guys you were training with swastikas and other Nazi paraphernalia that made it to social media. <laughs> I'm going, guys, the problem is, is not the pictures on social media, it's that you're training them. Anyway, I found it very amusing and uh, I put that up in, in the chat for people for their amusement. So, you know, yeah, there is a problem. Um, I think Nazism is particular, it's not that hatred was anything new. It's just that, that Nazis just combines like religion, nationalism, it was just a, such, a, such a particular toxic brew of all the millennia's hatred that we thought that that little nexus of whatever psychic power was going around, we really need to not ever foment again anywhere else. But yeah, I, I, I respectfully, uh, I don't see it. I, I wish I did. I don't see. Why do you wish you'd seen not... it? <laughs> huh? it you say you wish you'd see Nazi paraphernalia? I, I, I don't see any evidence that Putin is denazifying uh, oh, Ukraine. I, I don't care about what Putin says or anything coming out of Russian press. I mean, it's just propaganda that they're being handed on a silver platter too. But I think there is my, my major issue right now, despite whatever transcendent problems you have with Nazism in general, is that you have a situation where you've uh, developed forces that are constraining the elected government of Ukraine from actually getting a peaceful solution out of this war. And okay. have been to be for years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Marianne Cumming. Razor girl. Thank you. Let us now go to Professor Mike Steinel, who has been where are you? There you are. It's good to see you. Good to see you, David. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Am I coming through loud and clear? Yes, you are, sir. Good to see you. Out. <laughs> coming soon. I got covers. I have yeah, approved the uh, covers of both of my books. If you're looking on the Zoom, I'm... Wow, I'm, look at that. How did you do that? Uh, I, I put it into um, PowerPoint, <laughs> and then I animate. In PowerPoint, you can animate. You can fly in things. And then I do a, I have Movavi, which is a screen recording thing. It's just, a, it's just an app, and you can, it works really good. You can record anything on your screen. So then I run the PowerPoint with the animated wow. things. Yeah, yeah. Coming soon, but what happened there? I lost you. Hang on. I have to shut up. I'm yeah. here. Coming soon. There's the cover yeah. to uh, Saving Charlie Parker. Yeah, and running the changes. Let me give you a proper introduction. Give Mike me a Simon. proper introduction. Absolutely. You are just jazz trumpeter, composer, educator. You've taught jazz studies at the University of North Texas for longer than I can count. And you're the author of the highly acclaimed Essential Elements for Jazz Ensemble, Volumes 1 and 2, Building a Jazz Vocabulary, and Running the Changes. You have a new novel coming out, Saving Charlie Parker. Yeah. So what's the story of Saving Charlie Parker? Saving Charlie Parker is a combination of jazz history and time travel. Retired professor <clears throat> living in Oklahoma uh, falls down the stairs in the house that he's remodeling with his wife, Jean, and hits his head and is, uh, next thing you know, is he wakes up in 1953 across the street from Massey Hall, which is this great hall in Toronto, that was the in uh, May 15th, 1953, 
Uh, it was the last time Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker played together in public, pretty much. Hmm. Maybe a jam session here or there, but uh, it was called The Greatest Jazz Concert Ever. And it's it was kind of a f- failed thing. But it, it starts there. That's where the book starts. And uh, my character, uh, my main character, Michael Newman, he uh, he goes back seven different times to different eras of so you can learn a lot about charlie parker and most of the parker stuff the framework is factual and then i put him in these situations and he gets to talk to parker and he gets to listen to him play live and he gets to see people interacting around him and all the things that uh happen i can't i can't wait to read it you don't have to read it it'll be an audio book one of the reasons I haven't been able to do the show for, well, one reason, uh, two weeks ago, we had a had to get ready for a big session because we're doing the music for the audio book. As it turned out, um, we didn't, I, wasn't, I really didn't get, have the new music ready to go, so I just spent the day in the studio last week um, mixing. Hey, by the right. way, I, I think you might be playing the, my music just a bit too loud in the Zoom. It distorts oh. in the Zoom. It usually sounds pretty good by the time I listen. I'll, I'll monitor the Zoom, but I'll also go on YouTube, and I'll use my podcast uh, app on the phone. That's the way I listen to a lot of the shows okay. while I'm... But if you might just sh- sh- bring the volume down just a little bit, I think, maybe. Right, and, and when I speak, just bring it all the way down to zero. No, your, so your, you voice, have... is, your voice is very strong. I mean, that's... Hey, by the way, I got a couple bones to pick. Okay. So I wasn't able to do the show. So what did you do? You replaced me with a lady who talked about animals with detractable penises. Yes. Yes. And it was fascinating, you know, but I know what you're doing. I know what you did with that. (laughs) You're you're trying (laughs) you're trying to appeal to more women because I think most women would like for penises to be uh, detached from the dicks they're attached to. <laughs> yes, yes. They would, it's not just yeah. emotionally, men are not just emotionally detached, now they want their penises detached as well. <laughs> to fill in people uh, who just who didn't hear that two weeks ago, what, what animal was that that had the... Det- I actually have a clip. Oh, God. It's, it's Professor Pamela. I think I can find it. Let me just... Is oh, video of the, the penis coming off? No, 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 no. But I oh. do have. Uh, That'd be kind of pornographic. No, I don't. But I had a clip. I don't. It's a spider. She's Oh, she's on the. I think she's in the chat. Yeah. But in she, the chat. She, it was fascinating. Yeah. But I know what you're doing. Yeah, you try to get something more exotic than my little tunes. No, <laughs> no. First of all, I want Professor Pamela to come on. But I love the bit. And that is. She comes on to talk about animals, and it's just always about the sex life of animals. But you never acknowledge that. Uh, they're, they're, I played it for my mother. She was laughing hysterically. It's, it's a great bit. Yeah, you need to have her on. It, it's true. I mean, she's she's speaking the truth about animal sex. Yeah. And uh, so you were gone two weeks in a row. Yeah, last week I had to I had to watch my Jayhawks win the national championship at yeah. the NCAA national championship. The Jayhawks from Kansas, and they came back. It would have been crazy if I tried to do the show because I would have been like a, an emotional wreck. Because right about the time I was doing the show, they were going to halftime, and they were down fifteen points. Largest comeback in a national final. Uh, in history nobody's ever hmm. done that and they pulled it off it was pretty amazing i no. wanted to go and uh, burn a car up in kansas that's what they do up in kansas in lawrence kansas when they win a national championship. really the students go nuts it's terrible they, last time they burnt cars in on uh, massachusetts street first of all lawrence if you're going to go to kansas there's only one place to go lawrence kansas it's like madison you know it's like Mm-hmm. It's uh, arty and hippie and uh, got music and it's beautiful. It's in actually rolling hills of Kansas, which is uh, 
you know, they called it Harvard on the Cobb. Maybe you wouldn't like it anyway. <laughs> Harvard on the Cobb? On the Caw, which is the Kansas River, the Caw River. Oh, oh, I see. The river that runs through, through is, I think it's the Caw, that, which feeds into the Kansas, which feeds into the Missouri. But um, right. Harvard on the Caw. I wrote That's a little good. song while I was waiting. Is it about I mean, the refugees? I sent that to you. Maybe you could play that at the end. That's just a little okay. something I've been working on. It's, um, yeah, we can get a little serious about that. I've been, okay. uh, but, but I, I thought it, I've been thinking about a song, David, I love you. First of all, you know, I love I you. Love right? you. Yes. I'm going to do five to one. I'm going to give you five compliments. First of all, you're extremely funny and the show is great. You got great guests and, and your opening monologues are brilliant in the, you know, like they're like Paul Harvey esque, you know, that's three. What, let me see. And your hair looks great. <laughs> Oh boy. oh boy, something's coming, something's coming. I, le I heard that on a, on a show, like, if you're going to tell your wife something negative, you got to uh -huh. proceed it by five compliments. And I started doing that in my teaching, and uh, it was amazing how, by the time you get to number six, which is, but, you know, like the but, um, yeah. uh, and sometimes it's a big but <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> Right. Anyway, so, um, but any, I love you, but I have a feeling, and you know this, you have a ten, a tendency, like especially in the opening monologues, to paint with a broad brush. You know. Right. Um, and and I get that, and it's it, it, you know, but I think some, I think that guy that, um, who was this Feldman guy, and what are his credentials? The letter you read, the email yeah. from. <laughs> yeah, I think he hadn't heard you before. He didn't know that that's part of the deal. But anyway, I've got a song called "My Name Is Feldman" and I paint with a broad, broad brush. You want to? I do it? paint. Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay, it's a little blues. I got to put hear the the uh, echo. Yes, yes, yes. That's to disguise my voice. But anyway, here we go. My name is Feldman and I paint with a broad, broad brush. Whoa, my name is Feldman, I got jokes that make a sailor blush. I got no time for shades of gray, everything is black and white. Go ahead and say I'm rash, cause I'm itching for a fight. My name is Feldman and I paint with a broad, broad brush. Oh, I screwed up. I'll do a little organ solo. If I can find it here. Doing live is hard. Hang on a second. Here we go. My name is Feldman, and about New York I've been doing some pondering. You can trust me on this, all real estate here is money laundering. All billionaires' children are doomed and they don't have a chance. We need to send them all to re-education camps. Ooh. I got one more. I did this because your show went late. 
My name is Feldman. Lawyers are the worst. Harvard lawyers are the worst than that. They're all dirty rats. My name is Feldman, and I paint with a broad, broad brush. The GOP is evil, and most of the Democrats. I got no time for shades of gray. Everything is black and white to me. My name is Feldman. I paint with a broad, broad brush. My name is Feldman. I paint with a broad, broad brush. That is going to make John Ross so happy. I think that's, a, that's where he. I think that's where he said you paint with a broad, broad brush. I, I would Ross. love to get little clips of you saying those rash things uh -huh. and uh, put them in there. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotta, Although I, I think uh, that's pretty great. That's pretty effing great. I need to I love go back and listen to more. There's a. There's got to be a few more. Uh, few more uh, statements that I could plug in there. I, you know, um, lawyers are a problem. And I went to Rhyme Zone, and there's nothing rhymes with problem. Nothing rhymes with problem. Really? Maybe Hobgoblin, I think they put that in there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I have some exciting news, okay? I haven't talked about this too much. I want to tell you about Nadine and uh, all the good news we've had about her health. For those who are just new to the show, um, my wife and I have been living with her mother, uh, my mother-in-law, Nadine Hoke, who is an amazing woman, beautiful woman, inside and out, and she's 99 years, 99 and a half in a few days. And uh, she came down, she had uh, developed lung cancer in August, and uh, we started it, uh, Medicare, it, Medicare is great, but man, it took a long time to get everything approved and for treatment and my goodness. And I don't know what someone does if they don't have people going with them. When an elderly person who doesn't have someone to help them in, in a situation like this is really bad. But anyway, um, she did 34 treatments of radiation and we could go Tuesday. We went in, she did the PET scan and then they gave us the, her the results it's gone. The cancer is the cancer. <laughs> is gone. That's great news. Isn't that we wonderful? need good news? That's great yeah. news. Yeah. And uh, she's downstairs watching shoot 'em up. She likes the NCIS shows and she'll watch those all day long. <laughs> Give her our love and, and you watch Jeopardy with her. Every night we watch Jeopardy and then Wheel of Fortune. And then I usually uh, go off and uh, do some work while she uh, finds us. There, there's a lot of good different shows that we can, you know. Right. But she, she loves she loves the, uh, what do you call it? The procedurals. The, the, right. Like Bull. She loves Bull. And I haven't seen the... Um, the Ethan. Ethan's on. A, I have to go back and I know we, get, we, we taped that one. But I have to see who he is in the show. They probably right. watched it. I probably didn't. I probably missed that on it. But anyway, so yeah. I wanted to kind of put that out there. We hadn't talked That's about it much. News. I knew you knew about it because I emailed you. And uh, right. it's fantastic. And it was, it, she really was a trooper every day going to the hospital, you know, for those 34 radiation things. And I was amazed, like, here's a really interesting thing. Not one doctor ever su suggested well, you know, you're 99. You sure you want to go through right. this? And I thought that was fantastic because right. she's very, she's been very healthy her whole life, you know. And, uh, you know, this thing cropped up. The doctor said, now, when did you, how long did you smoke? And she goes, I never smoked. <laughs> but but she's 99. That. She was around. <laughs> she's going to start now. <laughs> um yeah, she's going to start with the patch and work up to it. That's a joke. <laughs> it's a pretty good joke, isn't it? Yeah. But you, did you, you, work, did you like my that? penis attachment joke? 
uh, most yes. women would I, like to have the penis detached. Around, Go ahead. She was around when? You said she was around when? Well, well she, she was, you know, living in a time when everybody smoked. And she was around right. smoke. So, you know, her father smoked and she worked in a, at a newspaper. People smoked. Her husband smoked. You know, but um, so secondhand smoke, I'm sure I was around secondhand smoke. I'm surprised, you know, uh, that yeah. my lungs are as good as they are. Right. But anyway. No, I, I had a neighbor who was 104, 105. And they become royalty with the medical community. They, 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 they can't wait to see these people. Uh, Here's the thing about uh, health care in America. The nurses are angels. Yeah. The nurses that are right. angels. They are I, I, nurses in America are angels. And so are some of the doctors, the ones who aren't owned by the health insurance companies. Yeah. But our nurses, the technicians, and I complain a lot about our health care system, as do the nurses, as yeah. do the nurses. Yeah. You know, it's, it's these executives who've commodified the human right who should just be, well, I don't want to tell you what I think. Good. I think that I got a song lyric coming out of this. Go ahead. Tell me what should, we should do to the executives. This is the next next verse of my broad, broad brush. Well, I, I, you know, if I, I'm going to pray for all the health executives, health care executives. There you executives, go. There you go. And then they're, and, and, and root for them. <laughs> and that will result in their early demise. If I'm rooting for you, you don't say, you want, if you want to make it in show business, have me root against you. And if you don't, you don't want to make it, say anyway. Uh, Who did you have on a couple of weeks ago? Who's and you were talking about having a buddy. You know, find somebody. If someone doesn't have a mm -hmm. significant other, they need to really find someone. Because yeah. there's times when you you're going to be out of commission and you're not going to be able to make choices and and right. uh, and even get to you. Know, now I want to say this, and I'm, I'm not talking out of school. We have two. I have a really good Medicare plan. We haven't paid, we don't pay co-pays, we don't have referrals, and it's, it's such a big system with the colleges here. I'm, and, and my supplemental part is paid by my employer until I die. Uh, I have to pay Beverly, so it's still pretty reasonable. But she's got, um, you know, Medicare Advantage, you know, those are not, and it's, referrals have been hard. Plus, she had to twice pony up fifteen hundred dollars in the middle of radiation. So Beverly is doing her taxes. I mean, she's gathered her tax stuff, and she has ten thousand dollars in out-of-pocket medical expenses this year. So I don't know what someone does if they don't have the money. You know, I've heard Medicare Advantage is not the way to go. Yeah, we haven't switched her just because we're scared to switch. You know, and well, you know, Ralph Nader calls it Medicare disadvantage. Right. I've heard those. I heard him. I heard that one of the one of your broadcasts when he talks about that. And then you've talked about it. Well, I don't and, know enough about it. So I, I and I, I want to be careful here. So I, I don't know enough about it. Well, it's confusing. I mean, when we went on Medicare, there's a whole we just I just stuck with the schools because I knew what it was. And I ask around, it's always oh, great. You know, if you, if, you, if you retire out of the system, you have, they pay your supplemental. All you have to pay is that first part, the B. All you have to pay is B. And um, every plan's gonna pay B. It's just that your supplementals are gonna be, and they're all different. Well, I got a Humana sent us a book, and I bet you there were 40 different plans. And it's, it's, it, you know, it's meant to confuse you of course, it's like a cell phone plan. Yeah. And hers is called gonna... uh, Advantage Plus, Advantage Platinum. 
and it's hor it's it's not very good it's not very but good. it's called platinum i know it's like uh, how could it be bad <laughs> platinum. it's like george orwell you know it's like just the opposite of what it is yeah you this want to is, play the refugee song yeah this i wrote is, this I mean, song it's kind of sad uh eventually um it's not very long but okay. eventually i'm going to have uh rosanna sing it's there's a flute playing the melody and um just here's mu musicologically what what's going on is that there's this rep repetitive mel melody it's very repetitive and the underlying the, like under <laughs> the underlying harmony shifts into four different keys eventually four different keys and i thought i didn't mean to but after i wrote it i thought well this is like refugees always on the move going from one place to the next and it's always unsettling there there's there's resolutions but they don't quite work out and there's there's one little chord that's kind of hopeful and it then it turns out that it isn't that hopeful and uh right. it's called for the refugee Okay, new music from Professor Mike Steinel. Nope, hang on. Sorry. It was a beautiful setup, too. And don't hit the buzzer when it's over. <laughs> <laughs>
Professor Mike Steinel for the refugee. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, I Professor gonna, Mike Steinel for the refugee. I'm going to put wow. this out there in the chat. If if anybody knows, I think it, it might be interesting to uh, have that melody. Um, you know, sung in different languages. But I only know one, <laughs> one language. But I mean, you know, like it's sung in Russian, sung in U Ukrainian, sung in just Slavic uh, uh, and, and um, you know, Spanish and Portuguese. And um, so I'm, I may do some, there's quite a few singers, international singers here in Denton. I'm, I may do a little bit of, uh, you know, with the same words, you know, basically um will you take me in you know or can i stay here can i think that's kind of what i thought after i started work on this you know so uh you played all the instruments yeah that's a, i have a really nice flute stop here i, lo I love this flute um That's, a, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it really sounds like a flute. You're amazing. Well, David, you are too, and I appreciate you uh, making time for me. You are, and I'm playing, uh, I, I'm going to stammer through this. Uh, I, I'll tell you off. So I was going to tell you something I'll, I'll i'll tell you off mic okay uh yeah it's just great stuff and uh that it's just amazing should we play another one what, what else did you bring in you came in uh, heavy i didn't i i sent a bunch of stuff to hannah let's play uh you like him <laughs> i have that <laughs> that's uh -oh. one of my favorites I know, and I've been trying to get that for the opening. I think I played it uh, like recently. Um, hang on. Right. We mixed oh. eleven um, tunes last week for the uh, for the audio book. It's going to be cool. Here we go. Here we go. You like him. He's groovy like a movie that you watched one time when you were kind of high. But now you can remember exactly why you liked it, but you did. He's charming. It's alarming how charming he is when he's for me. And just like that movie that we watched when we were stoned, we like him and we don't know why. Gregarious, he's hilarious, and most of his head is hairyless. And like a mean girl from school who treated you cruel, you like him, and you don't know why. You like him, and you don't know why. You like him, and you don't know why. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinel. You're the best. Here, I'm unmuted. You're, you're yeah, the I, best. I, I should get a little award for hairyless. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, a, that's one of the better rhymes. Okay, yeah. I'm going to go uh, have a little nightcap and then um, go to bed. All right. I love you, buddy. You're the best. Same here.
Mike good Steinau. shows, David. I've been checking them all out, even though I haven't been here. I, and they're, well, they they're no good without you. They're, they're only great okay. Stuff. Great stuff. We need you. We need you. All right. Here. Okay. See you later. Pick up. Thank you. Pick up Song and Dance. My best to Nadine. Pick up Song and Dance, the Mike Steinel Quintet, featuring Rosanna Eckert on Origin Records. Let us see if, before we go, we'll check in with Rodrigo. Hello, Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Hello, Rodrigo. Mexico, come in. Hi, come. David. Sorry. I was eating. You were eating? Yes. What are you eating? Um, something very cheap. Okay. Why don't, uh, why don't you go back? I'm starving. Can we continue this on Thursday's show? Sure. Or do you do you have a quick statement to make? Or do you want to eat? Uh, no, I'm done, but I can come back. Finish your meal, you. and we'll do it on Thursday. Okay. Is that okay? I'm starving. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, well. This is the David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. And friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. This show is produced and put together by Dan Frankenberger, Andy Brown, Sarah Bush, Grace Jackson, Professor John, The Invisible Ninja, Joe in Norway, and Hannah Feldman. I left somebody out. I always do. I try to do it. I play a game in my head. I, mi I jumble up the names and see if I can get them all. Let me try again. Dan Frankenberger, Joe in Norway, Professor Jonathan Bick, The Invisible Ninja, Grace Jackson, Sarah Bush, Hannah Feldman. I left somebody out. Andy Brown, Sarah Bush. Professor Jonathan Bick, Dan Frankenberger, The Invisible Ninja, Joe in Norway, Hannah Feldman, Grace Jackson, Sarah Bush. Those are the people who really work hard to keep uh, the show going and office hours as well. So I thank them. And uh, yes. Go to my website, please, and subscribe to my newsletter. Sign up for Office Hours, Meet Better People every Friday night at 8 p.m. And if you would like to sit in our virtual studio audience, please go to my website and sign up. We also have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to that. We're posting small clips, digestible morsels of this show so you can watch that share that uh i think that's it i want to thank all our guests john ross texas tom weber howie klein david pepper go pick up his book laboratories for autocracy laboratories of autocracy dr harriet fraud jason miles and pascal robert please listen to their this is revolution podcast the great Peter B. Collins, go to peterbcollins.com. The brilliant Professor Mary Ann Cummings, follow her on Twitter. And of course, everybody loves Mike Steinel. And we'll get to Rodrigo uh, tomorrow, I believe. We'll, we'll get to Rodrigo uh, tomorrow. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the week. Ain't no chairs in this Bessemer shop. The back and out day don't ever seem to stop. The man went down cause his heart gave out. Get back to work, we heard them shout. They said the EMTs are coming, that's what they're for. And life slipped away on the cement floor. 
Someday. Right now I got to make my raid and all these extra shifts. If I can make it to Christmas Eve, the kids will have nice gifts. And the big boss will have more money so he can go up into space. But there still won't be no chairs in this Bessemer place. Last year we had a meeting and they made us go. They gave us all pins and said, vote no. But maybe this year Union can give us a little more and put some chairs on this Bessemer floor. I'm hoping the union might make things right. Some days I just don't have the strength to fight. This plant down here can take its toll. It'll break your body. It'll crush your soul. Feels like this packing ain't never gonna stop. And there still ain't no chairs in this Bessemer shop. Liam McEnany, your friend David told me about how you thought you had to pass gas on the number four bus, but it turned out to be more than gas. Man, Liam McEnany, that has to be tough. Wearing white shorts on a Manhattan scorcher smack dab in the middle of rush hour with your girlfriend standing right next to you. I feel you, Liam McEnany. I really do. But it's a reminder of how precarious life is. One moment you think you're taking your lady downtown to your favorite Korean barbecue, and suddenly one blast out of your leaky balloon knot, and poof, everything changes in a second. Poof. It's all over. Poof. Runny bilge, dripping down your legs, Liam McEnany. You look for your girlfriend. Poof. She's gone. In the blink of a balloon knot. Won't even return your phone calls. I feel for you, Liam McEnany. Reminds me of 9-11. Beautiful fall day. I was planning a walk in the park with my second wife, Judith Nathan, who turned out to be a voracious harpy. And the next thing you know, well, I don't have to tell you what happened that day. It's all in my book, Leadership. I guess the point is, Liam McEnany, never take anything for granted. Cherish each moment. You never know. You just never know. One day you're with a woman who you can't figure out where you end and she begins. And then poof, intestinal air completely betrays you by turning solid. Poof, she's gone. Poof, all that's left is a memory. Okay, take care, Liam McEnany. And next time you're riding the bus in white shorts, remember to exercise constant vigilance because 
Things don't always turn out the way you planned. Bye, Liam Nakanini. You sound like someone I would like to get to know. 9-11. 